to order. I'm Councilor, Council President Cynthia Borrego. Um, we um, have all of our counselors present except Councilor Harris, who is excused today. Councilor Benton will be joining us very soon. He is actually stuck in traffic, so he should be joining us anytime. Um, with that, counselors, I would like to open our meeting with a moment of silence. And I would like to de dedicate our moment of silence to um, Dr. Joe Vias, who was a community advocate, a community champion um, for the West Side and all areas of the city, um, who passed, unfortunately, this weekend. And I think most of us knew and, and, and loved him. Um, after our moment of silence, I would like to just read a few words uh, on his behalf. So if you'll take a moment and join me in that moment of silence. Thank you, counselors. I would like to read these words that I found um, is a poem that's written by John Mark Green. And um, if you'll just uh, bear with me. Words seem so feeble in moments like these. Life is so precious and death such a thief. The depths of your pain I cannot comprehend, but I'll stand alongside you in the darkness, my friend. Love is a bond that death cannot part gone from your arms, but still in our heart. So with that, I would just like to open the floor right now to any counselors that would like to say a few words um, for our friend, um, Dr. Joe Vias. Counselor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as many of you know, Dr. Joe was not just a constituent of mine, but also a neighbor. Uh, he lived right down the road from me, and sometimes I loved it, and sometimes I hated it, I'm sure, as we all did uh, see him at council meetings, but, you know, that's why he was truly a, a great friend, uh, where he would call you out if he knew it was due, and then he would give you praise when he knew that you had uh, your heart in for community. Um, he was a really great, astounding neighbor um, and community advocate. Um, uh, neighborhood voice to really the west side and I know that not just in his dental practice um, but just the time that he gave to community was um, hard to none really for the community and I want to thank his family for really having us pretty much as extended family because of how much time he gave to the community um, and really my heart goes out to, to Jojo, to Domingo, to Emiliano, to their families and to his grandson, Wesley Gray. Um, I know that they're uh, in a period of grief and mourning and just our, our hearts and, and prayers are with them. Thank you, Councilor Senna, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I too just, I, I am just kind of grief stricken in terms of um, the loss of Dr. Joe Vias. As you know, he has been just a, a stellar community leader on the West Side since I can remember. I mean, both him and I, I, I called him my friend and ally, my, um, um, my nemesis, um, as you know, uh, as President Swan and him, President of the West Side Coalition, um, we didn't always agree on everything, but at the end of the day, we still um, called each other to talk about issues that were important to the West Side. So, you know, he'll do, dearly be missed. The impact that he's made on the West Side, I think, will not soon be forgotten. And then also, um, if, I don't know if people know, but through his dentistry, he was always doing, I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, a free dental care. He was doing it. It was a tremendous advocate of that. He was doing that every year and um, just providing um, dental care to um, to people in need. So um, just want to say he's truly going to be missed and the West Side has a tremendous void. Thank you, Councillor Pena. Any other counselors? Um, I've known Dr. Joe for 
probably about 30 years. And I would just like to say that uh, I did speak with his wife um, on Sunday who called me. And, um, you know, there is definitely, as Councilor Pena mentioned, a, going to be a huge void. Um, I, I remember Dr. Dr. Joe, as we referred to him, um, back in the 90s when he would come to the planning department and give the planning commission and the planning directors and the staff a hard time on different, different issues throughout the city. Um, more recently, he was working with us on the west side as part of the uh, coalition. And, um, you know, he always had something to say, but he did it with a sense of grace. And um, our condolences just go out to his family and, uh, and to the community because he will, leave, um, he will leave his building blocks behind, um, but he will also leave a huge void. So thank you counselors for bearing with me on that and um, we will miss him. So we will move on to our, um, our Pledge of Allegiance to uh, Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, are you there? In English? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Jones. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Councillor Jones. We will go on to Councillor Pena in Spanish. Councillor Pena. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get on. I'm sorry, I lost everyone. So I um, apologize for that. Juro felicidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y la República que representa una nación bajo Dios indivisible con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you, Councillor Pena. So I just would like to read a few words into the record for the public um, on your behalf. As was noted in a press release from our office on Friday, posted on our website and noted on our published city council agenda, this meeting has special procedures and is being held via Zoom video conference. Members of the public, city staff and the media have the ability to view this meeting live through four different platforms, GOV TV on Comcast channel 16 and GOV TV website, YouTube and Zoom webinar. These live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned and you may enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. For those watching on the live stream, Thank you so much for joining us this evening. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will also remain available for viewing at any time on the city council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 768-3100 for assistance during business hours, which are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The council is accepting live general comments today, as well as any written comments. Written comments received by 1 p.m. today were distributed to all city councilors in advance of today's meeting. And with that, councilors, we will move on to our first order of business. Uh, before I do that, I'm just I've been being told that I need to make a quick announcement. Comcast Channel 16 is not functioning properly. Comcast is in the process of fixing it. Some fiber that is used for this purpose and Channel 16 will be backed up as soon as possible. So please bear with us. Thank you. So with that, counselors, I'm going to move on to our proclamations and presentations. And we begin today's proclamation with the recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, today with us, we have our chair of the Hispanic Heritage Committee, Orlando Marcus, and the co-chair, Elisa Castillo, who will be accepting the proclamation. So with that, I will just uh, begin, and that is Councillor Pena and myself. 
Whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is a time to celebrate the heritage and culture of Hispanic and Latin Americans. And whereas the city of Albuquerque recognizes the important presence of Hispanic and Latin Americans and the contributions they have made to our country by enhancing and shaping our national character with centuries old traditions that reflect the multi-ethnic and multicultural customs of their communities. And whereas as of today, 57.5 million people or 18% of the entire American population are of Hispanic or Latino origin. And whereas the participation of Hispanics in today's economy has become vital for the growth of America with Hispanics representing one of the major driving forces of economic success, for millions of people residing both in and out of the United St States and Council Pena. Thank you, Madam President. Whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month recognizes American citizens whose ancestors originated from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas the countrywide observation of Hispanic heritage started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon B. Johnson, and then on August 17, 1988, was expanded by President Ronald Reagan and its debatable um, Bush is in there as well. So to, to a 30 day starting on September 15th and ending October 15th. And whereas the state of New Mexico and the city of Albuquerque's One Albuquerque Initiative has established multiple events celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month. And whereas this is an important time to come together to recognize the traditions of Hispanics and Latin Americans and the rich sense of culture they bring to the United States. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque hereby proclaims September 15th to October 15th as one of Albuquerque's national as Albuquerque's National Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you, Councilor Pena. Would you like to recognize our guests? Absolutely. You know, we just spent a wonderful morning just listening to lots of local leaders and community leaders who have given of their time just to dedicate to this one particular month. And um, it takes a whole year of planning and committee meetings to, to get this together. I um, just uh, want to congratulate um, this year's new leadership. You did a phenomenal job today, and I look forward to all the events um, that precede this. And I'm just excited to see how the community is coming together. And the theme for the Hispanic Heritage uh, Month this year is Esperanza, which is hope. And, you know, um, somebody said it at the meeting today, you know, with lots of the um, Latino, Hispanic, me you know, Mexican, mestizos, all, all whatever you just um, identify as Chicano, you know, we were the ones that were oftentimes um, the most um, hit by COVID in terms of, you know, our essential workers and the loss of family and friends during this period. And so, you know, I think that hope is that we, you know, come together and work together to make sure that we make um, um, the United States a more wonderful place for ourselves and our families moving forward. And I think that there's the right leaders at the table. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pena. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our chair our co-chairs actually, um, Orlando Marquez and Elisa Castillo, if you'd like to say a few words, this would be the time. All right. Thank you, Madam President, uh, City Council, uh, on behalf of the New Mexico Hispanic Heritage Committee, I'm Orlando Marquez, uh, the chairman of the committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful morning. And as uh, Councilwoman uh, Pena had mentioned earlier, the national theme is hope, esperanza, and hope for better things. You know, we as a community, not just in the Hispanic community, but in the Albuquerque community, uh, have gone through a lot. And it's we're hopeful for better things to come. But that can't happen without tremendous leadership and, and selfless acts of uh, giving back to the community. Uh, so I commend you, City Council, uh, members uh, that are on this, um, uh, on this Zoom, and, and we thank you for everything that, that you do on a daily basis, because we're all in this together as Hispanos, Chicanos, Mexicanos, Latinos, whatever you identify yourself as, uh, we're all in this together. And Esperanza, we have hope for, for much better things to come, but we have to stand united in doing so. So thank you so much for recognizing the New Mexico Hispanic Heritage Committee. Uh, we are grateful to you for your support over the years, and we're looking forward to uh, 
continued endeavors and, and future projects where we can work together to expand the committee and our efforts to help uh, the different causes. And, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, yield some time to our vice chair, Ms. Elisa Castillo. Thank you. Ms. Castillo, uh, you need to turn your volume on, I believe. Can you hear? We can't hear you. No. I'm sorry, we're not hearing you, madam. No. Okay, well, with that, um, we will uh, turn the proclamation over to you. And I believe we did that this morning. For yes, those of you who don't know, um, this morning there was a celebration of the beginning of this um, this um, Hispanic Heritage Month, and it was celebrated in Old Town with uh, wonderful speakers and entertainment. It was really a beautiful event. And so I hope that throughout this um time people will be able to join us in the future for future events thank you mr marcus and thank you to your committee for joining us today thank you madam president thank you members of city council and attendees of this uh of this zoom meeting we're we're grateful thank you very much thank you um we will now go to oh councillor senna did you have your hand up no okay we will now go over to councillor senna uh councillor senna you have a proclamation recognizing Childhood and Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Councilor Senna. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm going to read this proclamation and I know that we have our AFR Chief Gallegos as well as uh, Dr. Boyu and uh, Commander uh, from uh, APD to receive this proclamation, but I'll start with the proclamation. Whereas the month of September is Childhood and Blood Cancer Awareness Month, a time to shed light on the realities of childhood cancer and blood cancer and join together to make a difference for those diagnosed with cancer and whereas cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease for children and the average age of diagnosis is six. And whereas approximately one in 285 children in the US will be diagnosed with cancer before their 20th birthday, and approximately 40,000 children are in active treatment in the US at any given time. And whereas 20% of children with cancer in the US will not survive it. And whereas approximately one half of childhood cancer families rate of associated financial toxicity due to out-of-pocket expenses are as considerable to severe and whereas in the last 20 years only four new drugs have been approved by the FDA to specifically treat childhood cancer and whereas approximately every three minutes someone in the U.S. will be diagnosed with a type of blood cancer and approximately every nine minutes a blood cancer patient dies. And whereas according to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, new cases of blood cancer are expected to account for nearly 10% of the nearly 2 million new cancer cases in the US in 2020. And whereas every year, nearly 14,000 people are searching for a bone marrow donor, 55% of the Latino patients looking for a match cannot find a donor, 60% Asian American patients cannot find a donor, and 75% African-American patients cannot find a donor. And whereas half of those searching for a bone marrow donor, often their only option for a cure to their blood cancer or disorder will pass away. And whereas the US has made great strides in ongoing medical advances in research and treatment, the five-year survival rate for all childhood cancers has climbed from 50 to 80% over the past several decades. And Whereas the five-year relative survival rate for leukemia has more than quadrupled from 2009 to 2015, doubled for the people with Hodgkin's lymphoma in the same period, and increased to nearly 54% for those with myeloma. And whereas researchers and innovation in medical treatment continue to seek new therapies and evaluate the root causes of disease, striving for a world free of blood cancer and a world where no child experienced cancer and Whereas hundreds of nonprofits organizations at the national and local level, including the American 
Society, American Cancer Society are helping children with cancer as well as blood cancer patients and their families as they navigate their cancer journey. Too many families, children, and blood cancer patients are affected by this deadly disease and more must be done to raise awareness and get a world free of cancer. BIA proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque hereby recognizes September as Childhood and Blood Cancer Awareness Month and joins the efforts in raising awareness to get a world free of cancer. Thank you, Councillor Senna, and I believe you have some guests with us this afternoon. So would you like to introduce your guests? Yes, I would love to introduce. I know that um, we have our fire chief, Jean Gallegos, and we also have a doctor from UNMH, Dr. Boyu, um, in recognizing their efforts of really raising the awareness. Um, and I know we also have a commander from APD. So I'll turn it over to uh, Chief Gallegos. House President uh, Borrego, yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor President Borrego and uh, Councillor Senna. Thank you so much for helping us raise awareness for childhood cancer and blood-borne cancer. Um, you know, this is a fight that uh, we continue to have, and the more awareness that we have uh, amongst the entire community is something that uh, is only going to help us, you know, raise awareness, raise funding, so that we can continue the efforts to, to find a cure. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Boyu for all of her hard work and teaming up with us to, uh, to uh, and the fight at UNM to continue to this battle for kids, for everybody that is struggling with um, this horrible disease across the world. So um, again, I also want to thank my two uh, lieutenants and uh, driver uh, in our PIO office that's continued to raise awareness by designing the shirts that we have sold out of within the first week. Um, I also like to thank, yes, beautiful shirts. Thank you so much for, for helping us. And also like to thank APD Commander Legentry for participating. You know, we uh, strive to get more and more departments with the city of Albuquerque involved in bringing awareness to this great cause. So I will now turn it over to Commander Legentry if you'd like to say a few words. Um, before you begin, Chief, could you just introduce your two um, you, lieutenants, I think you said? Yes, uh, Lieutenant Tom Ruiz is a uh, lieutenant of our PIO office and uh, driver Dave Rettinger. They've been involved with this effort for the last uh, three years since we started. Um, again, the, in 2019, we started. Uh, in 2020, we raised $12,000 selling shirts and stickers to donate to the UNM. And this year we're on pace with uh, APD to raise another $5,000. Thank you, Chief. With that, we'll go over to our commander. Commander, thank you and welcome. Thanks for having us today. I got uh, myself and we have Lieutenant Jennifer Garcia as well on here. Um, I wanted to say thank you to AFR for including APD with this initiative, often we get uh, our, we're blinded by our crime initiatives and whatnot and lowering crime, but being able to see the bigger causes and bigger effects that the community undergoes with cancer and, and autism and mental health and everything. It's nice to be able to go forth and also give back to the community in that sense and work together with our partners with AFR and within the community, but a big thank you to everybody. So appreciate it. Thank you, Commander Legendaire. Um, so with that, I think we're going to move to Dr. Bio. I hope I said your name right. Thank you, Councillor uh, Borrego. I'm Dr. Boyu. I'm one of the pediatric oncologists here at the University of New Mexico Pediatric Hematology Oncology Division. I really would like to start off by thanking the City of Albuquerque City Council. You guys have been collaborating with us and giving this proclamation almost every year for I think maybe five years or more. Um, normally we have a patient here to receive the proclamation. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic and um, uh, everything being shut notice, I don't have a patient here, so it will be my honor to receive it. I also want to thank Albuquerque Fire Rescue, Chief Gallegos and his team, in fact, David Rettinger was the one who called me and said, we really need one of you to be on this call. They have been working with us for three years. I'm actually wearing one of the shirts that Councilor Senna just showed. 
and they've been doing um, buttons and, and, and all kinds of stuff they sell every year and they raise thousands of dollars that they give to the department, the, the division of pediatric hematology oncology. And that money goes to help our patients and families in real time. It's really been, I mean, just phenomenon, this collaboration that was brought to us by one of our nurses, Esther. Uh, who's from Santa Fe and got to meet the team and brought them on board. And Chief Gallegos and David and all of you, thank you for bringing Albuquerque Police Department on board this year. Welcome, on, uh, on Commando, um, Roger Legendary. I, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. We're, we're happy to have you on board to help raise awareness for childhood cancer across the state. Most of the advancement that Councillor Sano just said will not be possible without the participation of children with cancer and their families who sign up to participate in clinical trials. Here at UNM, we are part of what's known as the Children's Oncology Group. This organization is responsible for these advances in childhood cancer that we all read about under the auspices of the National Cancer Institute. And as part of the UNM Cancer Center, we treat our patients on clinical trials so that they stay close to home. Once the diagnosis is made, the treatment for childhood cancer is the same across the United States. More than 300 children's hospitals participate in the COG, and UNM is one of those 300 hospitals, making it possible for these children to stay close to home for treatment for leukemia that could go up to three years. They don't have to travel out of state to get the same treatment that we get at any other tertiary care hospital in this country. And those 300 hospitals spread across the world, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, England, all of these people participate in children's cancer to help improve the care for children with cancer. And here at UNM, we're part of that um, team. And our goal is to continue to raise awareness with your help. So thank you all so much. We appreciate all of your help. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Boyu. I also wanted to, I know that many of us all know that I've been a cancer patient for the last 10 years, still undergoing chemotherapy. Um, but why this has such a near and dear place in my heart, aside from having cancer myself, is just knowing that um, the, the process and the treatment that really I go through is not something that I would wish upon anyone, especially our kids in our city and our state and around the world. Um, and I love that the efforts are ongoing between fire and police to really raise that awareness and fundraise. But I also wanted to just raise everyone's awareness of how easy it is to really join the, uh, to become a potential match um, as a bone marrow donor. And it's really just the swab. And I know many of us have known swabs through COVID going through up our noses for COVID tests, but really this swab of the cheek um, can actually put you in the registry to become a potential bone marrow donor. Um, having gone through a bone marrow transplant myself, um, it was a very easy process where uh, I collected my stem cells through apheresis, which is very similar in a way I describe it as um, similar to dialysis, where an IV goes in one arm, it separates your stem cells from your blood, your blood goes back, and those stem cells are immediately flown um, to your um, recipient. So um, I know that uh, we have many members within the community that are still seeking a, a bone marrow donor. And so I encourage everybody, uh, anyone between the ages of 18 to 45 to please do sign up. I know that we'll be partnering up with both uh, FIRE and EPD to do donor drives as well. Um, but so 18 to 45, please do sign up. You can sign up virtually. Um, and we'll be sharing more information in that way. But just thank you so much, especially to Dr. Boyu for your efforts um, in, in saving our kids every day um, at the hospital. So thank you. Council Obonsela, can I just um, anchor what you just said for one main reason? Here in New Mexico, we have a major population of Native Americans and Hispanic. That usually gives us a very rare position to represent this, uh, these ethnicities on clinical trials, which is rare. So we take, take it as an opportunity to do that. When it comes to bone marrow transplant that you just mentioned, for a Caucasian, you have a chance of finding a donor in a national bone marrow transplant registry as one out of four. 
and then you get less than that as you go to other ethnicities. If you are Hispanic, it becomes hard. If you're African American, it's very difficult. If you're a native person, it's almost impossible to find a, a donor. So uh, if you can donate to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, that is a very important thing to do, especially here in New Mexico, where you have these uh, ethnicities uh, represented at higher numbers. Thank you, Dr. Boyo. Thank you to um, Councillor Senna for bringing this forward. Thank you to the fire department and our chief and to our commander and APD. Um, and Councillor Senna, you and I specifically have our cancer survivors. So I'm, I'm really delighted that you were able to bring this forward to us and, and recognize, you know, Basically, there's a lot of people that need help and cancer is, is non-discriminatory. It affects all levels, all populations and uh, people at every economic level. So thank you for that. And with that, uh, we will move on to our next order of business, which is a presentation from Jeff Hertz, our, one of our council uh, staff regarding community policing and low, the low rider super show and this is sponsored by Councillor Pena. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon, Councillor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Chair and members of the Council. Um, I'll be uh, very brief. Um, I just here to uh, um, announce a little bit about the National Community Pol Policing Conference that was held a couple of weekends ago. Um, and uh, this was all led by Councillor Pena's office. Um, but on August 19th and 20th of this year, uh, um, the National Community Policing Conference uh, convened um, and the, the main goal of the conference was creating a vehicle-based uh, community policing model um, and doing that in collaboration with a variety of municipalities uh, that are also working to bridge the gap between their local lowrider uh, community, their law enforcement agencies, and their community at large. And so this, this conference, um, we had attendees um, that acknowledged that there is a gap um, that sometimes exists between uh, community needs and law enforcement. And as much of this, this project is about the, the final product of the APD lowrider uh, police vehicle, um, at its core, this program is really about um, building relationships and developing trust uh, between law enforcement and the communities that they're serving. And so um, during this conference, we had cities participating from Olathe, uh, Kansas, uh, Tucson, Arizona, and uh, National City, California. Um, we also had uh, participants from the original lowrider or the cruising task force that was here in Albuquerque, as well as the Albuquerque DEA office. Um, we also had uh, co uh, Commissioner Quesada's policy analyst, Margarita, in attendance, and uh, Councillor Senna was also able to, to drop in as well. So we really appreciate her being there. Um, and the conference, it, it, was, it was all, um, it was all uh, spearheaded by Councillor Pena. Um, as well as APD's Southwest Problem Response Team, who's been working on the, uh, the lowrider police vehicle for some time now. And the, the conference was held during the same weekend as the lowrider super show. And Councillor Pena intends to have this conference happen on an annual basis um, in order to continue to build the, uh, the network of municipalities that we've been really starting to hear calls from in response to this, this particular program. Um, and so we're, as part of that, we're also trying to launch a virtual, a monthly virtual forum uh, where different participating municipalities can showcase their work um, in their programs and then also receive feedback on how to, how to grow their program. So um, I'm currently in the process as the council staff uh, working on a report capturing all the outcomes of this conference, um, which we plan to share with all the participating municipalities, uh, as well as with the council and relevant city departments. Um, as part of all this, as well as the packaging of the report, Councillor Pena uh, recently um, requested for a fiscal impact analysis to be conducted. 
um, and, and doing so in a way that captured the true economic impact of the Lowrider Super Show. Um, that that, that uh, report is still in the process of being created, um, but we, we did hear uh, from a local production company, Artemis Productions, who helped coordinate the event. Um, we, we heard a, a few numbers from them, um, so I'll just quickly go through a few of those. But the Lowrider Super Show brought out um, over 400 exhibitors of Lowriders, uh, 40 vendors who were selling a variety of merchandise, um, and exhibitors and spectators from all across the country came out from California, Oklahoma, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, um, and beyond. And so it had a huge draw. And we'll be sure to get you some of the numbers on the economic impact of that event um, when the time comes. Um, I, I'm here to answer any other questions you might have in regards to the conference, uh, but we'll be sure to have that report uh, ready and, and delivered to you when the time uh, comes. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hertz. Uh, Councilor Pena, did you want to say anything before we go on to questions? Yeah, yes. Um, thank you, Madam President. Well, first of all, um, during the conference, we had an unfortunate turn of events. So some of the things we had to make some adjustments and some of the you counselors received notice of some of the adjustments that had to be made. Um, unfortunately, that's when the officers had been um, shot on, I think, that Thursday. And so it, it kind of twisted things around. And then, unfortunately, I had gotten food poisoning. So I want to thank Councillor Senna for filling in for me on the last day of the conference um, that, that I was ill. I appreciate her being there. And, and, you know, the feedback that I received from her was very positive. But um, one thing I just do want to add is that, you know, this is just really when he's talking about the people who attended the uh, Lowrider Super Show, when you went and you looked at the cars that were participating and people from there, they were from exactly what he said throughout the country, as far east as New Jersey and, and you know, local Texas, Utah. It was just, it's just amazing. Um, it was an amazing event. And from um, what we know, um, and we're going to get the fiscal impact analysis, as Jeff said, is that um, pretty much the hotels were sold out, the um, the the uh, super show was sold out, you couldn't even get in, people were just kind of getting frustrated because they were trying to get in and couldn't. And then um, just to, to really emphasize, you know, this community p policing model, people kind of tend to focus on the car. And, and as Jeff mentioned, it's really not about the car, it's about that relationship building. And one of the things that we did is we went out with, uh, Kansas actually bought, brought their APD car out. And um, it was so amazing. We um, we went for a little cruise down Central and then we parked at a, um, at a parking lot. And it was so interesting that we had the two APD cars there and they were, you know, the police officers. And it was uh, the feedback that we had received from not only Kansas, but our some of the police from our police department are, said that um, you would never see if you had two police cars pulled over, you would never see um, what we um, seen that day was that all of a sudden people from the community just came and parked. They seen the cars and they engaged with the officers and they reached out and they took pictures and the officers, you know, talked with them. They took pictures with them. It was just really, when we're talking about how do we bridge that gap between communities of color and, and the, the law enforcement, it was just such a, a wonderful day. I mean, that really um, says volumes about how this works to, um, to build um, our community policing. And then the one last thing I wanted to say is that National City actually has a cruising ordinance on the books and they've reached out to us to see if the Albuquerque City Council would actually go or submit a letter and testify on behalf of repealing their um, anti-cruising ordinance in National City, California. So um, we intend to do that, I think. I, I think we're organizing that. I'm pretty excited about it. So if any of the other councilors wanna, wanna um, join up with us, I think it, it would be awesome. So with that, I would just questions or defer back to you, um, Council President. Thank you, Councilor Pena. Do we do I have any questions from any of the counselors? I don't see any questions. I just wanna make a comment, Councilor Pena. Oh, Councilor Senna, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. I'll be brief. I just wanted to mention, you know, I was I'm very glad to have been there. Uh, to meet the officers of uh, Olathe, 
Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> um, I know we were both struggling between Albuquerque and Olathe, um, but just appreciate them coming in and sharing really the community efforts and where it came from, um, standing by our APD low rider car at the super show, um, really just kind of standing there to kind of hear the comments as people walked by. Um, and, you know, it, it was engaging um, that people who did have questions asked them and really finding out that it was built by community, by our kids uh, of the community. And so experiencing that was uh, really great. And to also see our officers there um, sharing and with almost giddiness of what they got to do for our community and um, sharing strategies as to how we can do better in terms of community policing. So I just really want to thank Councilor Pena for that uh, and the efforts of our uh, PRT team and our visiting officers and DEAs um, from around the nation. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Um, Councillor Pena, President, if I could yes, just add before you finalize it, is that you know um, even the DEA is so interested in this is that they're um, looking at um, providing the city of Albuquerque a grant in the amount of I think twenty five thousand dollars. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, so that we can expand this program. Thank you, Councillor Pena. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you that weekend. I had quite a bit on my calendar, but I just want to say that, you know, this program is really, it sounds like it's been, it's really successful. And, you know, when you have uh, people that feel like they're marginalized, um, having that outreach between these um, lowrider groups and the police is, is, you know, it's really a phenomenal feat. And to have an actual conference for an entire weekend and have our, our um, you know, our motel industry sold out is, is a pr pretty phenomenal feat. So I give you a lot of credit. The only thing I didn't hear was that there were no lowriders from Española. So maybe in the future, we'll invite them. <laughs> so thank you, Councilor Pena, for that. Um, we appreciate you. Um, Okay, so we are going to move on to our economic development discussion, and tonight we have none. So with that, we are going to move on to public comment. But before we do, I'd like to read some information into the record. Um, and this is, um, thank you all for joining us this evening to provide live public comment. We have also received written comments that were distributed to the counselors in advance of today's meeting. Members of the public will be able to discuss the council if they have signed up for live public comment per the instructions published on the agenda and on our website on Friday. Speakers will be moved into the meeting room two at a time and Mr. Moya will help us with that. They will remain muted with their camera off until they are called upon to speak, at which point they can turn on their camera, unmute themselves, and they will have one and a half minutes to provide comments to the city council. After that, they will again be muted and return to be an attendee of the Zoom webinar. Here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant has one and a half minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the counselors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the Zoom webinar. So we will start with our first speaker, Mr. Moya. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Our first speaker is David Parsons. Mr. Parsons, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And your one and a half minutes will begin when you start speaking. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President and members of the council. My name is David Parsons. I'm a wildlife biologist and was a member of the technical advisory group charged with guiding the development of the resource management plan for the Candelaria Nature Preserve. The resource management plan establishes the primary purpose of the property as a wildlife preserve. To achieve this purpose, it is important to minimize wildlife disturbing activities within the preserve. A major intrusion into the preserve with the high potential for causing wildlife disturbing activities is the 1.3 acre asphalt milling pad constructed by the city without proper regulatory approvals in 2016. 
while agreeing to remove the asphalt pad during deliver, uh, deliberations of the technical advisory group, the city has reversed its position and has proposed language in the plan that would allow the asphalt pad to remain in perpetuity, even though alternative parking solutions exist. I uh, stand in support of Councillor Benton's compromise language in Amendment 1, which allows for the use of the pad in support of habitat restoration activities for up to 12 years. And I respectfully request your support of Councillor Benton's amendments and your vote to approve the Candelaria Nature Preserve Management Plan. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Any questions? We will move on. Uh, I have a question. Councillor Benton, thank you. I didn't see that you joined us. Thank you for joining yeah, us. Yeah, sorry, I was stuck on I-40. I don't know what was going on out there. Um, Mr. Parsons, uh, I believe um, that members of the technical advisory group, which you were a member of, uh, were told on more than one occasion by uh, open space staff that the asphalt parking area would be removed. Is that correct? Yes, Councillor and uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, at least the minutes reflect, uh, I, I know for certain one, one incident uh, that was recorded in the minute, minutes where a representative uh, uh, of the open space division agreed with the advisory group that the pad would be removed. And, and and I mean I know that there was a, a, a some confusion. Maybe you could 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 clarify to everyone. The asphalt pad is not a poured asphalt. It's some recycled asphalt that's ground up. That sometimes the city will put in alleys and places like that. And it was placed there, and it's a fairly large area. Um, and and there was some confusion that we were there. The concern was that this material would leach contaminants into the soil or into the water and so forth. Um, the department looked into that uh, just recently and concluded that that would not be the problem, but it, it's much more than that, is it not? I mean, it's the idea that, that a, a big area like that is an invitation for parking and for machinery and for activity that should be minimized in a nature preserve. Question for you, Mr. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, your information is accurate. Yes, it was. Uh, I think it's the stuff they chew up off asphalt streets. Yeah. And, have a, and uh, they placed it out there and packed it down primarily for the purpose of the uh, farmer at the time to store crops and uh, equipment. Uh, yeah. It's a relief to know that the toxicity is low or non-existent. But that's not the primary issue. The issue is we're trying to establish a wildlife preserve and wildlife are disturbed by human activities. And that pad is out in the middle, seven of the 16 fields of that part of the uh, property have a, a boundary joining on that pad. So the impact could reach out to uh, nearly a third or more of the area uh, of human activity on the pad. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because I, I think we've got it straight finally. With we keep we keep amending our amendment, but I think we're finally clear about what the intent is, which is, you know, first of all, you you want to minimize traffic and parking and and cars starting and started stopping and and uh, leaking oil or whatever they're doing, um, and um, and then over time, the expectation is we. We mostly eliminate that activity. You know, once once the fields are uh, you know restored, there would still be some maintenance activity, and we're acknowledging that and allowing for that for that to occur. So, thanks for your service on the on the tag, Mr. Parsons, and for your ongoing support for the Nature Preserve. You're very welcome. Thank you, Madam President, Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. Parsons, Mr. Moya. Thank you, Madam President. Our next speaker is Shelley Barker. Ms. Parker, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and your one and a half minutes will begin when you start speaking. Thank you, Madam President, uh, counselors. My name is Shelley Barker, an enrolled agent and a member of the New Mexico Society of Enrolled Agents. And I am here in support of an amendment that is going to be presented to you about the tax preparer ordinance. Um, the amendment is now going to exclude 
enrolled agents, as well as CPAs and attorneys. Thank you. The amendment is going to acknowledge that all three credentials deserve the same federal treatment. Thank you. And now that amendment also is doing a better job describing the bank products, and the, it's doing a better job describing the rights of the taxpayer, the consumer, and the responsibilities and duties of the tax preparer. Thank you. Back in, you might remember back in, oh, February of 2021, the original tax preparer ordinance was uh, presented to you and voted on, and it had very little input from the tax community. But I wanna thank the city attorney's office and the policy division and the consumer advocate services for when that pushback started to come, they listened to us. They had meetings with not only the New Mexico Society of Enrolled Agents, but a lot of other um, organizations. And they took the advice and the suggestions that came flooding in, I'm sure. Um, I speak in favor of the amendment. You're going to be, I don't think you vote on it today, but you will learn about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Next speaker. Madam President. Council Gibson. Yeah. yeah. Council Gibson. Thank and Councilor Jones. Madam President. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank our public speaker, uh, Ms. Barker, for appearing today. I just went through that amendment uh, actually this afternoon pretty quickly. Um, however, I did not see that it exempted enrolled agents. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am, it sure does. Okay. At least the one that the, right. the attorney's office sent me. Well, I, and I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to do that. Um, I think that this um, legislation really uh, attempts to protect people. Um, you know, I did income taxes myself as a sideline for nine years, and I understand people come in and their eyes glaze over, you know, so... Um, well, I think most people really try to do right by their clients. Uh, I, there, there's certainly a lot of opportunity to take advantage of people financially. So I appreciate the intent that, that this original bill had, but I was, I, I'm, I'm really glad. And I um, uh, congratulate both Ms. Meyer as well as uh, Councilor Davis for this amendment. Um, because I think you made some really good points. So thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Ms. Barker, I just want to thank you and, and everyone else involved in this who educated us, who told us what things really were. You know, we try to make things better for everyone and protect people. And sometimes we end up harming the people who are protecting the people. So thank you, thank you. Uh, we never know these things. We can't know these things unless you educate us. So just a reminder for anyone who's listening, if we do legislation that you see is uh, grossly inappropriate or something's wrong, get those phones ringing, talk to us. Talk to thank, us. thank you for letting us and, and not being upset with us, all of us for nagging at you. Appreciate Absolutely not, Ms. Barker. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Ms. Barker. I don't see any other questions for you. Thank you for bringing your information forward to us. It does help us. Um, we will move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Julie Rao. Ms. Rao, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Hello there, everybody. Thank you so much for having um, time to listen to a concern that um, the West Side community has with regard to the Cibola Loop um, building of a multi-generational uh, housing complex. I did submit a lengthy um, page and a half written um, question and statement document earlier today that I hope Councillor uh, Borrego has had a chance to review. And I guess the main question um, that stems from that document is, will the residents of 
the neighborhoods surrounding Cibola Loop have an opportunity to comment on the request for proposal responses and what exactly is gonna be built in that vacant piece of property. Um, have you had a chance to speak to Mr. Giron in regards to that, um, Ms. Borrego, I think is our main concern right now. Thank you, Ms. Rael. I, I did see your letter today and um, I don't know if Mr. Hidon or if uh, Carol Pierce is on, but I'd like them to be on. Um, there was an R there have been three RFPs that have been released on that particular property. Um, and the latest RFP includes some senior housing. I think there was some miscommunication in the, in the community because there was, uh, and I heard this through the grapevine, um, that we were planning to build a homeless shelter there and that is not the case. There is a master plan that was done for Cibola Loop and that was done um, about five years ago. And it includes um, sen senior affordable housing, a pool, a library and a multi-generational center. And I'm happy to share that information with you if you'd like to schedule a time with me and we can actually take a look at that master plan. The uh, housing piece is the first of that development. And there, currently the city owns 20 acres. There's five acres that we still need to acquire, which is pretty much the drainage piece. And we've, um, we've been looking for the funding for that particular piece. Um, Ms. Pierce, would you like to address the RFPs? Because there have been three different RFPs that have been released. And I think um, this last one is the one that Ms. Rael is referring to. Yes, thank you, um, City Council President Borrego. Um, yes, on the Siebel Loop, the portion that will be for affordable housing, that RFP, the request for proposal is out there um, in the community. And I don't know exactly the response time for that. It, I think it's soon, if not already received. And it is for um, senior housing rental property that's really identified in the community on what really is needed. I also, it came to my attention that there was some misinformation in the community about a homeless shelter um, at, in that particular um, property, which is not what this RFP is about at all. It is about affordable housing, which is, a, is an important um, need in our community for seniors. Thank you, um, Councilor President Brago. Ms. Pierce, um, one of the questions she asked is if there was still an opportunity for the public to comment. And I think, um, I don't I, think that, I think that comment period already ended. Um, I believe, there's always an opportunity for the public to comment, so. Um, Council President Borrego, I believe that timing has ended and I can get back to Ms. Rael, um, Council Borrego, if you send me her, her letter and we'll get back to you and I'll uh, get with Rick Quiron to find out if that comment period is over. I believe it has ended, but I don't want to say for sure. And let me get the exact timing on that. Um, Ms. Royale, I will forward your email to Ms. Pierce and uh, we can set up a time to, to chat. And you can always call my office and set up a time to meet with me. I'd be happy to meet with you and, and show you the original master plan. And uh, we can discuss the other two RFPs and why those were not accepted, but it's always okay. been for housing. Okay, so when you say the three RFPs that were released, I guess you're talking in terms of the full master plan, not just the Cibola, I'm sorry, not just the multi-generational facility? No, I'm yeah, talking just- a point of order. I'm sorry, point of order. Excuse me, counselor. Madam President, I'm sorry, here's my video. Point of order, I believe that we don't, are we doing questions of counselors during public comment? Um, I'm just responding to her question, counselor, but I, I agree with you. I think it'd be better for her to, for us to uh, have a meeting with her and just discuss these individually. But just to answer your question, there were three RFPs for the housing piece that went out, not for the entire multi-generational center. 
So That's with great. that, uh, thank you, Councilor Bassan. We will- um, Madam President, I have a question. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I was going to address the same thing that Councilor Bassan did. And I think it's been at least for the 14 years that I've been on city council, this is a two minute comment period uh, from the public. Uh, and I'm sorry, Ms. Royal, but I think you got caught in the middle of this. This is the type of thing you need to take up with a counselor and staff uh, on um, time that is not at the beginning of a meeting, but that has an agenda. And Madam President, I- Pardon me, Councillor Jones, but I think the council president can address questions and all counselors have addressed questions in the past if we so choose. So I understand the point of order, but I also believe that I would like to provide as much information to Ms. Rael as possible. And I think that we have um, met that obligation. Madam President, I thank you for your opinion and I may have mine too, I believe. And that is if we're going to enter into discussions and a debate about issues, that this should be done as an agenda item so that all people who have an interest in this, and I am confident Ms. Morel is not the only one who has an interest in this, that they may also see that as an agenda item and be able to participate in this kind of discussion. And again, Madam President, I realize that you have extraordinary powers as the president this year, but I do believe that there are precedents prior to your being president and I would certainly like to see us get our meetings back under control again. Neither- Council council. Jones, thank you for Madam your opinion. If I may, move on. Madam President, if I may, I believe it's inappropriate to have meetings this long because we're not following our basic rules. Thank you, Madam President. Ms. Royal, um, I'm sorry for that, but um, if you could contact my office, we could set up a time to meet and I'd be happy to have Ms. Pierce there as well. And I just wanted to mention that a previous conversation we just had with uh, Candelaria um, Center, we had a discussion about and Councillor Benton was happy to address that. So I think each counselor does have that option. And as the council president, I am going to exercise my authority on that. Thank you very much. Point of order, we'll Madam President. Next order of point, of, point of order, Madam President. Um, the person with whom I was having Councilor a dialogue, Benton, um, I, I did not recognize me. you. Councilor Benton, You're I did not, not recognize speak, you. Madam President. Councilor Benton, I haven't recognized you yet. Well, Madam President, I'm making a point of order, which okay, you go must ahead. recognize. Go ahead. You must recognize a point of order, FYI. All right. The person with whom I was speaking, it was a member of the technical advisory group on a bill that is before us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Benton. We will move on to our next speaker. The next speaker is Peggy Norton. Ms. Norton, uh, you are ready to go. You know, your time will begin when we start speaking. Thank you, I made it back just in time. I ask you to vote to support the resource management plan for Candelaria Nature Preserve and the two amendments. A few concerned people, including myself, met five years ago to discuss activities on this property. Herbicide use, no plantings, asphalt tailings being laid down, no farming contract. This plan evolved and is in the forefront to address species loss, climate change and drought through no herbicide use, healthy soils and native habitat. I hope we find the financial support to accomplish this sooner rather than later. I thank Senator O'Neill and Representative Armstrong for their financial support of this site becoming a nature preserve. Others to thank, Councillor Benton for his continued involvement and commitment to the vision. Michael Jensen of OSAB, who was instrumental in starting this process, during which TAG adopted a vision of mosaic of habitat and diversity of species. Brian Hansen as TAG leader. The two amendments submitted by Councillor Benton clarify parking, asphalt pad removal, and a process to provide notification of any herbicide use. Our original model was based on Whitfield Conservation Area, which does not allow herbicide use, so any use should be for exceptional reasons. 
I also support Dave Parsons detailed written comments regarding the asphalt pad. Thank you for your time and your support for this resource management plan. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Are there any questions of counselors for Ms. Norton? Apparently not. Thank you, Ms. Norton. We will move on to our next speaker. Madam President, we had a couple other people sign up to speak, but they have not shown up in the uh, Zoom attendees yet. So that will conclude public comments. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Moya, for your um, guidance on that. We will move on to administration question and answer. And we move to uh, Councillor Benton with questions for Department of Municipal Development. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have two questions. Uh, uh, this is for uh, two different divisions, I suppose, of DMD. The first one is for um, the parking division. And, um, you know, the council did pass a temporary uh, uh, stay in the uh, in the uh, approval of uh, residential parking permits while a, um, a, a new set of um, requirements was developed that, that recognizes some of the nuances of uh, residential parking permit and, and the idea that it would not just be anybody who doesn't want someone parking in the street in front of their house, uh, but rather based on need and unique circumstances. Um, so I want to ask uh, DMD Parking Division, what are you and where are you with your proposed changes to um, to the program? And uh, I believe our deadline for that uh, via the council's uh, action was uh, around October. So wanted to see how that was looking at this point, whether you're going to be on target for uh, proposed changes to the uh, to the program. Uh, Madam President and Councillor Ben, let me answer that question for you. So we're in the final draft of any changes to the parking permit. Mr. Montoya, could you identify yourself first? Uh, Patrick Montoya, Director for the Department of Municipal Development. Thank you. And, uh, Councillor Ben, to address that question for you. So we have the final draft of any of the changes that should be made or would be made. They're in final review now with our legal team. Uh, we'll have one more just... Uh, review of the, of the changes, and then we'll present those to Mr. Rael for final review. Uh, but we will meet or are ahead of the deadline that was imposed by council. Thank you, Director Tafoya. Um, uh, let's see, um, then the next one was um, the installation of the new signals for lead and coal at Walter. Um, this, <laughs> This project has been called for and funded for long before this administration. And I know now that, uh, that we may have some fiscal problems with it. Now that we've waited this long, they're gonna cost a lot more. But what is the status of that? We, we were told that we would have these uh, being installed by the end of this year. What's the status of that, Mr. Director? Madam President and Councillor Benton, so um, not to disappoint you, but I don't think that we're going to meet the year-end deadline, but let me just very quickly explain where we are with both of those uh, signals. And for the benefit of all of the councillors, these are two additional traffic signals on Walter, one at Lead and one at Cole. It will be a four-way signal installation. Um, the pricing for those when we actually put those out for consideration came in much, much higher than we had expected. I mean, with prices these days, lead time for material and whatnot, uh, we were quite concerned. We actually reached out to the state under the state pricing agreement to see what prices might come in at uh, for both of those signals. We should have that information by midweek uh, next week, as a matter of fact. We're hoping that both of those stay under the $600,000 threshold that we, we would have identified for those. Most of our signals now are coming in at about $800,000 per, per signal itself. Uh, we'll have a better answer for you. The lead time is going to be the challenge in uh, what, we, what we are experiencing with some of our other signals that we've ordered anywhere from 20 to 24 weeks. So um, I would ask that you just be one uh, a, a patient for another week or so so I can get an exact answer for you. But as soon as we know what the state pricing agreement comes in at, we'll have a better sense of 
what we have uh, available in funding because you have earmarked a considerable amount of money through past cleanup bills. However, with the new cost, we'd have to see where the differences are at and how we, we reach either an agreement or how the department comes up with whatever that difference is. So, uh, but again, I just, I, I, I don't wanna mislead you. We will not have those anywhere near installation by the end of the year, but our goal is to work on those as quickly as we can after the first of the year once we have that pricing. Okay, I, I appreciate that, Madam, Madam President, Mr. Director. I appreciate that, um, and I know you're, you're trying to get this done. And I, everyone recognizes the supply chain problems that we have now. But this has been such a long haul uh, for this particular neighborhood. And I was just at their neighborhood meeting the other night, and it, it's really hard to keep saying, "Oh yeah, we're going to get it." You know, it's going to happen, and and feeling like. <laughs> Am I lying or am I not? You know, it's going to happen someday at what double the price because of all the time it has taken. But but I look forward to that discussion. I appreciate it, uh, Director Montoya. And I'm sorry, I for whatever reason I must have been thinking of uh, Henry Tafoya or something. <laughs> and you don't even look like Henry Tafoya. <laughs> well, sorry, a, a distant <laughs> cousin. Well, thank sorry. you for your patience. We do appreciate that. All right. Councillor Benton, are you done? Thank you. We will move on to Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have a few questions for our HR director, Director Anthony Romero. I think he's with us. There he is. I see his smiling face. So, um, Director, I'm um, really happy that uh, uh, we talked earlier today and that, that you did have a, uh, responses for my questions that um, I had sent um, back on the 18th and uh, with actually with a couple of subsequent reminders to, and, and this is, this is all um, uh, that came about because of my interest in uh, the many emails that we've been getting about animal welfare. Although to be fair, uh, other, other uh, uh, departments, you know, wish they could uh, hire people and get them in place quicker. So, uh, so both of those things are true, but I really was uh, compelled by the um, animal welfare department. So, um, and then I just noticed a little while ago that you did send the uh, answers to the three or four questions that I had, uh, 1.30 this afternoon. So thank you for that. I think that it went out to all counselors. I haven't even had a chance to read them yet. So I will- just Sorry to interrupt you, Council Vice President Gibson. It, did, it only went to you. I can send them to all the counselors if you'd like me to. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be great. That would you got great. it. I'll do that right away. Then they'll have what I have. Um, so, but this, I think this is, worthwhile to spend a little time on this so that uh, the public uh, can get the, these answers directly from you. And I wanna start out by saying that I really appreciate the work that you've done so far. Um, I'm trying to trim down the turnaround time in making hires and that whole process was kind of started off from questions from Councillor Senna, I believe. So there've been a, a lot of us uh, interested in, in trying to do what we can to help support you in that endeavor. Um, so, but I want to see us get better than, than six or 120 days. Wait, was it 60, 60 days? 60 <laughs> days. Oh, not four months, two months. Um, because as you know, because I know you've been in manage, management for a long time, the longer it takes after you've offered a job to someone before you can actually get them here or there or wherever, you know, working for us and on payroll, um, the more likely you are to lose that candidate or to lose that potential hire, the person that you want to hire. And uh, the reality is, is that we go from our first choice to our second choice to end up to, you know, somebody who we're, bringing in with fingers crossed. Um, and this is true across the board, you know, from, 
from professionals, accountants, and attorneys, and engineers, and and to you know people, you know on uh, hourly, you know. Um, so with that said, um, one of the uh, one of the things that I learned um, looking into the the uh, understaffing over at the animal welfare department is that it takes from two to three weeks to get in for testing at employee health. And my question was, and I was, I didn't understand what employee health was, sorry, I didn't go through it, was uh, I, I thought that was a contract that we had with an outside source. So my question was, you know, could we look at that contractor or, or get somebody else in? But I understand it's a function of the city. It's actually within the city and I think I'm, a, I'm accurate about that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But any in any case, whether it's a contract uh, or if if it's somebody in house, um, that's two to three weeks is a very long time to be waiting. I suspect that that could be at least partially addressed uh, by having the, uh, uh, the the new hire. Uh, make an appointment immediately to do that. But but I really wanted to ask you about that. Um, what can we do to eliminate a two to three week wait before an employee can go through the, uh, uh, the, the employee health uh, requirement? Council Vice President Gibson, and for the rest of the folks on the call, I'm Anthony Romero, the HR Director with the City of Albuquerque. Um, I appreciate the question and, and, and the concern. Yes, there's always been that desire to get folks onboarded and filling a vacant spot as soon as possible um, with the city. And so the administration has one of the, my first goals when I took this position was to implement um, the hiring for reform process. Many individuals in HR had already started sort of looking at that process and chopping down the days that it that it took um, to get through that process. And so we, we did a really good job at um, coming up with a workflow that's sort of like a Gantt chart, <laughs> you know, but it has just all the steps that um, necessitate the department directors I mean, the departments and the HR coordinators working alongside with the central HR team to move that um, person through the process. So one of the items that you mentioned is the employee health center. So when an individual um, applies for a job and is selected and that position requires a pre-employment um, test, be it a drug or a physical, um, they make an appointment uh, with the employee health center and that's located in the basement of City Hall. Um, that employee um, will go there and it, I took a real deep look at looking at some of those, those times. And so at Animal Welfare, there were a few that took about the two weeks that you said. And so we have been talking with um, Employee Health Center and they have made some process improvements on their end. Um, but I also looked at some other um, indicators and ask, well, so why is that really happening? A lot of times that that extra time happens in that process for that individual to get onboarded is there could be a medical condition that they're waiting on um, before they can clear it and, and have them start um, the first day. I looked at some of the um, recent uh, hires that went through the clinic and a lot of those were coming in at like two to four days. So a little bit more acceptable than that two week, but I do uh, recognize that there are folks that can get caught in that in that crunch, and not all of the time it might not all the time happen to be a medical due to a medical condition. So what um, my message is to a lot of the um, H or I should just say to all of the HR coordinators out there and the department directors is just really um, improving our. Um, communication effort so that if we're seeing somebody is stuck somewhere, if they reach out to us, I get a direct directors that'll send me a text, hey, where's Anthony Romero? It's been too long. Then we can call and sort of shake it through the process. And so um, 
the uh, that that's the deal with the employee health center. Um, I know that uh, one of the things you were alluding to was, you know, could we pro possibly get another uh, group on contract to do that? Um, I just want to explore working with our procurement division, just um, so that we could determine if um, we need to go through another RFP process to get a second vendor on board to provide those pre-employment tests to us, or, um, you know, also meeting with the current vendor um, just to kind of review the existing contract. So I think that, you know, I'm going to really try working hard at continuing to meet with the current vendor and they know that that, that two weeks is not, not acceptable and isn't really helping um, us get that done. Um, but the current vendor did go through the RFP process. Okay. So, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's good. I'm glad you're looking at that. And you know what? It, it, I think that the whole idea should be to keep looking for ways to shorten this process. Yes. So uh, maybe, maybe one person uh, took three weeks, another person took two weeks, maybe somebody else took a few days. I noticed that the director has her hand up and I wanna recognize her in just a second um, because she, I think I'm quoting her, so she's going to correct me if I'm wrong. But you know, it does. It doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't matter. They need to be a, a well-oiled um, gear in this machine, in this hiring machine. And and if they don't have the resources they need, you know what? This is the body who should know about it. Uh, we, I, I mean, there's. We can't do any thou shalts and all that. Believe me, we got that chapter and verse in a meeting recently. I get that. But but it's not okay to have two employees cleaning cages at animal welfare on the west side when we had at that time in the neighborhood of 900 animals. I think that's between the two two shelters. That's not, that's not acceptable at all. Because you know what, we're losing more, more employees because of that. So, um, it, Madam President, so if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask um, Director Ortega, she is very patiently waiting, and I'd like to hear what she has to say, please. Director Ortega, uh, Madam Gibson, you still have the floor. All right. Hello, Director. Thank you for being here. So what uh, what can you tell us, please? Uh, thank you, Councillor Gibson and Madam President. Um, I, I really just wanted to um, give kudos to, to Director Romero and his team. Um, when we have an unusual amount of vacancies in animal welfare right now. And as soon as we realized that we were getting a little bit behind, I reached out to Director Romero and he, he really helped us with resources to help to start to get us a little caught up. So um, he really has given us um, one of his own staff to really help us get positions posted, get the process moving quicker. And I know that I've been part of his, his group to be able to um, move the process quicker. So I think we've been able to, to work closely together and, and um, uh, we've moved it into an emergency situation. And again, he's continued to throw resources at us to really help us uh, get through this. Um, he understands that I'm a new director uh, and he's also a new director in his role. So we're really learning to work together and rely on each other. Um, and I think that, um, you know, since we were able to meet, things are moving much quicker. And, and we have seen some people onboarded and, and more positions posted. So um, I appreciate this whole council for advocating to get those positions filled and, and for uh, Director Romero just allowing us to add to our team. And we also did add another personnel officer to our team that will be starting in a couple of weeks that will really, really be helpful as well. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Madam President and, and Councillor Gibson for your support. Thank you, Director. Gibson, Thank does you. that answer your question? Well, I, I'm not done. <laughs> I still have at least two more, maybe three. 
and another okay. one after that. Go ahead. You have the floor. So, um, so I, I, I'm glad to hear from the from the director of animal welfare department, and she did tell me everything that she said. Now she did tell me, and I think I did relay some of that back to you when when we did have a meeting. That she was very appreciative that you selected somebody on your staff to work directly with her, and that these are all good things, but it's just not enough. It's just not enough. So. Um, I, I don't know what the next step is as far as the employee health. I guess we need to find out who's running employee health and find out what they need to, you know, to uh, uh, smooth out that process a little bit more. And, and believe me, I will do that. So my next question is, because uh, I don't want to take a whole, a whole bunch of time here. Um, I understand it takes 14 days to post jobs and a permanently running job posting would eliminate about two weeks from the process, or this is, I think this is, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is what I was told, at least for animal welfare department, probably other departments. Would, would both your department, Director Romero and, and uh, um, uh, Director uh, Ortega consider a permanent posting? Council President Borrego and Council Vice President Gibson, um, what you're referring to is a continuous posting, mm -hmm. and we do have those continuous postings out there for positions. The department director just needs to let us know when they want to advertise that they would like the position to be continuous. Mm -hmm. Typically, you'll find those continuous positions advertised for um, difficult to recruit or positions that have multiple vacancies. And those really help with the timeline because it takes off the advertisement process and the two week um, uh, requirement. We do a two week advertisement posting um, mainly for our classified positions. Um, the union and through the collective bargaining agreements typically ask us to keep them um, advertised for those two weeks. And so we'll advertise that for, for, for all of them just to be consistent, um, but we are always open to work with the department director um, in, you know, massaging that uh, advertisement to be continuous, extending it, and just like you mentioned, we've, we've had to do that in some instances lately where we just didn't get a large enough pool of qualified applicants, and so we've had to extend that time frame so that the interview committee would have a qualified pool of Okay, well, one quick follow up. Does the Animal Welfare Department have any continuous positions uh, posted? They do not, and we will make that change, Counselor. We can okay. make that change, especially to um, Director Ortega. We can do that for your animal handlers um, as well as the uh, animal services officers. Okay, so I'm going to let you two talk about that, but that just was one of the things that, that came up and in um, some of the emails I got. Uh, as your department considered uh, sort of a, I don't know, a quick path or a, at least a different hiring path for certain positions. And I would suggest that these would be things like not only animal welfare uh, enforcement officers and handlers and veterinary staff, but um, maybe for um, police officers or fire, uh, you know, very critical uh, positions where without them, um, people can get hurt badly or, or animals can suffer. Have you, and I'm just wondering, just wonder, have you given this any thought? Is there, is there uh, any thought behind this? Council President Borrego and Council Vice President Gibson. Um, absolutely, we're looking at, you know, how do we get to a um, main goal of, you know, making something as a higher as rapid as possible, right, by going through those steps. And so really collapsing all of these steps in a way that we've shared with HR coordinators and departments. And like, this is the best way to approach it, like going through this step, this step, this step, as we're going through um, hiring reform, we're doing some debriefs where we're also noticing other places that we could collapse. So um, I agree with you uh, in 
your statement that, you know, 60 days is just, you know, not something to completely celebrate and be happy with. I think we're going to continue to try to um, make that process quicker. Continuous um, postings are going to help a lot. And, you know, we're, we're looking at really um, making sure that we're not taking any pieces out of the process that um, would not get us the best person to work for the city, right? So we want to make sure that we get through all of those right processes um, and do it as expeditiously as possible so that we aren't um, losing folks to other um, opportunities. And so, um, okay. yeah. Okay. So again, my question was about a separate, special, streamlined uh, process. Yeah. So that that's Councilor Vice President uh, uh, Gibson. We will be um, looking at doing that. Right now, I don't have a good uh, draft to present that, but we do want to identify certain positions that would be able to go through a more rapid process. Um, one of the things that we already do um, with uh, the transit department is for the motor coach operator positions where we will offer a contingent hire based on the passing of the pre-employment physical and drug screen. And so that has helped a little bit. We're looking at um, some lessons that we've learned from that process and hopefully we'll be able to translate um, those positives into other positions to do that. Okay, thank you so much, Director Romero. I appreciate, I really do appreciate the work that you put into this. And boy, I wouldn't want your job. So thank you so much for doing your job. Thank you so much. Madam President, I have one more question, but it's not for Director Romero. I'm wondering if uh, our CFO, uh, Mr. Um, Sanjay is is with us. I'm looking for him, but I, I don't, I don't see him. Mr. Uh, Hi, there he is. Council I think he's President, in the conference room. Council oh, President Borrego, Councilor Gibson, um, Mr. Bacto is not with us this evening. Um, we'd be happy to relay your question, or I'd be happy to take a shot at it if you'd like. So Sanjay's not with us today. No, ma'am. I'm very sorry to hear that. Okay, well, I'll. Anybody who wants this question can have it then. Okay. Um, so it has it, it's concerned me over the years. You know, I'm, I'm just here for like for a medium amount of time, um, two terms. And so for the past, since I've been on council, we've had one company doing our, our annual city audits. One company, that's Moss Adams. And so I had our staff go back in time and, and take a look at uh, the, the uh, past, uh, actually we got 19 years here. In the past 19 years, Moss Adams has conducted 13 of our audits, 13 of them. Uh, REDW has, con has conducted three, and Neff and Reese is uh, uh, has also conducted three. Uh, I, I know we're out of compliance, and I, I already know what you're going to say. You're going to say COVID and a few other things. Uh, I, I don't think that's a good answer. And and again, you know, I think this is we're we're coming up on the time when we're going to be um, uh, talking with Moss Adams. I'll bet it is this year again too, right? Uh, and so what are we going to do to, uh, to uh, make sure that we get good audits? Because after uh, seven, eight years of Moss Adams, I don't think that they're, I don't think anybody, and I think Moss Adams is a fine company, but we're just way too close. So what are we going to do to ensure that we get good audits? What are we going to do to make sure that we get someone besides Moss Adams? That's my question to you. Council President Barredo and Councilor Gibson, um, I'm gonna ask Renee Martinez from our finance uh, department to respond to that, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Council President and Councilor Gibson, we do get very good audits. I, um, so I'm, I'm, we're not concerned with the quality of the audits. However, 
I did want to let you know that this is the last year uh, that Moss Adams will have the audit contract with the city. We did extend the um, time frame with this current uh, audit with with uh, Moss Adams because of of COVID um, and some of the challenges that uh, we were you know, experiencing. But this will go out to RFP um, this year, and so we will have a different auditors next year. Okay, so why couldn't that RFP go out for this? fiscal year. Actually, you know, this, this past, you know, we were doing quite a bit, even in person up until just a couple of weeks ago, it seems like things have, have, have tightened down again. Why, why could we not have gotten an RFP out here? That's my first question. My second question is, how many years now are we out of compliance? Isn't it six years or four years? And then you have to get a new, uh, you're supposed to get a new um, uh, uh, accounting company. Yeah, Councillor Gibson, there is a requirement that you change auditors um, after, I believe it's six years. And um, for the last two years, we have made a request to the state auditor's office um, in order to have an exception to that. And that is how we've been able to retain Moss Adams for um, more than the original contract term. Um, and so we did make a request uh, based on, you know, uh, uh, many factors, including, um, you know, both uh, workloads for, you know, our staff, um, as well as just some of the um, budgeting challenges uh, that we've had with COVID. So um, again, we have received approval from the state auditors in order to extend the contract, but um, our full intention is that this will be, you know, the last year we will be going to an RFP in order to select a new auditor starting, uh, starting this next fiscal year. Okay, um, so I have to respectfully disagree with you in that we're getting good audits. I don't think that's possible when the auditors are, are so familiar with the city and the people working here, which is, the, which is why they have uh, uh, limits on how many years you can go with one firm. So no, I don't think that the city has been getting its money's worth. I think if anything, it's become more, and I'm in those meetings, actually. I, you know, uh, as a member of the AGO, um, committee, I, I, you know, tend to uh, go to those meetings, and um, it uh, it doesn't seem like a uh, a rigorous accounting or uh, audit of the uh, of the city, and I don't think uh, I don't think our taxpayers are um, are being served well. So that's really all I have. But thank you, thank you, Madam President. Councilor Gibson, are you, are you, that's your, the end of your questions? Yes, that's why I said thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to our next order of business, which is our journal. Councilor Gibson, this is your item. Thank you. Hold on. I'm very sorry. I was busy talking before and now I'm not. Would you like for me to move for move it for you, Councilor yes, Gibson? Yes, if you would, please. And yes, I'll I go. will. I move approval of the August 16th journal, and I need a second. I have a second from Councilor Senna. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Passan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Councilor Davis. Excuse, Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Passes seven zero. Thank you, Councilors. We will move on to item number seven, 
communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? And counselors, I have a couple, so I will go through those. And then if you have any, we will come back to you. Um, I will move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 424 on today's agenda for action. EC 424 is the mayor's recommendation of award to SWCA Incorporated for Rio Grande Bosque Wildlife Mitigation Services. And counselors, I just let you know that we need two thirds of the counselors to vote on this item in order for it to pass. And I just remind us that Councillor Harris is not with us and I'm not sure if Councillor Davis has joined us again or not. So um, with that, we will move to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 7-0. Thank you, Councilors. That item passes on a 7-0 vote. We will move on to the next item. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC-425 on today's agenda for action. EC-425 is the mayor's recommendation of award for language, interpretation, and translation services. And counselors also remind you that this particular item requires two thirds of the counselors present to pass. Councilor Senna, did, is that a second? Thank you, Councilor Senna. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 7 0. Thank you, counselors. We will move on to the next item. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 426 on today's agenda for action. EC 426 is the mayor's recommendation of award to Guide House Incorporated for ARPA fund management services. Again, I would remind the counselors that this item requires two thirds of our counselors present in order for it to pass. Um, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 7 0. Thank you, counselors. That item passes. We will move on to our next item. Item. Um, Item number four, which is, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing M11 on today's agenda for action. M11 is the city of Albuquerque reaffirming its strong commitment to end the drivers of crime, including criminal firearm use and recidivism. And this item also needs two thirds of the counselors in order for it to pass. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 7 0. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Ortega, who seconded that? I believe it was Councilor Bassan has her Bassan. hand raised. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. No. I, didn't, I didn't mention that. Okay, so we will move Madam on President. to Councilor Gibson. Uh, those are the only items that I have. Oh, Councilor Bassan, go ahead. Did you have a question? Thank you, Madam President. If I may ask just a quick question, I did I did vote to move these forward and I recognize that, but I do have a question kind of for the administration regarding the last minute items, if I may. Absolutely, Councilor Bassan. Um, just um, in general, thank you, Madam President. I'm trying to see who's in the conference room because their screen is blank. Ms. Nair, Mr. Padilla. Yes, this is this is Isaac. Hello, Ms. Uh, Council President. What can I? Thank you, Mr. Padilla. I just and again, I read through these this weekend. I saw them. I don't see any significant, you know, 
potential one way or the other as far as um, why we need to rush this through and why we don't need to rush this through. So I'm just wondering because of the lack of, I, you know, I don't like surprises and I know we're all mutual on that, but at the same time, why, why is there such a need for immediate action with some of these executive communications that keep coming in from the administration when they could just be put on the next agenda? Um, a lot of times that the, the Madam President, Council Bassan, a, a lot of times we hear from the directors that there's certain types of rules. So if they're money that's coming from the state or an application to a federal grant and different types of things like that, the, what what will end up happening is that the, the requirements for those grants mean that there's a really, really short turnaround time. And so it's necessary to go for immediate action on those. I do talk to the directors and when directors say I need this right away, we, we do ask what is the reason and if they can sh demonstrate that there is a legitimate reason or an important reason to do it, then I make the request for immediate action from the council president. Um, what um, usually happens if I see that there's not an important reason or if there's ways that we can wait, then what we'll do is request a holdover if we have a meeting before. So let's say we it's introduced at the second meeting of the month. There's not an FGO or a LUPS meeting, so it needs to go a little faster. That's when we request a holdover. So it depends on the piece of legislation. It depends on what's happening behind it before we make that determination or before I make that request to the council president. Um, other things that have come up is be, now that we're, we're, I mean, we're moving through the whole DocuSign process. We're doing a good job on it. We're moving it along a lot faster, but sometimes there's some hiccups in there. Some of those hiccups can be that they're, They'll submit a, a particular um, EC packet or a re resolution, and the resolution needs to go through the budget office. And what they'll the budget office will find an error inside the um, fiscal impact analysis. And when that happens, we need to correct that, and then we need to start rerouting it through the DocuSign process because it, that it has to be signed by each individual. So those are some of the reasons that that can happen. Um, we just want to be so when we're doing this and we're providing the information to counselors, it needs to be accurate. And if it means that we have to kick it back for whatever reason, then the, the whole process has to start again. So those those are some reasons why we end up running against some deadlines. Thank you for that explanation. It does clarify quite a bit for me, and I, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Madam President, as well. Thank you, Councilor Basson. Councilor Benton. Yeah, just to follow up, thanks, Councilor Basson, for asking this question because we have a lengthy agenda tonight and um and, and sometimes we really have lengthy agendas and then so uh to suddenly uh, be discussing th something that, that uh, we we really don't have much background on i'm very interested in the award for arpa fund management services uh the arpa fund is a huge federal potential federal influx into our city and uh, the idea that we're going to have to decide on who's going to advise us on that tonight is uh, is surprising uh, given that we've known that that this something's been in place some time and and uh, I have many questions about it but I guess for that reason I voted as, as Councilor Bassan did it, it, you know what well, I guess we have to go ahead and hear these things but but we really would like to see uh, timely uh, uh, submission of these the, these uh, bills to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Um, so we, with that, we will move on to Councilor Gibson. Councilor Gibson. Yes. With all of that, I lost my voice. I move approval of the letter of introduction. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. I'll second that. Ms. Ortega? Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Councilor Pena? Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. Motion passes. Six, Thank you, counselors. Uh, that motion passes on a seven seven zero. So we will move on to reports of committees. Number eight, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, August 23rd and reports out the following items. In the matter of 069, that it do pass and be acted upon at the meeting at which it is reported. I make a motion to accept the committee report. Second. I have a second from Councilor Senna. Second. 
Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Passes 7 0. Thank you, councillors. That motion passes on a 7 0 vote. We will move on to the next item. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, August 25th, 2021, and reports out the following item. In the matter of 071, that it be without recommendation as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee report. Thank you, Councillor Jones. You have a second from Councillor Bassan. Any questions? If not, Ms. Ortega? Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 7 0. Thank you, Councilors. That item passes on a 7 0 vote. We will move on to deferrals and withdrawals. Uh, Councilors, are any deferrals and withdrawal withdrawals? <laughs> Let me say that twice, right? Um, are appropriate at this time. Councillor Davis and Councillor Benton, 050. Thank you, Madam President. I move a deferral until September 20th of 050 uh, relating to budget changes and the uh, changes to the city's budget orders. Thank you, Councillor Davis and Councillor Benton have seconded that motion. Um, we will move a deferral on this item to September 20th. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 7 0. Thank you, councillors. Item A passes on a 7 0 vote. We will move on to item G. Uh, this is R130 and Establishing a City Healthy Communities Public Health and Sustainability Policy Com Committee. I move deferral until December the 6th. I have a second from Councillor Senna. Thank you for that second, Councillor Senna. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yeah. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Seven zero on the deferral. Thank you, councilors. Um, with that, we will move on to our consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Um, and I just wanna read into the record before we get into that. Uh, for individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on a board or commission or who may be watching from home, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, councilors, I would move that we pull item O off the consent agenda. It is OC 2136, the 2020 Civilian Police Oversight Agency semi-annual report. And we will not vote on that particular item. Uh, Councilor Gibson. I move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, Councilor. You have a second from Councilor Benton. Actually, Madam Chair, Councilor I Benton, to, were you wanting to speak or to second? I did. I was hoping to uh, remove another item from the consent agenda. Go ahead, agenda. Councilor Benton. Yeah, and that would be EC 426, the recommendation of award to Guidehouse Incorporated for ARPA fund management services. Do you have a second? Let me see if there's a second. No vote needed, Madam President. Oh, you don't need a vote on this, I'm sorry, but you do have a second from Councillor Davis, I believe, um, even though, or was that a question, Councillor Davis? No, I was just gonna say he didn't need it, but I would do it if he did. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, with that, uh, Councillor Gibson, I think you already made a motion and I do need a second for um, moving the consent agenda forward. Councillor Davis, thank you for that second. Um, Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 7 0. 
thank you, counselors. Uh, that item passes on a 7-0 vote. We will move on to items that were pulled off the consent agenda. Um, we will start with item O. C21-36, 2020 Civilian Police Oversight Agency semi-annual report. Um, I, there was a move for receipt to be noted. And I think Mr. Harness is going to give us a presentation on the report. So um, with that motion, do I have a second? Councilor Senna, thank you for that second. And with that, we will turn to Mr. Harness. Thank you, Mr. Harness, for joining us this evening. Good evening, Council President Borrego and Honorable City Council. How's everyone this evening? Um, moving into the evening, I guess. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present the second half of 2020 uh, semi-annual report in accordance with the uh, oversight ordinance. Uh, just to go through some of the highlights that are in the report, uh, the CPOA recorded 307 complaints during that period of time while uh, opening 172 complaints, uh, assigning them for investigation through this particular period of time. Um, this is an increase from 157 complaints received during the same period. Uh, reporting period of 2019. Um, during this time, the agency only closed 22 uh, complaints during the reporting period. And I will circle back to uh, go through and explain uh, some of what was going on with the agency at that point in time. Uh, during this time, we, there were also 63 level, uh, level three uses of force, including three officer involved shootings. And the board reviewed 10 level three uh, uses of force, which are the most serious levels of use of force. Um, circling back to the number, which I think uh, was a concern for uh, Councillor Senna at the Public Safety Committee. Uh, during the same period of time for 2019, we closed out 104 cases. And I think uh, the anomaly that we've experienced during this period of time um, is a few factors. Certainly COVID was a part of that, the adjustment uh, for COVID and for the investigative staff as they were working uh, from home during that period of time. Uh, we also had a staffing shortage where we had to fill our lead investigator position we had to terminate a probationary investigator. And then we hired at the end of this period, uh, a new investigator and uh, who is, has successfully completed probation. And I think it's important to make a distinction between the uh, closing of an investigation and the completion of the investigation for our data purposes. The investigation is completed when uh, it is sent to APD staff for review. However, after that, uh, with the officer's procedural due process, uh, we may not receive that file back for a number of months because there may be a predisciplinary hearing there may be an appeal to the personnel board, um, and there may be uh, certain non-concurrences. Uh, now, during this time, because we are still operating with actual paper folder investigations, uh, there were quite a few cases that were not ready to come back to our agency to close out. In addition, uh, this was the time when the, the city was experiencing a large amount of First Amendment expression demonstrations throughout the city. And we had uh, two investigators that were spending uh, an inordinate amount of time looking into uh, complaints generated from uh, those particular demonstrations, not only first party complainants, but 
people complaining based upon a viral video, uh, third party, anonymous. Uh, so one of the investigators spent over 500 hours reviewing uh, video of those incidents. And another investigator spent 300 hours of video review uh, for just those incidents that took place during that time frame. I have looked at our numbers for the first half of 2021, which our counting period will close on the 15th of September. We, we give a 120 day window from the end of the reporting period for us to get a chance to get as many files back and closed out in the IA Pro software so that we can get as accurate a count as possible for that six month period of time. That period will close on the 15th and we have uh, closed out 67 uh, investigations uh, during the first part of 2021. So with that, I would uh, stand for questions. Well, I'm going to entertain questions. Councillor Senna, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you, Mr. Harness. I also appreciate your staff uh, for bearing with me at Public Safety uh, when I really asked them these questions. Um, I did miss you uh, being there and hope that at least we can get some of these answers uh, today. So, you know, my main concern, of course, is the, the 22 um, complaints that were closed. I know you went into detail as far as staffing levels, um, but you know, prior to July, we were also still in the pandemic and we were able to close out um, a significant number of cases, more than of course 22. Um, and there was some discrepancy in terms of, you know, 37, 307 complaints recorded um, complaints received were only 172, and my main issue was the 135 complaints not investigated, um, and for all the reasons listed in the report, um, I made the suggestion that for future reports that it be broken down a little bit better to understand exactly why, um, you know, it, it varies, um, whether it's duplicate complaints, or of course, if it went into mediation, um, you know, an informal mediation, then of course we would want to know and hear about that since that's a newer process. Um, my other questions that I gave to staff too is just, you know, what, what else are we doing to receive some of the information, collect some of the data in terms of helping those file complaints, um, but also with the discrepancy of numbers we're hearing of a rollover of cases because they're not being investigated in the time periods. So some of the cases, I believe it was 14 cases that um, in my math and in asking staff too, that just are kind of floating and whether that was being rolled over from the same time period or of the 172 that were investigated, was that rolled over from another previous um, so those are kind of some of the, my main concerns that I relate to staff. I know most of my other questions were addressed um, at that time, especially in terms of collecting more information and, and language accessibility for complaints. Um, but if you can answer, I know I gave you a laundry list, but if you can answer some of those. Uh, certainly, Madam President Borrego, Councillor Senna. Uh, regarding the discrepancy between the intake and the actual number of, of uh, investigations that commence, uh, we get a wide variety of complaints um, from vehicle W1112 didn't use their blinker uh, to uh, many, many duplicative complaints, especially during this time frame for uh, the viral videos and things that were going around for the demonstrations. Um, and with those, uh, with those we, would sim we would simply be doing them under one investigation as far as anything that is duplicative. Uh, regarding the minor things like um, 
changing lanes without blinkers or um, those other kinds of minor driving complaints that come into us. We, we do refer those to uh, the area command once we identify uh, the drive, the potential driver through the uh, work the the work pool resource, but we will not invest. We will not initiate an investigation for something like that. Um, as far as the number, the fourteen number, um, those cases certainly could still be over at the APD building because of uh, uh, the procedural due process that the officers are entitled to. Uh, or simply uh, APD getting caught up with, with their caseloads as well because APD internal affairs handles not only our files, but they handle internal affairs files as well. And for our reporting purposes, we don't report on a case until we get it all the way through the final disposition and actually have that paper copy file in our hands to update the software for our findings in comparison to the department's findings, and we close it out there. So the numbers that we report for the semi-annual report are not until that investigative file has circled all the way through that process. And um, that can sometimes take uh, eight to 10 months. So when you have a segmented reporting period that doesn't align with when an investigation may commence or when a file is received, uh, that would explain why the numbers are really never going to be an equal match. Thank you for that, Mr. Harness. And you know, I, my main concern, of course, is the discrepancy of numbers. Um, we, of course, want due process for our officers and want to make sure that as those cases are being heard, that that's considered. And of course, we are bound by a timeline as well. And I noticed that a lot of these complaints, you know, an extension is required. And of the 22 cases, it, it took some time, of course, to investigate, um, which of course we want to give enough time for, for that. But also at the same time, we also either have the person that filed the complaint is still waiting. And then we also have the officer that of course is waiting for their due process as well. Um, so, you know, this report, um, um, I will say, as it brought, was brought to me to public safety, rose a lot of red flags just because of the difference of the report compared to the others. Um, so I hope that moving forward, we can at least understand that number a little bit better. Um, I know that council has also approved of uh, more investigators, but I think that closing out 22 in this time period is, is worrisome for me. Um, and knowing of potential cases will build up and roll over continually. And that number has to be flexible, I understand that. But also, you know, we are supposed to be under a timeline um, and to have those processed and reviewed in a better timely manner, you know, however we can support if it is, you know, additional investigators, which we've already done, but giving that information also to those that are filing the complaint and also to our officers who are still waiting, you know, that's the main concern that I may have. Certainly, uh, Council President Borrego um, and Councilor Senna, I, um, I, I hear what you're saying. And this, this period of time really is an anomaly when you, when you compare it to all of the other uh, reports that have been filed with, uh, with Council. And, uh, you know, moving forward, we have gone through uh, an interview process. We've identified candidates for hire so that we can be fully staffed, I do believe, by uh, October. Uh, we've identified candidates, and now that we're in the process of doing their background investigations. So we should be fully staffed as, as appropriated. Um, I'm more than happy to discuss the, the timeline. Uh, I believe it, it is an artificial impediment to fact finding that is generated from the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, but I have also advocated for the agency to be allowed to investigate uh, only level five offenses and above as opposed to 
uh, level seven and level six minor offenses uh, in line with what internal affairs is allowed to do to have those minor things go to the command for investigation and handling. Uh, and uh, those two strategies in themselves would uh, certainly get us much closer to the 120 days. And I would also uh, direct your attention to IMR 13, uh, where the monitor stresses that in the five years since I've been here, we have never had an investigation where discipline could not be imposed because we did not meet the timeline. Thank you, Mr. Harness. I appreciate you. And of course, I appreciate your staff um, for, for bearing with me and my grilling of them during committee. Um, and I know that other counselors do have questions. I would love to follow up with you on some of the other matters um, of this report, um, minor nuances, especially of data, the uh, collection and what else is being made um, to really stress mediation as well. So thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Councilor Senna. Does that conclude your questions? Councilor Benton? Thank you, Madam President. Um, Mr. Harness, a uh, couple of questions. One, you mentioned the, the community, uh, the uh, collective bargaining agreement, excuse me. Um, that is something that is still uh, kind of in limbo. It's basically just sitting there because uh, we have not negotiated the collective bargaining agreement with the uh, police union. Have you been consulted? Have, have you or the, the uh, uh, organization been consulted in any way with regard to that collective bargaining agreement by the administration? Council President Brego, uh Councilor Benton, yes, uh, I have been asked for feedback uh, regarding possible changes to the uh, court approved settlement agreement, which just incorporated the investigation timeline from the CBA. Um, we have proffered a um, 180 day investigation timeline. And we've also proffered that uh, some ability to extend beyond that, giving uh, extenuating circumstances. Uh, case in point, uh, we have a case where we had to subpoena probation and parole for information and they have fought us tooth and nail. So we're way beyond uh, the 90 days that's available in this case. And it's not for the fault of us. It's because we've had to subpoena probation and parole, work with their attorneys uh, in order to gain an interview. Uh, and there's no flexibility at all for that type of a situation where there are extraneous uh, circumstances that move an investigation beyond the 90 days outside of our control. Uh, so yes, we have offered uh, uh, our input as to the, the nation's best practices is, a, is that standard 180 days. Uh, and we have shared that information with the administration. All right, well, thank you, thank you, Ms. Harness. And, and Madam President, if I just follow up. Um, this is the reason why, uh, just for the counselors and general public, that we have a Committee on Guidelines for Negotiations. Um, and unfortunately, uh, negotiations with the police union were commenced without uh, convening that Committee on Guidelines. And so we're, we're sort of behind the curve on that situation, but, uh, but, but that's my reason for that question. One other uh, question, Mr. Harness, um, and, and just tell me if this is outside the, whatever, the uh, area of, of influence of the, of the uh, CPOA. And you mentioned the, the riots, well, you excuse me, you mentioned the demonstrations that occurred and there were peaceful demonstrations that occurred with regard to the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement and, and question. Uh, but there was also a follow on riot downtown that occurred following one of those uh, demonstrations in which uh, 
many, you know, business properties were ruined. One, one uh, successful company went out of business as a result of that riot. There were others that remained boarded up for months on end and some still boarded up uh, as a result of that. And not one arrest was made. Is this kind of thing that, that uh, uh, under which the APOA has some um, investigatory role uh, of why, you know, things that, that are, they may not have to do with uh, some uh, inappropriate use of force or something like that, but they do have to do with how the police department operates. Is this something that, that, that would fall within the role of the CPOA? Councillor Benton, you're, just for correction, um, you were referring to the APOA, but you're referring to the CPOA, correct? Uh, well, the previous Did question you refer had to, to do the with, APOA. The previous question had to do with the APOA, which is the no, but in this question, you refer no. to the APOA. Okay. This has to do with the CPOA. Thank you for what clarifying. What their role that. is with regard to something like the riot that occurred downtown in which not one single person was ever charged. Um, Council President Borrego, Councilor yeah. Benson, I appreciate uh, Mr. Harness, that. before yeah. you answer that, the mayor's office is trying to chime in also. So could you, al would you allow them? Um, I'd rather hear from Mr. Harness first okay. and then the we can hear administration. From, Thank from you. Him first. Um, yes, again, Councillor President Borrego, Councillor Benton, I appreciate the question. And I think that the, the larger debate is uh, a debate that I would like our agency to entertain uh, as far as uh, work w workload. What you're describing is policing strategies and performance by the department. And I'm not sure that we are best served as a CPOA in investigating performance of the department uh, and policing decisions. I believe we're m better served investigating uh, misconduct. And that is our charge under the CASA and under the ordinance moving into these grayer areas and uh, we're examining now because of the uh, the the published the newly published discipline system from uh, the department 3-46 which was published on the 27th of July they have carved out definitions of misconduct for progressive discipline and they've also carved out uh, performance measures for progressive discipline. And it would be my hope that the CPOA could focus on the misconduct portions of those policies and leave the performance aspects of the department to the department and the command staff. Thank you. I, I guess we could hear from the administration at this point. So who is going to address us from the mayor's conference room? Uh, Council President Borrego, this is Sarita Nair, the Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, so I just wanted to correct a misstatement uh, regarding negotiations. We are in active negotiations with the police union. Uh, there was a labor management board decision that um, addressed the issue of timelines that we needed certainty on before we could continue those negotiations. We received that written decision about a week ago and have been actively engaged in those negotiations ever since. Of course, within the limits of the, the rules governing negotiations, we're happy to talk to the committee on which I sit, but I, I don't think it's my job to convene it uh, at any time. So if you want to call one of those meetings, we'd be happy to talk about it. Um, also, um, Commander Barker is checking into the uh, statement regarding arrests related to uh, the uh, late night um, riots that happened downtown last year, and we'll be happy to provide any updates that are required. Thank you. Councilor Benton. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam uh, President. Uh, yeah, it, it, 
it was not a misstatement. What I said was negotiations commenced with the CPOA, with, with, with the APOA. Okay, but our acronyms are uh, off by one, a uh, couple letters. Uh, the APOA uh, were commenced prior to the uh, convening of the Committee on Guidelines for Negotiation. That was my only point. But thank thank you. you, Councilor Benton, for that clarification. Um, Mr. Harness, I had a couple of questions. Um, with regard to um, your reporting, um, and I, going back to your uh, earlier statements about, um, you know, it doesn't, your report does not always align with um, sort of the activity that's occurring for the investigation, and it doesn't always come to you in a timely fashion, and I understand that from having worked with the city. Um, so in your reporting, I didn't see any um, sort of footnoting or clarification regarding sort of that gray area. So I, I'm wondering, and I'm just suggesting that in the future that maybe that a footnote to that effect might help um, because then the report looks very black and white. I mean, literally it's, you know, we did this and we met this obligation or we didn't meet the obligation, but the things that sort of fall through the cracks um, and I'm just suggesting that maybe, the, you know, some, some clarification regarding that might be helpful um, to the public when we're reading and to the council when we're reading your report, that might be a little, um, and, I, and I understand that these are sensitive issues that you can't just discuss, you know, openly, I understand that, um, but if there was a way to sort of flag those things or those those cases that um, you know there would be a little more clarification, and I and I hope that you that um, that's really just uh, you know some advice I guess that would maybe help us along as we're looking at these and as as the newspapers reporting them to the public as well. Um, but I, you know, I thank you for your service and for the service of the CPOA because I know that they're all volunteers and this is very, very sensitive work and very fragile work. So um, I, I just wanted to offer that as a, as a thought in my thought process. Um, Madam President uh, Borrego, certainly I will discuss that, that with our data analyst in, in the production of reports moving forward. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Mr. Harness, counselors? If not, I would like to move. Um, and I think, did I already move this? I already moved this and we already got a second. So we are, if there are no other questions from the council, we are going to move to a vote. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Councilor Pena? Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 7 0 on the receipt be noted motion. Thank you, Ms. Ortega. So, with that, we were going to move back to EC 426. Councilor Benton, you uh, removed this from the agenda. So, um, would you like to um, carry this forward? Yes, thank you, Madam President. For the purpose of discussion, I'll move approval of the EC uh, 426. Thank you. There's a motion and there's a second from Councillor Davis. And and Madam President, uh, you know, I, I know we've got a long meeting ahead, but but this did come up again, uh, you know, late, as a uh, immediate action. Um, this seems to be a <laughs> another contract for a company that already has a $750,000 contract, uh, both of which have to do with uh, advising us, as, as I understand it, I'm asking the administration, but advising the city as to how we spend our money. But that's my question. Uh, I, you know, uh, I know we've got a lot of ARPA money potentially coming in. We've had 
council action on some of that money and so forth, but uh, what is this all about and why do we need this level of help? Thank you, Councillor Benton. We will go to the budget conference room. Yeah, Council President and uh, Councillor Benton. So this, this contract um, will provide consulting services to the city, not on how to use the ARPA funds, but how to, um, to make sure that we're in compliance with the evolving rules and guidance that it's coming out from the US Treasury around the use of the ARPA funds. It's very similar to a contract that we had uh, that helped us with the uh, management uh, and compliance with the CARES Out Act money, as well as with FEMA. Uh, we went out to RFP um, uh, June 4th in order to uh, look for competitive proposals for these services. Uh, we received seven proposals um, that in your packet, you can see the, the seven different companies that provided these services. We were looking for you know, a company that has um, the expertise both in federal grants um, as well as uh, emergency uh, and disaster recovery, um, as well as had a, a portfolio of both cities and states that they are uh, have experience with providing similar services. Um, so this will provide us with the support we need for the American Rescue Plan um, funds, similar to what we had for the CARES Act funds and FEMA. Thank you, that's helpful. Madam President, if I could just follow up. Um, and, and I don't know, it's just kind of a staggering figure between this and then the other uh, contracts that this firm has of over three quarters of a million dollars. Um, is this in line with what other cities have, have paid or we, have we looked into that at all? Uh, Council President and uh, Councilor Benton, uh, I don't have comparative data for you. I certainly could ask um, the company for comparative data about what other cities our size are paying for these kind of um, you know, consultative services. I do know from um, attending weekly GFOA uh, meetings with other cities that um, are using ARPA uh, funds um, that quite a few of them are using um, these types of services to help them. Um, I don't know the amounts, but if you'd like, I, I could certainly ask for some comparative information. Thank you. And, and um, you know, I, I just, I think that would be wise. Um, um, and I don't discount the need to, to, to cross all the T's and dot the I's correctly uh, and not risk our receipt of these funds. I'm just saying that, that if we could do that, would it be a problem if we deferred this to our next meeting for you to just get that information? Council President and Councilor Benton, um, so what we're trying to do is make sure we have continuity of services. Our current contract will expire at the end of this uh, calendar month. So what we were trying to do is get the RFP um, award uh, approved by council uh, tonight so that we would then have time to get the contract negotiated and have services in place by October the 1st. If we deferred this, that would get, put us in a little bit of a crunch. Um, we may have to then, if we couldn't get the contract negotiated and services starting by uh, October 1st, there'd be a gap. Um, how critical that gap is, I can't really tell you. There is evolving guidance that's uh, guidance that's coming out. Um, there still is an interim final rule and we're waiting for the final rule on ARPA to come out. Um, I don't think it would be catastrophic, but just put us in a, a place where we may have a gap in, in services during a time when we're actively you know, implementing the first set of uh, projects per the resolution that council passed in May. I understand, thank you. Madam President, I'm gonna move a deferral regardless of this uh, possible short gap. Councilor uh, Davis. Our next, till our next uh, council meeting. Councilor Davis, is that a second or are you waiting to speak? 
Uh, both, Madam President, I would offer a second. I would just like to add a, a brief question uh, before we move to a vote. Go ahead if you have a question, uh, comment. Thank you, and uh, and thank you, Renee, for for following up on that. Um, could, and this might, if we're going to defer this, it might be better for our next meeting. But um, could you help me understand a little bit? I, you know, the city manages so many um, federal grants. We're good at that. We have grant staff who do nothing but this sometimes. Um, I'm curious what is different about the services they're providing that our staff don't normally do um, in this regard. And I wonder if you can give us an example of some of the work they've done under the old, um, uh, the, the previous federal dollars um, and how that was beneficial to the city that, that couldn't be, have been done by um, the really excellent staff um, in the, the budget office and the finance team. Council President and Councilor Davis, uh, a little bit of why this is a, a bit different than the normal cadence of grants that both our departments and our um, grant section within our county division handle. So, you know, traditionally um, a grant comes through and it hits one department. Um, the departments, uh, oftentimes the very large grants are ones that we see on an annual basis. So there's some uh, experience with the guidance around those grants, as well as programmatic experience in the departments and our grants team about this. What's different about the COVID stimulus money, both CARES Act, um, as well as FEMA, which we don't see too often, as well as um, American Rescue Plan, is that it's a very large amount of money. Um, it's a whole portfolio of projects and programs that are created um, for this, that uh, particular situation in this, these cases to respond and recover from the pandemic. Um, so programs and um, projects are being uh, designed and uh, executed um, and, and without uh, the experience that we've had, it goes across departments. So we probably have at least 10 departments that have different um, projects with, with CARES Act and ARPA. So it's a level of uh, complexity uh, as well as a need for us to make sure that uh, we are working with someone who is you know, uh, actively following um, all the, the, the guidance as it comes out. So it's, it's, it is very different in terms of the, the scope and scale of work that's done. Um, some of the work that I think was has been very beneficial to us is um, I can count probably in my email at least oh uh, I'd say I'd say in the in the order of 200 emails or 300 emails where where we were uh, asking the consultant um, we are reading the guidance that this is an eligible use could do you could you please take it back to your team um, and let us know if you uh, what your opinion is. So we are asking for those, that, those, um, that guidance and opinion as we move forward. And that's very helpful to us for them to say, yes, we think that this is clearly an eligible use or that you might need to ask additional questions to the US Treasury or what have you. Um, one of the activities, if you, if you uh, don't mind, that, um, that the consultant did for us on CARES Act, which was really helpful, is they conduct, conducted what we called a payment review. So they took a sample of um, the purchases and expenses we made under the CARES Act. And um, for example, under payroll or some other uh, maybe use of uh, PPE. No. And they actually looked at all our documentation that we had about mm -hmm. the purchase and justification mm -hmm. and accounting. And they looked at uh, each uh, a sample of those transactions and then gave us feedback on um, whether or not we th they thought that our documentation was um, up, up to, to snuff. Uh, we're really preparing for an eventual in the future audit um, by the U.S. Treasury's Inspector General's office. And so um, the consultant is helping us make sure that we have the documentations and internal controls in place to make sure that uh, we don't really lose a penny. There's no, um, you know, eventual, you know, uh, refund of the, of the dollars that we've used. And 
Thank you, Madam, Madam President. I'll leave it with this, but I, I agree with we ought to just take a deferral here. I, given that the federal rules aren't final and I don't think we'll be submitting paperwork, I, I see other counselors want to ask questions, but I, it would be, I think it'd be helpful for us to understand a little more how this process works and what value they're bringing. Um, and it, it, I totally understand um, the why this uh, the department feels like this is necessary, but um, again, if if they're um, if the consultant is is sort of affirming or giving their professional advice to this, I'd be curious, and we could talk about it another time. If the contract has some guarantee, so as if they were to give us bad advice or if they were to lead us down some path and that dollars were determined ineligible, um, how do we account for that? How who, who takes responsibility and reimbursement to the city for that expenditure that's already happened since this is not pre-approval. I think I'm just curious more about how that works since a lot of these rules aren't written yet. Um, I understand why there might be a, an advice, but it does seem like an awful lot of money. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if we don't, we have a team of lobbyists who get paid a lot of money in DC to do some of this. And so I just want to be sure that we understand we're using the right services for the right folks. So uh, I would support a deferral, Madam President, just so we have a chance to learn a little more. And I don't feel like, and I think we could uh, could be moving forward, the department could move forward in, in designing the contract in parallel, um, in good faith with the vendor that's already on contract. So thank you, Madam President. Councillor Davis, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Gibson because it looks like she has some questions as well. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, actually, I do. I may have missed something. If I did, I apologize. But I must ask, why, uh, why did this not come to us sooner? Uh, if this was, uh, and, and and I, you know, I'm not disputing the fact that probably having a uh, someone like this to, you know, keep us on the straight and narrow and make sure we're not, we're not um, at, at risk when it comes to uh, these large sums. Um, but uh, why didn't we get this like last month or, you know, two or three meetings ago? Council President uh, and uh, Councilor Gibson, so uh, we felt that we started this process um, early enough. The RFP process is lengthy, um, given that you have to craft the RFP, uh, then of course post it, get your responses. In this case, we did receive seven responses, which is fantastic. That takes some time for the evaluation committee to of course review and evaluate. Then we have a protest period um, and that we have to go through and then we get it to you, unfortunately. July, uh, because of that recess, um, wasn't a, a, a time for us for us to uh, you know get this to you earlier. Um, so we were trying to time this again towards the end of our current contract, and we're pretty close to, to doing that. But it you know it, our P process takes some time to do to to get done. We did get the uh, um, you know, the validation or that we were going to get the money in May. Um, and we started as soon as we could after that. Okay. Councilor Gibson and Council President, um, this is Isaac. I'd like to also state that, you know, the, these during the pandemic and what we started with um, DocuSign, these are new processes that we're working through. So like I said earlier, is sometimes you run into some hiccups with these processes as we tried to, I mean, when we we used to do all this just by paper. Now we're running it through DocuSign. There's different ways that are go there. So that does create some little bit of time lags. It has improved efficiencies in some ways, but in other ways it actually reduces efficiencies because it is a new process and not everybody's an expert in it. And some departments are gotten very good at it because they send a lot more stuff and other ones don't send as much. And so it, we have to kind of coach them through along as well. But but the, it, so it just depends. Part of it is the RFP process and part of that is the DocuSign process. It's all the different processes that are in the city so that we can get contracts signed. Okay, I got you. I, I understand. So that's why we have phones. You pick up the phone and bug the next person in line. This, this is, as they say, not rocket science. It's just merely a new uh, application, I guess we'd call it. So, you know, uh, Madam President, I, I, would, I would just like to voice my preference for this go, to go through FGO. This is a, a, a very important uh, contract. I would feel uh, much better to have uh, a, a, another 
committee's uh, eyes on it before it comes to council. Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, Madam President and Councilor Gibson, there is an FGO at the end of the month. Um, so, but if we were to do that, it would go to FGO. And if we follow the regular council process rules, it'll report out at the following meeting. And then final action wouldn't actually be until the, it would be the second meeting in October. So that would, that, that's, I'm just saying that, that the current process and the current council timeline, and because FGO is at the end of the month, that would cause, I think, um, put us in kind of a tough situation. Madam President. Councilor so Gibson. It, it could actually uh, go out of uh, FGO possibly with uh, immediate action. And then we would be hearing it the first meeting of October. So, so um, I have a question regarding what Councilor Gibson is asking. Um, so our, our FGO meeting next week is canceled. Um, so it would have to be the second FGO of the month. Um, does that give us time to initiate this contract in early October as discussed? I'm Madam, looking at uh, the mayor's Madam, conference room. Madam President, um, uh, members of the council, um, what uh, uh, sending it to FGO and then if we don't get final action out of FGO, like I said, it takes a unanimous vote. Then you're looking at not getting the contract, I mean, the, the uh, EC approved until the second meeting in October. So that's, that's just want to bring that to the attention of the council as they make this decision. So, um, okay, I want to ask a follow up question before I go to the other counselors that have their hands raised. And there's a number of counselors that have their hands raised. So, it, are we violating? any deadlines if we send it to the set second, I guess, if, if we initiate this in mid-October. Council President, um, so uh, as, I, as I explained, so what we're trying to do is um, either avoid or minimize the gap in time between the current contract and the new contract. And so if uh, we, this went to the FGO and then back to council, we probably wouldn't have this in uh, the new contract and services starting until mid to late October, which gives us a two or three week gap. Um, and we prefer not to have that gap uh, because we would like to continue, especially since we are uh, right in the middle of um, using the, the funds that were appropriated on um, 30 plus projects that you know we could uh, possibly be in a place where we, we make, make a decision without the consultation um, of, our, of our contractor. So um, you know that, that's really the, the impact of, of delaying this further. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. I'm gonna to go to Councilor Jones and then to Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think one of the things I'm listening to here is we, we can't possibly do this because we'll act too fast and we won't be able to do it and vote on it in time. And yet we just voted on three very important things that were brought to us for immediate action and it, man, it happened. I don't believe if we listen, uh, hear this at FGO at the second meeting in September, uh, ask for immediate action at that time. We can also get it on the October, the first meeting in October, and we will still get there in the time frame that you want. And furthermore, we can ask for immediate action on both of those. So I think I understand your concern, ma'am, and I understand that it's always easier and certainly um, less uh, uh, stressful to do something in a longer matter, but we've just proven by voting for some issues, rather important issues that were brought forth to the council uh, without going to committee and for immediate action. So I will also support hearing this at FGO at the second meeting in September and moving it then if we so approve for immediate action at the first meeting in October. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Benton? Yes, I, I, you know, I stand by my motion to defer this to less than two weeks from now. 
uh, I think it's been well explained why we need these services. My initial question had to do with whether we are getting a competitive deal with what other cities are getting for similar services. Um, and I don't know, under, under normal circumstances, I would not object for this going to FGO as, as was suggested. But I think the motion on the floor is for that deferral, and I stand by that. Yeah, we Thank have you. a motion and a second right now for deferral. Um, Councillor Basson, bef before we act on that motion, I didn't see Councillor Basson's hand until just now. So, Councillor Basson, I know you're the chair of FGO. We could have a special meeting. Um, I know that's a possibility. Oh. Thank you, Madam President. I was really wanting to just ask the question. Um, that just to clarify, this consultant is to confirm that we are making good choices with our spending that are in compliance with the federal government, correct? Is that the like Councilor short version? Uh, and Councilor Bassan, yes, I would agree with that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I no no special meeting. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. I thought I'd ask the question. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second to defer this. So we will go to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Councilor Gibson. No. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. No. That motion passes on a 5-3 vote. Thank you, Councilors. This has been deferred and it passes on a 5-3 vote. So, Councilors, we are going to move on on our agenda to, give me one second, announcements. And I just, before we go on to announcements, we are going to take a break just so the public understands after item number 13, which is approvals prior to final actions. We will take about a 20 minute break and then we'll come back for final actions. So Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, September 13th is canceled. The next meeting is scheduled for Monday, September 27th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Councilor Basson, Councilor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Safety Committee meeting on Tuesday, September 14th is canceled. Thank you, Councilor Senna, Councilor Jones. And Madam President, my screen just went blank. May I ask someone to read that for me? I can read it for you, Councilor Jones. Thank you. There will be a Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting on Wednesday, September 15th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you. So Thank you. With that, we will move on, counselors, to our public hearings. AC 21-9, Knob Hill Neighborhood Association appeals the zoning hearing examiner's decision. Mr. Melendres to explain. Thank you, Madam President, counselors. This matter was before you at your last meeting for you to consider whether or not to adopt the findings and recommendation of the land use hearing officer. The council declined at that time to adopt those findings and recommendations in favor of holding a full hearing at this meeting. Um, just to give you an overview, and then you'll have an opportunity to hear from the parties. The issue in this appeal is whether a residential wall height variance should be approved. Um, the justification that was presented to the ZHE was that it would help mitigate impacts from non-residential activities occurring on the street adjacent to the subject property. Uh, the record suggests that there are loading and other street type activities that present unique uh, impacts on this particular property and that uh, allowing an additional three feet in height in the fence along Silver and uh, Richmond would help mitigate some of those impacts on this property. However, the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association appealed the decision of the zoning hearing examiner um, on several grounds, um, including that uh, does not believe that the subject property is in fact uniquely burdened as compared to other similarly situated properties in the area. The 
Land use hearing officer did hear this matter and did recommend that the zoning hearing examiner be affirmed, finding that there was evidence and, and rationale that supported that, that outcome. You are going to hear from the parties tonight to hold a full hearing on this um, to determine whether or not the uh, zoning hearing examiner should, in fact, be affirmed. Um, you're going to be looking at that decision to determine not necessarily whether or not sitting in the zoning hearing examiner's shoes, you would have come to the same conclusion, but only whether or not the zoning hearing examiner acted fraudulently, arbitrarily, or capriciously, or his decision was not supported by substantial evidence, or he applied in applying some policy or requirement of the integrated development ordinance. You'll hear arguments from the parties tonight, including the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association first, who is the appellant in this matter. Um, followed by a presentation by Gary Hoffman, who was the property owner requesting the variance. Uh, there is time reserved to hear from the planning department that usually only occurs in the more complex appeals, not common for zoning hearing examiner appeal. But if you do have questions, I understand they will have folks on standby. Um, there will also be an opportunity for rebuttal by the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association, uh, to basically to close out the appeal. And after that time, you can deliberate and discuss. I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have and guide you through the record. You're not permitted this time to take new evidence. There have been several hearings on this before now, and all the evidence should be complete. So you'll be making your decision based only on the arguments and the evidence that is already in the appeal record before you. Thank you, Mr. Melendres. Are there questions of counselors for Mr. Melendres? I do not see any questions. So counselors with that, I'm going to read, and this is for all the presenters. All presenters other than attorneys must be sworn in. The parties are allowed to cross-examine one another. All of those who will testify, please stand and or please raise your right hand. And I, do, I see one individual. Is there more than that? Miss Miss Walker, are you in the room? Well, if she joins us, then we will swear her in as well. Sir, do you swear to tell the truth? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. There she is. There's Miss Walker. Miss Walker, do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. So, just a couple of ground rules here. Um, eight minutes for presentations from appellant, that is the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association, 10 minutes for presentation from appellee Gary Hoffman, and we do not have comments from the city planning staff this evening, but we have, counselors are allowed to ask questions, two minutes for rebuttal by the appellant, if any, and with that, we will move to our um, deliberation. We will be timing you as you're speaking. So when Mr. Moya cuts you off, then you will know that your time is up. I'm sorry, Madam Mr. President, Ed, would you Mr. like me Esther? to begin? Yes. Be before you begin my time, Madam President, uh, Mr. Melendres, talked about new evidence. Is it okay if I share my screen and show a, a piece of the IDO interactive map? Mr. Melendres? Madam President, Counselor, so stuff that's in the public realm, like the IDO and the map <clears throat> being incorporated as part of that IDO um, is not new evidence in the sense of if somebody was gonna introduce traffic counts, for example, that, that okay. needs to be discussed. So that is within the realm of what you can discuss today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Melendres, and, and I have a follow-on. I have a, an image of uh, Colonel D.K.B. Sellers who platted uh, University Heights in 1916. Is that, that's public record, I guess. Would, may I project that at some point? It's, it's likely pretty unrelevant, uh, but to the extent <laughs> it is rhetorical for your presentation, I don't see an issue. Good. Thank you, sir. Then uh, in that case, uh, Madam President, uh, may I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, you may, sir, and we will start your time as soon as your screen comes up. Okay. Is that working, Madam President? Yes. 
Okay, I'm ready for you to begin. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, counselors. Uh, I'm Gary Eister. I'm president of the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association. The ZHE heard this request twice, applying the five-prong test in the IDO for review and decision of a variance. At the first hearing, he found the applicant did not establish special circumstances applicable to the subject. He denied the variance. Applicant appealed after Lujo remand at the second hearing, the ZHE found the application met the five prongs and granted the variance. We have appealed this decision for six reasons, but we will focus on, on, on only two of those today. The first is IDO prong one, quote, there are special circumstances that are not self-imposed that do not generally apply to other property in the same zone district and vicinity including but not limited to size, shape, topography, location, and surroundings. Here, I'm projecting the IDO interactive map of the area. And uh, along the top, I can you maybe use my arrow, you see Central Avenue. And over here, you see Girard Boulevard. And over here, you see Carlisle. So uh, this is the portion of Central that uh, has uh, lots of businesses. Uh, here's Manny's, here's B2B Burger, um, Knob Hill Bar and Grill, Kelly's, um, Flying Star, Knob Hill Shopping Center. And here is Silver Avenue. And here is the subject at the corner of Richmond and Silver. There are 14 corner lots on the south side of Silver between Gerard and Carlisle. And this is what you see here. 12 are developed. They were built in the 20s to the 30s, generally as houses. Before the IDO, they were zoned OR, office residential. They are now MXT. Two are vacant. They are all MXT. They are all the same size, the same shape. They are all flat. They are all in the same vicinity and have the same surroundings. In his notice of decision, the ZHE found, quote, applicants submitted evidence on appeal that 18 wheel trucks and other large delivery trucks regularly utilize the Silver Avenue curb next to the subject as parking for delivery. He goes on neighbors, he means our association argued that these uses apply generally to other properties in the vicinity. While that may be the case, he says, agents submitted evidence that the impact of these commercial and public uses falls disproportionately on the subject because it's one of the few MXT zone properties that is used for residential purposes. Council, we assert the ZHE erred in simply repeating applicant's statement that the subject is one of very few MXT zone properties in the vicinity used for residential purposes. He used that as a finding. He did not verify the fact. The 2020 Polk City Directory indicates that of the 12 developed lots, three of them have no residence, four of them are fully residential, and five have both uses. Counselors, ask yourself, if nine of the similar lots in this vicinity with the same surrounding have residential uses, how is one of them exceptional and which one is it? The notice of decision says the location of the subject as a corner lot adjacent to these uses makes such uses extremely harmful. Ask yourself, why do you think that this corner is a particularly different from these other corners as a place to unload a truck. The subject property does not meet prong one. This, is alone, this alone is sufficient for you to affirm our appeal. But for the good, long-term good of our city, we would also appreciate your attention to our reason related to prong three. The variant, quote, the variance does not cause significant material impacts on surrounding properties. 
now if I'm able to display this, which may or may not be relevant, but this is the iconic photo of Colonel D.K.B. Sellers who platted this edition in 1916. That's right, 1916, the same time when Albuquerque's historic rail yard was built. Architectural historians teach us that successful historic neighborhoods continue to portray architectural principles of their period of development. When this edition was built in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the architectural principles were straightforward. Open front yards, houses communicating with the street, and by the way, allowing natural proprietors of the neighborhood to maintain eyes on the street. These principles build our streetscape. That's the value of a historic neighborhood. What you see as you walk or bike on the streets, the facades of houses and how they relate to the public way. The comprehensive plan says, preserving historic assets reinforces our shared heritage and multi-layered identities that contribute to our rich sense of place. Historic streetscapes are a historic asset, reinforcing our heritage and enhancing our rich sense of place. They ground our children and their children and the children who come after them in architectural practice of the early 20th century, but they are fragile. We think of the Albuquerque High Lofts preserved with support from city government. We think of the rail yard being repurposed with support from city government. City government through you, our council, can support historic streetscapes and needn't spend a penny. We argued this before the ZHE and the LUHO that historic streetscape and historic character is enormous value to property owners in Knob Hill. Their written decisions indicate that we were talking past one another. They explored whether the neighborhood is a city landmark or listed in the National Register. No, it's not, not yet, but its streetscape is a significant historic resource of great value. You counselors are the zoning authority of Albuquerque. It's right for you to ask those to whom you delegate power to wear not just their lawyer hats, but remember to put on their planner hats. The six foot white vinyl fence in this request built without permit does not reflect the architectural principles of early 20th century Albuquerque. Therefore it damages historic streetscape causing significant material adverse impacts on surrounding properties. The special circumstances cited by the examiner apply generally to a number of other properties in the same zone district and vicinity. The residential use is not unique. The location is not a unique place to unload trucks. The hearing examiner erred in applying the requirements of the IDO with respect to prongs one and three. It's altogether Your fitting. Time is up. It's fitting that you affirm our our appeal. Thank you. Thank you Madam so President. much. So we will move on to our next presenter, Miss Millie Walker, Malaya, or Millie. Yes, it's Malaya. Malaya, thank you. Um, and your your time. We will also uh, let you know when your time is up. Okay. You have, Thank are you an appellant? Is that right? I, I actually am the appellant. agent of Gary Hoffman. Okay, so you have 10 minutes, Madam. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Um, good evening to everyone, councilmen, women, everyone on both sides of this issue. I kind of want to go off track from my notes a little bit so that way I can touch bases on a couple of things that Mr. Eister um, pointed out. I think the, um, the context that he took the examiner's um, statement was a little choppy. I think it was taken in portions because that same statement goes on to, to say that yes, there are 12, yes, there are nine that are zoned, I mean, I'm sorry, eight that are zoned residential and um for business, but there's only four in the neighborhood that are strictly residential, 
just like the purpose of this property. This property is strictly residential. So when you're even thinking the next corner over and you're talking trucks making deliveries, well, the next corner over is a coffee shop. So, I mean, they would expect trucks to make deliveries there. So that's, I think that was taken a little bit out of context. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that before I started. Um, I just wanted to give a little background history on the property. This is the Hoffman family. This year makes 50 years that they've owned the property. This is the first time that the property has had any real change since 1971 when the property was acquired. But as we all know, times have changed. Albuquerque has changed. And this fence was kind of, I guess I would put it, it was erected out of fear, out of necessity, and out of desperation almost. Um, but nonetheless, it was constructed legally and meeting all the prongs and requirements of the IDO. And to touch on that a little bit, I want to talk about the, sp the special circumstance. There are more dynamics to our special circumstance request because that was actually addressed in a whole appeal process. So there was a lot more to that. Yes, it was the trucks and the unloading and the idling and we submitted a multitude of proof documents, letters from doctors, because the gentleman that we're talking about, one is 68 years old and one is 75 years old. One is three years in remission from cancer and the other is in treatment now for bone cancer. Like the um, councilwoman earlier was speaking about, the doctor was speaking about that kind of touch tone as I was sitting and listening because that's you know what they're dealing with. And when you come out and you have people asleep on your porch, you have people defecating in your yard, you have people using your water hose and leaving it running for God knows how long, you know, those things, it, it becomes difficult. It, it, you know, it really becomes difficult. And, you know, when you talk about approaching these people and stuff like that, there's been so many incidents just with homeless people, just with drunk people, because it is a transition zone. That is the reason why it's zoned MXT, that directly to the left, the properties all the way the next, I don't know how many blocks past the one way are all residential R1. But this lane of properties are all zoned MXT because they are that buffer for Silver and Central with all of the businesses and the restaurants and the deliveries. And because of the art project, that made a big change in, you know, the things that were able to happen on Central. It, before the art project, they were able to utilize the medians and stuff like that and pull up and make deliveries from the front. Well, now that's not possible because we have the art stations, we have the designated art lanes. So if you're not able to access a business from the front, naturally they have to make their delivery. So they're going to deliver from the back. And that's where, you know, we come in when you're not able to sit out in front and have a cup of coffee in the morning because the trucks are idling, idling, they're loading, unloading the fumes, the noise. And then in the evening, you have to deal with the violence and the danger. So there were a lot more things that the special circumstance consisted of. You know, like I said, there there are the trucks, there is the violence and the openness of the yard and the location that it's in. And I just kind of wanted to refer back to actually one portion of the IDO and it's gonna be part 14, 16, two, and it's gonna be even more specific, 2-4A1. And I'm not going to get into that, but I'm just going to kind of go over it. And it it gives the explanation and it it says that it is a transition zone. It's a buffer zone. That's the purpose of it. And we understand that and we accept that. But all we're asking for is some sort of a personal barrier from that to be able to enjoy the residential property. I mean, been sitting out there a lot of years having cups of coffee to just in that, you know, by no means of your own. We were never, we never intended on being compensated by the city because, you know, that was kind of just the cost of doing business. There's a lot of things that are planned out when things are and projects are happening, but there's a lot of things that don't come into account 
until after the fact. And, you know, sometimes that's the cost of doing business and we understand that. But we also want to emphasize that the IDO has to stand for something. It is a set of rules and right criteria there to eliminate the bias, the opinions, the bureaucracy. It's, it's set in place. If you have the ability to meet these requirements and the city came out, the city came out numerous times. They did not just take my word for it with measurements. They did not. I mean, there were numerous city departments coming out and doing their thing when it came to the fence. So I can definitely say, say the city did their due diligence, you know, on their part, anytime a question arise from either side. And, um, just to kind of piggyback a little bit on, you know, what I was saying earlier, the, the neighbor directly across the street has lived there about 10 years shy of the Hoffmans. And she recently put her property up for sale because she's one of the four residential properties that, you know, are enduring these same issues. And after 40 years, she can't deal with it anymore. She's, she's done with it. So it, it can be trying, but we know that all of the prongs of the criteria were met in the beginning. It was not met. And that's why it was justly denied because we were not familiar with the IDO at that point. But once we familiarized ourselves and we were able to get an understanding of what an actual special circumstance was, that's why we reached out. We made the appeal. We presented our case. And with that evidence, the special circumstance was approved. The other prongs were met. Um, they boil down to the articulation of the fence, the, you know, how far is it set back, just all of those different things. And all of those criteria are, you know, within the parameters of the IDO and all of those all of those things were met. They were met. They were verified by the city, by the planning department, by the zoning department. This hearing was heard. It was remanded back. It was heard again. So it's not like it was just one individual's decision. This was numerous people, the land hearing officer, numerous people who are very, very well versed in the IDO and how to interpret the IDO handled this case. And I believe that they, you know, like I said, did their due diligence. They did not take anything on face value and they made sure that the fence was just before they granted the permit for the variance. And thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, ma'am, for your thank you. comments. Okay, counselors, um, we are going to move to Deliberation amongst the counselors, if you have questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped the gun here. Uh, Miss, you have two minutes, Mr. Eister. Yes. It says two minutes on here. That's my understanding, Excuse Madam for President. A second. Let me just check. It's planning, but there's Okay, so you do, you have two minutes, sir, and we will begin your two minutes now. Thank you, Madam President, counselors. Um, Ms. Walker pointed out that the uh, property owner felt like he needed a personal barrier, and uh, that's not really at argument today. Um, what is at argument is the decision of the hearing examiner and whether or not this is an exceptional property and whether or not it damages the uh, surrounding properties. Um, it was built without permit. Um, there are designs or heights of fences that we could have worked with, with the applicant, but we didn't get that opportunity because uh, we were deprived of uh, the IDO's uh, promise of, uh, to, of, of notice to neighborhoods because it was built without a permit. Um, the property is not unique with respect to a residential use. There's four others just like it. There's four total or three others just like it. So it's not unique in that way. And um, it's not unique as a place to unload a truck, the entire Silver Avenue, there's trucks that unload. And uh, finally, um, we just uh, would ask you to uh, think about the uniqueness of the property. There isn't any. Um, the special circumstances are not parsed carefully when considering variances, the IDO loses its meaning. It's altogether fitting that you affirm our appeal. Thank you, Madam President.
Thank you, Mr. Eister. With that, counselors, we will go to deliberation. Um, we have, uh, we, we are closing the floor to the presenters at this point in time. So, uh, Councilor Benton. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I had a question for, I guess, our council or planning staff, but, um, and maybe even our legal staff, is the fact that this was built without a permit relevant to our deliberation? Because that to me fundamentally looks like somebody who just did their own thing. Madam President, Councilor Benton. Um, so just to give a little bit of background to give some context, there is a letter in the record from the code enforcement department to the property owner, uh, which suggests that the residence had been under construction as of November of 2020. And that letter directed that corrective action be taken specifically uh, that uh, it cease or that the proper permits be obtained. So that's how this came in to the system. Once the steps are taken to uh, correct the situation of getting the proper uh, permit and variance for the fence, the test for the variance does not question whether or not it's an as-built request or a prospective request. So it's not something that you would be analyzing uh, with respect to its appropriateness or not. Somebody that goes out and builds something without permission is subject to enforcement in other ways, including um, penalties, criminal penalties um, that are established under the IDO and city code penalties of up to $500 a day for uh, violating the code. And, and even in some instances, the penalty contemplated is jail time. Um, that, not usually the case, but that is the remedy for someone who is acting without a permit. But once they get into the variance uh, arena, uh, that is not relevant to the test you're applying. Okay, I, I, I see. So, so that was an issue and may remain so. I don't know what that situation is. But we're only being asked to analyze this as if it just came clean from from. Uh, irregardless of, of the building permit. Madam President, Councilor Benton, that is correct. And, and if you, this variance is ultimately denied and that denial stands, then code enforcement would go out and, and enforce the removal of that fence because it was permitted, it was uh, constructed unlawfully. Okay. All right, I, I just want to, and, and I, I would happy, be happy to hear from Mr. Melendrez or, um, or planning staff from either the administration or the council. But um, my question is, is the use of a property in a multi-use zone, a specific use by somebody that's part of a list of uses that are allowed in a multi-use zone, specifically, qualifies them or makes this uh, consistent under the IDO. Our IDO has, has zoning restrictions and I, let, I, I think appropriately, Mr. Melendres is ready to respond. Um, uh, but but my, my question is that, is that this is an MX zone across the street from a different MX zone. It's in a transitional area without that doubt as the owner's representative stated times have changed clearly in many ways it's not just the art you know they got here but 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 this is a developing area it's also a historic area as mr eister stated where okay with uh, my question is the specific use of the specific specific owner today of that site who will not be the owner or the resident of that site forever is allowed to alter, to go beyond. You know, I, I realize it may seem unfair and so forth, but do we want to establish that? Once that wall is approved and built, it's there. Nobody can make anybody, the next donor or, or, or anyone else, tear it down after that. 
And meanwhile, we've made that decision with regard to this user. That's my question. Madam President, Councilor Benton, that's a really good question. Um, as, as we know, you cannot limit the a land use approval to an individual. So um, we could not say, for example, that the variance is approved so long as Mr. Hoffman or that family owns the property. Um, the approval would run with the land. And so I think the question that you're asking is that there are a multitude of uses. I mean, the nature of the zone is that it's mixed use. Right now it's being used for residential and that's one of the bases um, for the variance request. I think you have some amount of latitude to determine whether or not the impacts on the property given the breadth of um, zoning that you can uh, have at that site um, is, is should be considered with respect to um, the approval or not. And so in this instance, you know, part of the justification is that this is one of only four properties that is actually used for residential and that the impacts of the street are unique on the residential use. And so the wall is really for the purpose, as it seems, of protecting the residential use as, as opposed to any other uses. It was mentioned that there's a coffee shop down the street, and so they don't experience the impacts in the same way. Um, all that said, I mean, as a practical matter, to the extent that the use of the property changes from something other than residential, it would seem that the fence may, may be inconsistent with, for example, a more retail use where you would want more visibility from the street. And Madam President, if I could follow up. Uh, Mr. Melendrez, so I know of no means by which you, the city, would approve a temporary wall as long as it's a residential use there. Uh, but but my the thing that really gnaws at me is the idea that this can be any use. And another uh, property along there could convert or could just say, well, we're residential use, let's put fences up around every residential user, even though in the future, it, that residential use may go away. So that, that is what, you know, it, it may seem unkind or so forth that, that some things have changed and times have changed and, and and their trucks on the street, you know, I have, I mean, my neighbors are involving every two and there are many of them, but um, I just, it, that's what gnaws at me is that, that why would we single out one use, let's say another use that's allowed uh, under the uh, zone would have some other special requests I, you know, I don't have a good example, but but you can see what I mean. That's my, what about that specific angle that we're going to single out a use, which is not a zone. It's a use allowed within a zone. And we're going to give special exceptions to it. Madam question. President, Councilor Benton, yeah, good, good considerations, I think, relevant to your deliberation. I mean, the question that you're trying to answer with this variance is whether or not there is something unique about the property, its surroundings, how it's impacted that uh, present a hardship with respect to that particular property. The test within the IDO is not so specific as to say, is it unique with respect to how that property is being used today? Uh, you are the ultimate decision maker under the IDO and how to interpret that test. And so, um, you know, if as, as this progresses, that is certainly relevant to uh, ultimate findings that you might want to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Benton. So we have Councillor Davis with comments and Councillor Basson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And, and Councillor Benton actually hit on a couple of my points, so I'll make this very quick. I just want to uh, I, I kind of want to go back to that point that Mr. Melinda has made briefly and just reiterate. I understand that the question about the permit um, is one that maybe is not directly before us, but I do think, as Mr. Eister pointed out, it is uh, a, a key component of how this body makes this decision. I, I don't disagree with the applicant that they feel a need to install a fence. 
um, as a barrier between their home and uh, evolving adjacent neighborhood uses, I think any of us would would feel that way and want to take some uh, some steps to try to protect our our, our castle, so to speak. Um, but the IDO is, was designed specifically uh, with some remedies, as Mr. Eister noted, um, that would allow a neighbor who wanted to uh, pursue a non-conforming use to to come up with options to sit down with parties. Maybe there was a natural fence that could be done there. Maybe there's a shorter fence with uh, a more visibility, as the the ZHE pointed out, or the Louisville, well, I can't remember which, um, pointed out that the lattice work on top of the fence did provide some of the the through uh, sight line that was uh, intended by uh, the wall provisions in the IDO. Although I don't think they they fully meet that standard in my opinion, but I think they're trying, right? Like, kind of came with the fence, I suspect. Um, but I could see a way that there's a route to make this sort of work. But the whole point of the IDO is to facilitate cooperation. And as Mr. Melendrez pointed out in the record, it appears to me that the applicant did get notice that the, there was non-conforming uh, construction um, and for whatever reason um, chose to continue it or maintain it. Um, and instead of using the process that we have designed to mitigate and to help neighbors address these kind of concerns. So um, I think at best the applicants made some record that changes on Silver Avenue do require some buffer. Um, but uh, Mr. Melendrez, I'm gonna put you on uh, on point here in just a minute, uh, heads up. Um, but my question I think is, how is, is this council limited to just saying yes or no to the fence that's sort of there? Is that really the question? Or what I'm really trying to figure out is I, I understand the need and the, um, the special circumstance using IDO language, maybe for a buffer between Silver Avenue and the home, but the fence extends as far as I can tell, also down the residential portion of Richmond, um, where as, as we mentioned, um, people sit on their front porches and drink their coffee. And there are other neighbors impacted by this wall who don't have a wall and, and have a residential use on that street. Is there a way for us to sort of split the baby here and say like, maybe silver deter just needs a variance, but the front of the property does not <laughs> because that's the residential front. How, how can we address this? Madam President, Councilor Davis, uh, another really good question. And the interesting thing about the test that you're applying is that there are multiple factors that all kind of require some level of balancing. And one particular that is at play um, with respect to your question is prong five of the variance test that's set out in the IDO. And that basically says that if approved, the variance that is approved is the minimum necessary to avoid the extraordinary hardship or proclaimed difficulties uh, with the site. And so what that's asking for is, does the remedy fit the problem? And the justification that we've heard a lot about is the um, activity on silver. So to your point, um, if, if in looking at the evidence and considering those factors, the council were to determine that if that is a sufficient justification, it's only justification for silver and not Richmond, you could tailor your decision that way in reliance on that prong that asks you to make sure that the variance you're granting is not anything more than is absolutely necessary to meet the issue. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. Uh, Madam President, I think I wanna reserve the right to maybe make a motion in a minute after we hear from other counselors, but I'm sort of inclined to, <clears throat> to think that if we're counting votes and sort of moving in a direction here, um, that I think there is some evidence that maybe something has changed, but I think the applicant's um, proposed remedy, which is a, a very high wall that's not consistent with anything else and um, not having seen, not having explored any other options um, may be too extreme. And so I'm trying to, to move in that direction a little bit um, and see how we might uh, address both of those concerns. But I'm anxious to hear from other counselors. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor Davis, Councillor Basson, and then we'll go to Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I wasn't going to, I think that Councillor Benton brought up quite a few points that I kind of don't agree with um, in that regard. I understand why they're being made. I understand, um, you know, that we can't, I, I first of all want to preface this, I guess, with saying that it's no fun and I do not support people breaking the rules in advance and then asking for forgiveness later. I don't think that's a wise choice. So I'm disappointed 
that this variance wasn't applied for just to begin with, but some people just don't know. And the contractor should have known whoever they chose. And that's, you know, neither here nor there at this point, but I really struggle with saying that we need to make a decision tonight based off of what could be there in the future. I think we need to make a decision tonight based off of what is there now. And I understand we don't want to set a precedent, but that's kind of what we do. That's what this council argues regularly, setting precedent and seeing what we should do in in the future and making the decision saying, oh, well, that house may not always be there. Well, that house is there now and there are businesses there now. And that's kind of the, the devil in the detail of a mixed use transitional zone. You have all of it. And in and of itself, to me, each property is unique. So that makes it more difficult, right? The area has changed significantly. And I think that that makes it to where we need to think about now. We need to think about, yes, the ART got in there. Yes, there's businesses next door. Yes, there's residents next door. But I think that this is in and of itself exactly why we have to be able to look at the evidence and see what the Luho said, what the ZHE said, and recognize that these are some of the tweaks that by, again, even Councillor Gibson earlier in a different matter said, you know, I think it was Councillor Gibson that said, you know, by trying to help people, we actually hurt people by the legislation we propose. And we have to, or maybe it was anyway. But at the same time, I think that we don't need to continue hurting people if there's a way to find a way, the way to balance it, right? So I, I do not, I can't make this decision thinking about what could be there in the future. I'm going to make my decision tonight based off of what is there now and how it's being affected, whether it's the businesses, whether it's the, you know, the residents that are there. But I just think that one more thing, because I wrote it down, I have to check my notes. I just think that it's, it's really something that if a business goes in there later in the future, why is it okay to protect the future business that doesn't even exist when we can't even protect the residents that's in there now? So I, I can't, I can't vote for this if it's going to be about a future decision. Thank you, Councilor Brisson, Councilor Jones, and then we'll go back to Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. This is a difficult one because we all, I believe, have a great deal of empathy for this gentleman and we understand. But we also have to understand that there is a reason why we have zoning laws and why we have uh, rules in effect. And I guess what really disturbs me the most is that the people involved in putting up this fence didn't bother to go through the processes to get a permit and to see what they could do and to work with. As we've been told, um, governmental entities were willing to work with them and help them come up with a design that could take care of the issue at hand um, and help this gentleman, which is obviously where our hearts are. But that doesn't mean you can just ignore what's there and then pretend you didn't ignore it, and, but I've got this up here and now I get to do it. So as much as I empathize with it, it's a, a very difficult situation or we wouldn't be hearing it again right now. I believe that there is a way to work with this homeowner to try to help them and to also not violate what's in place for all of the other property owners on that street. We cannot do a, a one-off. We cannot do a one and consider it good governing. So um, I, I'm very much uh, leaning towards working with this gentleman to see if we can help him take this wall down and put fence down and do what he needs to do something that would possibly work, but not be able to keep it up at this point. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Benton, and then back to Councillor Bassan. Yes, just to make clear, uh, you know, as I tried to uh, explain, it's it it uh, this is a unique situation that without question is, is very, uh, you know, heart rendering, I suppose, a person who's lived in a house for a long time, and they, they're lived in a place that's been enveloped by changing conditions and redevelopment and so forth. Um, here's the thing, these edges between residential neighborhoods and commercial 
vertical redevelopment, especially along major corridors, is, is where the rubber hits the road. This is where land use planning gets it right or not. And, and, and as a, as a co-sponsor of the idea, and, and I'm sure many people would say, well, I'm a jerk because I was a co-sponsor of the IDO. But no, as a co-sponsor of that, um, I recognize that the old zoning code did not serve us well. The old zoning code didn't cover conditions like this. Um, what we have with the IDO is a, a community venue to fix a condition like this. And for us, as the, the land use body of the city of Albuquerque, ultimately, uh, to, to really look at something like this. You know, what about this person? And what about this edge along Silver Avenue, one block in from Central? That's a really important question. But this is not the venue to fix that. And this appeal, uh, is has merit because what what the ZHE did was basically try to fix this very difficult sensitive condition and I don't think that's the venue to do that and for that reason madam president uh, I'm moving uh, that this appeal be approved or what's the correct uh, help me out staff uh, that this be accepted uh, and, and Madam, Madam President, the motion would be that the appeal be granted and that the variance Correct. be denied. Correct. Thank you. Uh, that's my motion. Thank you, Madam President, also, uh, you will need findings for that, uh, which we could adopt at a future meeting. So if you want to add that to your motion to adopt findings at the next subsequent meeting, um, that would probably be more complete. So, uh, and, and Madam President, I'll, 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 uh, I'll amend my motion to the effect of, of what Mr. Melendres just said, that, that the findings on this need to be pretty carefully crafted uh, for it to have sense. But, but I would welcome and always be a part of the discussion about this edge that I'm talking about. This edge is what makes or breaks our city and these big corridors and what's left of commerce on these big corridors, which is pretty poor. Uh, and how that interacts with the immediately adjacent neighborhoods. I think this is really a, a major issue. It's not so much in my district, but it is a major issue in the city of Albuquerque. Thank so you. So Councilor Benton, you have a motion on the floor. Councilor Jones, is that a second? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and now I wanna to go to Councilor Bassan because Councilor Bassan had her hand up for a period. Councilor Bassan? Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to say as a comment related to Councillor Jones in regard to, um, well, and now I'm losing my train of thought. Bring it back, Councillor Jones. Um, in regards to the whole, oh, I know. I would like to just make sure to make the comment to Code Enforcement and the Planning Division that I think it would behoove whichever powers that be to find out who that contractor was that did install this wall and did this work and make sure that they have maybe a new um, lesson or a refresher course in, in the regulations that the city does offer. So that way, resident in, residential individuals that are going to end up losing out on their quality of life benefits because of commerce can be avoided in the whole, the whole aspect of it anyway. I think that that would be something I would like to request of the administration, please. I would uh, like to comment also because I had a business in this particular area for uh, about five years and I watched the area transition. Um, I mean, it has transitioned and, and, you know, I always, I always looked at those businesses right behind, um, you know, Central Avenue. Madam and President, let me just, just stop you for one second. Um, this is relevant because the changing in the area have been uh, brought up by the parties, but we have to be careful not to sort of bring in our personal observations of the area because those are not necessarily. I understand that, and I wasn't going to bring my personal Very opinion good. into it. I was going to comment on the changed environment, and I think that's important because 
as we're looking at this area and I, and, you know, I was mentioning that I was there for about five years and I saw these uh, residential areas that were sort of being encroached on over a period of time. And I, you know, I always wondered about um, how we create these um, sort of barrier barriers and whether fences or walls are appropriate. So I think that that's why I'm bringing this up because I, you know, I'm not, not trying to bring up any new information. I'm certainly just looking at existing conditions, but on the other hand, um, I mean, it's difficult for me to understand why um, a wall or a fence was built without a permit. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that is really a, that's kind of a sticking point for me with regard to my decision on this um, because people that know anything about planning know that there are permits involved and there was not a permit obtained in this particular instance. So, you know, my question is though, and, and I guess this is for either planning staff or, or um, um, our attorney is, um, if we were to deny, let's see, how do, how, how do I phrase this? If we did not allow um, the wall or the fence and it had to be taken down, do they, could they come back within a year? Is that right to apply again? Madam President, counselors, um, so the year prohibition actually only applies to zone map amendments. And so if somebody were to be denied a zone map amendment, by statute, they couldn't reapply for another year. But for things like variances, conditional use permits, uh, denied today, apply tomorrow. There's no limit. So they could come in tomorrow. Madam President, uh, they could come in without any limitation on uh, that they'd have to wait out. Thank you. Okay, counselors, uh, we have a motion and we have a second on the floor at this point in time. If there's no other discussion, I think we will go to the vote. Um, Councilor Senna, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam President. Can you just repeat the motion uh, to clarify, just so I know what we're voting Senator on? Melendres, would you like to repeat that motion? Madam President, the motion as I heard it was to grant the appeal and deny the variance and to adopt findings in support of that decision at your next meeting. Okay, counselors, if there's no other discussion, then we are going to go ahead and go to the vote. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Passan. No. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. No. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? No. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? No. Motion fails on a 4 4 vote. 4 to 4 vote. So, Mr. Melendres, where do we go from here? Madam President, you can uh, entertain another motion, um, a motion. Um, you know, of your creation, or you can move to uh, accept the LUHO recommendation and findings uh, at this time, which effect would effectively approve um, the variance. In the event that all motions fail, it would result in the ZHE's decision being unharmed. And so the variance would stand. Councillor Davis, you had your hand up first. Hey, go ahead, Madam President. I want to hear from some of the councillors first. Councillor Benton. Councillor Benton. Is he not hearing me? Councillor Benton. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, okay, I've got a bad connection or had, had a bad connection, I don't know who, but... Um, I didn't hear the last, I didn't hear uh, Councillor Davis's statement, so I would have to respond after that. <laughs> Madam President, I think you're muted as well. Councillor Benton, um, Councillor Davis wanted to hear from other councillors before we, okay. he, he spoke. Yeah, that, that's fine. 
Did you have a comment? Uh, now, now you're me. <laughs> I guess I, I, I had a question. If there are other counselors that have questions as well, uh, you know, let's hear from them and then I'll circle back. Okay, I can make, a, I can make a proposed on. motion, Madam President, if, if no one else wants to, I think it might expedite this uh, unless someone else feels they need to. Uh, Councillor Davis, can I, I was calling on Councillor Brisson first, so we'll come back to you. Councillor yeah, Brisson. You. Thank you, Madam President. I'm just willing to make a motion to uphold the Lujo and findings. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Councillor Jones. Thank you. And Councillor Gibson. So we have a motion on the floor. Councillor Davis, I'm gonna go back to you because you said you wanted to make a, a comment. Thanks, and, and I can do it in that context, uh, Madam President. Um, if that motion remains on the floor, I, I would vote against um, with you because I'd like to have the opportunity to consider uh, sort of the, the path Mr. Melendrez and I discussed, which is recognizing that the, the, the changing use on Silver Avenue on the kind of more a uh, commercial street as it's as Knob Hill and Central Avenue are improving uh, business-wise is different than the, having a big fence against your residential neighbors around the corner. And so uh, I would vote against this motion on the floor if it remains um, in the hopes that we could present a different motion that would allow um, the, the fence height on silver um, and deny the variance on the residential Richmond Street. But that will be my hope that we can do if, if the motion remains on the floor. Thank you, Councilor Davis. Count, um, I'm going to go to Councilor Pena and then Councilor Benton because it looks like they have comments. Um, thank you, Madam President. I actually would lean towards, you know, just deferring this and just having a conversation. I don't know if I would go as far as uh, Councilor Davis's a motion to make a decision, but just to defer it and um, see what we can do to come up with some type of resolution. Okay, Councillor Benton, did you have a comment? What she said. What she said. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, did I have a second on that motion? I did have a motion, a, a second, a yeah, motion I, and a second. So, um, I'm gonna ask the maker of the motion if they want to continue with that motion or if they would prefer to make a different motion. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to change my motion to deny the appeal and adopt findings at our next meeting. Do I have a second? Councilor Gibson, is that a second? We have a motion and a second to deny the appeal and adopt findings at our next meeting. So we will go to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Pena. Uh, no. Councilor Senna? No. Councilor Borrego? No. Motion fails. Okay, that motion also fails, counselors, and that was on a two to six vote. Two to six vote. So let's, uh, I will entertain another motion. Councilor Benton, your hand was up first. <laughs> I think so by a split second. Um, I, I would like to move the deferral to our next meeting and um, I would like to, along with that, ask our council staff to dig into this further, uh, including other, you know, various other options, which, which could include, I don't know what they would include, <laughs> but, but I know that one of them would be to amend the IDO in this specific area in this granted a unique condition of where a major corridor is separated from a residential area by one block. That was the historic condition. And so I'm asking that staff look into that. Thank you, Councilor Benson. We have, I believe we have two sec. do we have two seconds or do we have comments, Councilor Pena or Councilor Davis? I have a brief comment on that motion. Yeah, I had a comment as well. Okay, we'll go to Councilor Pena first and then Councilor Davis. Um, 
just my comment would be just for the record, I'd be inclined to support um, Councillor Passan's motion if we couldn't get anywhere with just having some discussion. But um, I'm supporting this because I know we're kind of in a conundrum with this issue. So. Thank you, Councillor Pena. And I'll go to Councillor Davis and then our, uh, Mr. Melendez. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, I, I support the deferral um, to give everybody a little more time, but I want to encourage the parties to perhaps have a conversation as well. Um, you know, I think there may be some resolution that there could be some alternatives. I think it's clear in the record that the the structure as uh, as built was unpermitted and didn't follow the IDO process. I don't believe that would prohibit the parties from speaking in the interim uh, about looking at alternatives that might satisfy everybody. Uh, so I hope that that, that would happen uh, in the meantime, and just want to put that on the record and encourage those parties to have that conversation before we reconvene if we defer. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Mr. Melendez, did you want to give a comment? Yeah, if I may, Madam President, um, Council staff has helped me look at the IDO, and uh, we've determined that nothing would preclude you from deferring at this time. Um, you have closed the floor to the parties. Um, if you intend to potentially reopen it next time, then the deferral would be appropriate. Otherwise, we often use um, a continuance in instances where you just plan to continue your deliberation at the next hearing. Um, however, um, with respect to any solution that might be found within the IDO or proposed from a policy perspective, the test that you are still being asked to apply with respect to this particular variance is the one that is found in the IDO today, which is whether or not there, are, there is a special circumstance that uh, supports the variance, whether or not the request will be materially contrary to the public safety, whether it uh, does or does not cause significant material adverse impact to surrounding properties, whether it will materially undermine the intent and purpose of the IDO, and whether it is a minimum necessary to meet the harm that is being claimed. So. Um, Policy uh, improvements to the IDO in the future don't necessarily speak to that test. The applicant before you has put up the fence and is requesting a decision from this council under the variant standard. So you are still gonna be tasked with making a decision under that standard at some point. Thank you, Mr. Melendros. I'm going to second that uh, motion for deferral. Councilor Benton, did you have a, another comment? Yes, thank you just briefly in, in response to uh, uh, Mr. Melendres' statement, yeah, um, this uh, this does have to do with our procedures that have been established. Are they do they work or do they not? Um, and um, again, I, I would speak to the um, the venue, and this venue is not the way to fix some detail of that edge that we're talking about between commercial redevelopment and, and a historic residential neighborhood, which this is. And I respect the, the needs of the resident and I respect the analysis by Mr. Erster of the, of the, that this is a streetscape that is an historic streetscape. So are you going to really disrupt that or not? Th those are the kind of things I was hoping with the continuance or deferral, and I think maybe continuance is the correct motion now, um, uh, that we would ask our staff to help us with just that discussion. Uh, we know that we're not making law or making zoning code right now, and that's my whole point, that, that I sort of feel like this appeal is trying to make uh, an ordinance, you know, amend an ordinance that's in existence. Thank you. Um, Councilor Benton, you made the motion for deferral. Can we amend that motion to uh, continuance? And I would second that. Yes, that, 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 thank you. Thank you. So at this point, I'm gonna close the floor and I'm going to go over to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 8 0 on the continuance to September 20th. Thank you, Councilors. That passes on an 8 0 vote. Uh, the next order of business is number 13, and those are approvals, and there are none. 
So with that, we are going to come back uh, from a, a break at about um, 7.25, thereabouts. And we will proceed with our final actions. Recording.
in progress. Good evening and welcome back to the City Council meeting. This is a continuation of our September 8th, 2021, 40th meeting of the 24th Council. We are on item number 14. And our first item this evening is item B, Councillor Davis, Senna, Pena, Benton, 067. Would one of you like to present this? Thank you, Madam President. I'll go ahead and jump. Councillor Senna, thank you. Thank you. 067 is amending section 7-2-1-2 of the transit system ordinance to provide for a zero fare pilot project and creating a new section 7213. I move a due pass. Looks like you have a second from Councillor Davis. Councillor Senna, um, would one of you like to discuss what this is? Yes, um, and thank you, Madam President. I was checking on my uh, co-sponsors to see if they want to move the amendment yet. But, um, but essentially, this is, you know, it's already funded. This is really just putting it into ordinance um, and as a pilot project of having zero fares. I know that transit met with many of our counselors <laughs> to really discuss the benefits of a zero fare um, pilot project as well as I know constituents reached out to each district um, discussing how they've used transit before and really have uh, sometimes had to walk, sometimes uh, not going on the bus late at night because they just didn't have those uh, the fare ready. And uh, during these times, every penny counts. So this is really already putting it into ordinance. Like I said, the appropriation we've already passed and I will leave it to my co-sponsors if they want to add anything else. I am looking for hands up. I see one <laughs> hand up, Councillor Davis. Uh, Madam President, I'll make this quick. Uh, we've had a number of meetings about this uh, on and on and on. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we're all well aware of this as, as our uh, able counselor from the West Side mentioned. This is something we uh, directed two years ago in the unanimous vote of the city council making us uh, what it was at the time and I think still is would be the largest uh, free fare system in the country uh, once fully implemented and uh, we've seen a number of sort of what I call incremental pilot projects where uh, for summer youth and seniors and then during COVID and others and so we know this will work uh, we know there are some concerns uh, about how this will be implemented and I appreciate the administration working closely with us to and the union uh, for the drivers and other folks to figure that out but we have really good data now that shows us some of the security concerns um, that are right to be evaluated haven't been um, I haven't come to fruition as much as we thought they might already on the system. And so I think we're in a good position to do this. I applaud Councilor Senna for, for pushing this forward um, and for spending the hard, doing the hard work to do the technical work to get these amendments ready to make it work. And, uh, and so I would defer to our lead sponsor, Councilor Senna, on how she would want to proceed on those amendments. Councilor Senna. Thank you to Councillor Davis and also to his leadership uh, throughout the years. I know that this and Councillor Benton, Councillor Pena all have um, worked on this well before I came on to council. I know that our transit board also approved this as well. So um, just for some clarification, I know that Councillor Davis has a sponsored amendment here. So if he would like, I can move it for him. Um, before we do go to the amendment, Councillor Senna, um, would you just explain uh, for the public's sake, because not everyone has the ability to see the bill, um, what this um, uh, pilot project entails? Yes, Madam President. Um, so we had appropriated um, the, the fares. So that's why we're calling it zero fares and not free fares, because uh, we did pay for it already. Um, and that's why it's zero fares for our public transit system. So meaning um, routes along our ART, um, ARTX as it's now being known, um, along cores. Um, and so this is putting into ordinance because previously um, it was not. And 
pretty much stating that it's a pilot pro project, and I know the amendment will come through too, um, for a year, for the calendar year of providing zero fares, meaning that for individuals who wish to ride the bus, they will not have to pay for a fare for the year. Thank you, Councillor Senna. I, I saw um, Councillor Benton's hand up, and I don't know if he still has a question or not, or a comment. Um, Madam President, I just wanted to say I'm, I've, I've got connectivity problems. I'm going to try to switch devices and uh, see if I can get back on. I missed pretty much everything that was just stated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. We look forward to you getting back on. Okay, so with that, thank you. Um, Councillor Davis, did you also have a comment? I, it, I worked it out with Mr. Moya. Uh, I think Mr. Moya can share that amendment if, if the president uh, is okay with it. I think we'd like to go ahead and move this as floor amendment number one. Absolutely, I was just going to go to that. Right. Thank you, Councillor Davis. You can go ahead and move that if you'd like. All, right. All that time for dinner and we didn't take time to coordinate how we we're gonna do this. Uh, uh, floor amendment number one uh, makes some technical changes and just makes clear in the ordinance that enforcement of the fees in the or original ordinance are suspended during the pilot. Uh, I know this sounds kind of silly, but we have a law that says there is a fee, and so we have to pass a law that says you can't enforce it, and that's what this does. Urge your support. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We have a motion. We have a second by Councillor Senna. Are there any questions of councillors? It does not appear so. So with that, we will move to Ms. Ortega for the vote on the amendment. Floor amendment number one. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 7-0 on amendment number one. Thank you, councilors. Um, are there any other amendments? Does not appear so. So we will go back to the original bill, 067. Are there questions from counselors regarding the original bill? Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is in really in reference to the next few agenda items because I know that I've been working with some other counselors and I know it's been brought up as concerns about certain ridership of the unhoused being on the the buses and, and the transit system. So I just wanna make sure that for those watching and for everyone else, I guess, that we are working at kind of evaluating what is going on in other cities, how it's working, what we can do to minimize or protect or uh, all of the right everythings to make it a perfect world of zero fare transit. But at the same time, I also would really like to ask if the administration would consider, and this is something I definitely would like to pursue more offline than now, but I think it's important that if we can get together, Director Holcomb or Ms. Nair, CAO Nair, um, I think it would be really beneficial if we could reevaluate some of the processes. And I, I don't, I know it's not for me to do, but to allow for maybe the transit drivers to be able to take some kind of like develop a module and some training or something so that perhaps they can, I guess, escalate on a graduation sort of a thing to where they don't always have to wait for a supervisor in order to necessarily remove passengers from, uh, from any of our transit buses. And I say that because I am concerned. I think on one hand, if people aren't making a nuisance and it's fine, then so be it. Like, let's keep people safe. But if there is a nuisance, um, and I, I do fear that some of that will increase with the zero fares. I think it would be great if we can kind of evaluate and see what we can do to streamline and protect those that do ride the transit system compared to those that might start riding it as perhaps shelter or just hanging out or I, I, whatever the reasons are. So I do want to kind of work on that and see if we can come up with a good solution. Um, as far as more prevention uh, and work together on that as well. Please. Madam President, Councilor Prasad, thanks for that question. We've already had some preliminary discussions with uh, city security to come up with ways to identify how we can get those passengers off the bus. If the driver feels unsafe, if the passenger feels unsafe, um, we will probably be using our, our road supervisors. We have road supervisors that are on the road all day, every day. 
as well as our dispatchers to communicate with security and make that call to say, okay, go ahead and take this person off the bus. He or she's been disruptive and we'll, we'll uh, take that action. Thank you, director. I think that that comes as a comfort. So I look forward to making that even bigger and better and stronger and more efficient, efficient and effective as we go. Your comments from counselors? If not, I'll go back to Councillor Pena or uh, Councillor Senna, I'm sorry, to close. Thank you so much, Madam President. I know that we've been working on this, we as a council for a very long time. Um, I'm very excited to see this proceed forward. Um, I know that we know the benefits of public transit and we know that it is investment into our own communities. And we know that it's not really a return on investment in terms of dollars, but really in return and in investment in our community where um, I've already heard of many individuals and constituents utilizing the bus to go to job fairs, to apply for jobs, to get groceries, to connect amenities that they didn't utilize before. Um, we know that uh, recent studies have shown that greater access to public transit also gives greater access to a lot of our BIPOC communities, um, to green and open spaces. And I am um, very happy to have worked with uh, many of our youth and rode alongside and talked with our drivers as well um, before we really proceeded with this of some of the issues that they could see and ways that we can really address it coming together um, and being proactive about it. And to Councillor Bassan's point as well, also connecting those who need services to those services. Um, I think that as things progress, I know that, that um, Councillor Bassan and I have discussed of, of other ways to really provide services. You know, I think that meeting individuals where their needs are is always important. Um, so whether it's, you know, connecting departments that we currently utilize when it comes to uh, community safety um, to our transit as well, it would be something that we could look at towards the future. But I think that more riders I know will be utilizing the bus um, and uh, that's a great thing. And so, you know, I don't wanna belabor the point, but I think that um, this has been a long journey here. And I know that Councillor Davis, Councillor Benton and many of the councillors here led that charge. So um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna. It looks like uh, we have one more comment from Councillor Benton. You're Thank you, Madam answer. President, and, and I'm sorry I, I missed some of this discussion in, in uh, having to switch over. Uh, I, I think I've got a better connection on my iPad. Um, I uh, strongly support the, uh, the intent of this ordinance. I don't think we're ready for prime time. I think we need more answers than what we've heard with regard to security on the system. To just suddenly implement free fares uh, is cavalier ultimately at this point without having that information. So I'm a, I'm a sponsor, but I really think we need to step back for a minute and my proposal is a deferral until October 4th. And I really wanna hear a robust security plan for, for the entire system, but especially on the most traveled routes by the most traveled in need, which we know which they are. They, these are, you know, Central, San Mateo, Lomas Manal, uh, ART, and, um, What's the plan? I need to see it before I can see all of our proposals move forward, which I have always supported. And I think the folks in the community want to just look past this and say, or some folks, I should say, and look past it and say, well, let's just do it. You know, no, I'm not convinced that we have adequate security today on the system, much less with free fares. So I uh, am moving a deferral until October 4th. Okay, Councillor, while you were gone, we did have a motion and a second to move this forward. 
Yes, that, this this uh, this proceeds that. Defer? Yes, ma'am. This this, this this. And it looks like I have a second from Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson, is that correct? Yes, second. Okay, so the deferral supersedes our motion. Um, any other comments, Councillor Basson? Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Benton. I think that you're spot on. I see the the urgency of on one hand of the intention of wanting to do this, but I know that it's no secret that I'm most concerned about crime in our city and wanting to make sure that we reduce that or at least don't unintentionally increase it. So um, I, I definitely will support this deferral. We're, it's come to my attention and it is foggy in my mind, uh, but did we ask or were we told a few meetings ago that we would get a report on the findings of security um, and what, it, what that was going to look like before we were going to vote on this? We did. Have we received that? I'm sorry, Madam uh, President. Have we received that or has anybody, have we had that? Madam President, not that I know of. Um, you know, this is, the, this is a critical issue and it's a critical issue to the viability of public transit in general in our community and in our region until we get a grip on it and we don't have a grip on it. And, um, I'm probably not supposed to be saying this because I'm the biggest transit supporter you ever saw, but um, it, it, I don't want to diminish the credibility of the safety of our system. I would still get on on a bus my myself today uh, if I if I needed to go somewhere, and and uh, that was my option. And um, but. It, it's pretty rough out there. I, you know, I'm an old uh, kid that grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico, riding the bus for five cents. You want to see some rough characters, then you can see them down there. But, but um, we have a challenge here, and I really want us to succeed. And I really want the zero fare to succeed. And, and I don't think we're ready to see it succeed under the questions that we have today. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Benton, uh, Councilor Senna, and then Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. It was from my understanding that uh, transit did meet with councilors. I guess it was a presumption on my end of a, a organization of zero fares. Um, I have the presentation here. I'm sure we could forward that around, but um, when looking at security incidents based off of this presentation, total security incidents from June, July was 31. Um, security incidents was 26 and off of the ART security incidents, there was five. I know that based off of um, other pilot programs that we've evaluated such as Kansas City, oftentimes what we see is increased ridership. So more people on buses, also mitigates a lot of the security uh, concerns. I think that, um, of course, we always want to address some of the security concerns that uh, fellow counselors do have. Um, I know that they are pushing for additional security, but I think overall what I would love to see, not just security though, is social services as we stated. Uh, during my ride along on the bus, um, which has occurred a few times, once while doing just a simple ride along, another time with our, our youth, and um, another time while actually on a separate ride along um, within APD, that some of the incidents that I have witnessed myself, um, such as those individuals that suffer from addiction, um, they just needed to connect services. So uh, whether a social service worker is actually sitting on the bus to connect them to those services, I think is um, a bigger issue that we should be addressing. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, what I had heard from some of our drivers, um, when I talked to them directly, one of the biggest incidents or cause of incidents was actually a mask. Um, currently there's a federal mask mandate by the FTA along our bus routes. Um, and I imagine that will continue on through the pandemic. And that was one of the you know, reasons for that. And I will say even um, into the credit of transit, 
that now bus drivers are actually being trained through de-escalation and seeing that play out for myself, um, I think has actually benefited the community, but also the working conditions of our drivers. Um, you know, I think that you know, we've been deferring this for quite some time. Um, I think that depending on how the rest of my co-sponsors feel, of course, that this presentation, you know, I'm, I guess it was a presumption on my part that this was given to all counselors. But I think stressing the point that, um, of course, we want to address those issues and so that other counselors feel comfortable. But I will note that because we've passed this in terms of appropriations, that it's essentially, even when I got on the bus, I rode for free. Um, so we haven't been collecting fares. Um, and, you know, Director Holcomb, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we haven't been. So if there has been an uptick because of that, you know, I think that's something that, of course, we can evaluate. But so far, even as I have rode the bus, um, it has increased ridership, but I have not seen, um, you know, escalations. Of course, that's only when I'm riding the bus. So um, I think that, of course, we can continue that conversation when it comes to security, but I would love to have more wraparound services, um, especially of those that, um, you know, need those services, um, those that are facing homelessness or addiction um, that are on our buses. Councillor Davis and then Councillor Jones. Councillor Davis has been waiting for a while. Thanks, Madam President. I'll make it brief because uh, a counselor sent a, sort of mentioned the same thing I was going to. Um, and look, I, you know, I, I'm a, an advocate both of doing this and of doing it safely and right. And, and we've all had conversations about it. But I think we ask as a council for the administration and for the, uh, the advocates to get together. Um, they created a public safety working group um, to deal with uh, transit questions about this. Uh, they talked to experts in the the uh, presentation that uh, Councilor Sin is mentioning, I think, was in early August to that group. Um, but in Kansas City, they reported that 80 to 90 percent, quote, of their calls were related to fare disputes that went away um, and that total safety incidents went down 30 percent since they implemented free fares. Our own security data, as Councilor Sin mentioned, um, for the entire period of January to June of this year, um, there were 135 transit security incidents but only 32 of those were on a bus. The rest were at stops, which doesn't have anything to do with fares. Um, that has to do with those social issues. And, and we see how we're trying to address those issues. That's less than one uh, incident on a bus every three days that required a service of a security officer or APD. Um, we're just not, that. we are all right to ask those questions. But when our bus drivers say the best thing we can do is eliminate the conflicts over fares and the secure transit department is telling us that they don't have the level of security calls that, that we all presume they would. I think we listen to the experts and I don't know how another deferral um, would do that. So I, I, I feel like there's no, they've answered all those questions. Um, and so I'm comfortable that we can move forward um, and tightly monitor the situation um, in regular meetings and regular reports to FGO or to this council as we see fit. Um, and to be able to look at it. But we're also in a place where we got to make this decision uh, before the first of the year so that we can decide if we're going to make this a permanent program in next year's budget. Um, and I certainly think that absent something really changing, I think we should. But, uh, so I would oppose the deferral because I think we've answered those questions and our, I trust our experts in our transit department that say they can do this. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We will move to Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, we appreciate what you were all saying, and I most especially was interested to hear that we were given a presentation because the we did not include me. So if we are going to give the presentation to the council, it would be nice if the entire council can see it. Um, just to pass that out. And another thing that concerns me, I am absolutely 100% behind zero fares. But I think we're missing the big picture here I think we are forgetting what our city needs to be and wants to be. And in order to have a city and a vibrant downtown, our bus service has to take workers downtown from other areas of the city so that we're not spending more money on parking structures, but in fact, and for 
the workers to have to pay for public parking. If we want to be a vibrant, growing city and a true city, we need to have a public transit system that serves everyone. And I'm, and I'm hearing here, we're serving, we're only wanting to serve homeless people. Uh, they need to be served, but I don't think that's where we need to be a city. I would like to see a step back and take a look at this and understand that crime and uncomfortable situations on a bus will stop the people who would use this for true transit to get from the west side to downtown, from the east side to downtown, from all over the city to the base to work, to work in all of our new uh, businesses that are blooming on the west side. I think we need to look at the big picture. Um, and I'm disappointed that we don't have more information. I'm disappointed that we don't have a bigger picture. Um, and again, I am all for in favor of helping and transporting the homeless and the, and the needy. But let's look at what we want to be as a city. What do we want to be as a city? Do we want to be a vibrant, successful city with jobs for everyone? Then let's take a bigger picture. Let's look at the bigger picture. Um, I like the idea of no fares. I like the no, idea of no fares no matter who rides it because what we want them to do is ride uh, and the amount of money we collect doesn't make that much difference. So I don't think this is ready for prime time yet. And I would certainly like to see some input from the citizens who might possibly also use the bus service. So with that, thank you for the time. I support the idea. I don't support the narrow scope of the idea that we're looking at today. Thank you. Councillor Jones, thank you. Uh, we have several other councillors wanting to speak, and we also have the mayor's conference room wanting to speak. So I'm going to go to councillors first, Councillor Bassan, Councillor Benton, and then to the mayor's conference room. Thank you, Madam President. Part of this will help, I guess, maybe help the mayor's conference room. Did we receive a presentation? Because I'm fully willing to- We've got to clear this up. I'm really willing to say that I've spaced it out now and I need a refresher course, but I can't find it in my emails. So I'm just, I would like to know um, when we receive that. And if you can just remind me that I've. Madam President, Councilor Bassan, uh, yes, counselors were sent the presentation. And if counselors weren't able to attend, their policy analysts did. Thank you, Director. I do remember meeting with you. I don't think that I was fully. I, I don't know. I don't know what I was, I guess. The but dates. at the same time, I think that if some counselors haven't been updated on it, I think that, that that is a shame. However, that in and of itself is more reason why we need to be able to answer these questions. It's a common theme we've had tonight where we're saying, and, and maybe it's that we have a whole bunch of things on our plate, right? And that we're all working on all of this stuff. But at the same time, we need to be able to answer the questions. And right now, my concern is safety. And I think that this makes sense to have zero fares and try this. But honestly, I mean, if Councillor Benton, who I'm going to coin tonight as the king of public transit guru ship, God help me, that's going to be in the paper tomorrow. But <laughs> uh, I, I think that if he says it's not ready, there's something that I have to pay attention to with that because he, he is way more knowledgeable on this than I am. And I'm willing to admit that. So while I believe we have ironed out a lot of kinks, if there are still some significant questions by multiple members of the council, it, it's hard for me to want to push forward with this when we could get the answers, the answers to our questions and feel really, really confident about the way we're heading. Thank you, Councillor Bassan, Councillor Benton. Yes, I just, um, you know, it's such an important discussion. And that's why I move for deferral. Um, does the administration moving forward, immediate, uh, support moving forward immediately with this ordinance change? Madam President, Councilor Ben, I'd like to point out that the meetings that we had three meetings that were scheduled, what we do is we try to, whenever we're doing reports like this, is schedule three separate meetings with three different counselors or four different counselors in the meeting so we don't do anything about quorum. 
the first meeting was scheduled for August 12th. At, and we had a number of counselors that were invited to that meeting. We also had council staff that was invited to that meeting. The second meeting was scheduled for Friday, the, uh, August 13th. And then there was an additional meeting that was scheduled August 16th. So we can forward these um, invites back to show the council or send it to you guys so you can see them. But in these meetings is where they actually discuss the plans. They discuss how we would move forward. And we wanted to be sure that we got that done before final action was taken on the bill. Now the bill has been deferred a couple of times. So it might not um, be something that, you, that the counselors remember or that their policy analysts remember, but those meetings were scheduled. We did do the presentation, council staff was there. We had transit there. We also had um, um, Mr. Rogers from the security there. So these were discussed. So if council wants to defer so that we can give that information back, we'd be more than happy to do that. But these meetings were scheduled with counselors and with um, council staff and with the policy analysts. Uh, well, Madam President, uh, if I may, because they were scheduled doesn't mean they happened. And if they didn't happen, we're not ready to move forward on this. That's my opinion. Now, I've had some discussions with the director and others about uh, the whole idea. And I've made clear in every circumstance, I believe, how I am very concerned about the lack of uh, a robust transit security component. And I'm not talking about drivers being taught de-escalation. I'm talking about having additional people on the buses and as was stated, at the stops. That's what transit security is supposed to be about. Now, transit security used to exist prior to this administration under transit. No, now they are under DMD. I don't see much focus with the administration's plan with regard to, to transit security. And, and, and by security, I agree with Councilor Sena, that includes uh, behavioral health response. And, and we all know that that's a challenge in our community in general, whether it's on the bus or on the street or anywhere else. But, but these are, uh, you know, I'm just going to say, uh, whatever, maybe I missed the meeting or the importance of the meeting that we were just going forward and that everything's okay with regard to the safety on the buses, on the street, at the bus stops. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but, but, but I, I really want equity on this. I do want free fares, but I don't think we're ready for prime time. And just because the, the budget is coming up that we appropriated some money, well, we can reappropriate some money, but I don't think we're ready to, to implement this program. Thank you. Thank you Madam Councilor. President, um, Councilor Benton, if, if I may real quick, I apologize, but um, on Friday the 13th, Nathan Molina did attend the meeting. So he was in the meeting where this presentation was given. I just wanted to make that clear. Councilor Benton, you're muted. All right, well, we can discuss that later, you know. Um, uh, uh, I did get a briefing from my policy analyst on this, and, and I don't think it's ready to go. Sorry, counselors, I, my, I was having some technical issues there. Um, we are going to hear from some more of our counselors, Councilor Senna, Councilor Basson, and Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. You know, I, I would hope that uh, maybe the sponsor or the maker of the motion of deferral possibly would be willing to entertain for the next council meeting. Uh, while we work out those kinks instead of relating it back to October. But one thing I want to note, because it was stated previously, um, about 32% of riders of transit are utilizing it to go to work. 18% uh, are using it for shopping. 14% are using it for our university and community colleges. 
12% are using it for medical reasons, for 11% uh, for social visits and personal, 5% for restaurants, 4% for recreational sightseeing, 3% for our K through 12, and 1% for church. And for those that are utilizing it, are um, in terms of the vehicle availability is 45% um, don't have a vehicle, um, while 27% um, they do have a vehicle and it is available, and 28% have a vehicle but it's not available. And so as we talk about ridership, you know, it's not our homeless population, it's genuinely people who are trying to make that commute. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this presentation is important in terms of understanding just the whole scope of those that are um, utilizing our transit system um, and really what we are seeing in terms of those that use it, um, as well as really also inviting maybe in the meantime for our counselors also to join uh, on a ride along on a bus. Um, I think it is important to see our constituents and our community riding the bus because like I have stated previously, this genuinely provides equity and access. As we talk about sustainability in terms of our city, this is getting more cars off of our streets. Um, and so I think that, you know, it is unfortunate not everyone could have made those meetings to get this presentation. Um, that I think that this presentation and sure after this will be available to all counselors. Um, but I think that, you know, I, again, would stress that we should implement this because it's pretty much already undergoing. However, I do understand the concerns of our fellow counselors um, and want those to be addressed. So I'm kind of pushing for a deferral at least till the next council meeting. And that way it stresses that we arrange our schedules to make the meeting with transit for this presentation. Thank you, Councillor Senna, Councillor Bassan, and then Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so for full ownership of my comments, administration director, yes, I was at that presentation. Yes, it has been sent to me again because I needed to be refreshed. However, I am also, I guess, confused, and this is where I still align with what Councillor Benton is saying. It doesn't have a plan for security measures. It has statistics, which is great. That's why I guess I thought I was getting, you know, the who rides it, who needs it, how we're going to do it, what it's going to cost, how we're, what we're, what expenses are going to be there, um, what risks there are, what problems do typically arise but what are we going to do about it? And why, why can't we have some plan? So here we are again, in my opinion, implementing something and approving something saying, we're gonna come up with a plan later. And I just don't understand why we do things so backwards sometimes. And respectfully, I know that we got a presentation. I understand it. I, I thought it was very good. I didn't think that was the presentation about the request that we had for what we're going to do about implementing security on these zero fare transit buses. So that, that's something I really would like to see. I really would hope we can pass this soon. But again, I, I struggle to vote for something when we're being promised a plan later, when it's especially talking about the security of residents in Albuquerque. Madam Chair, no, Councilor, Councilor. Um, if, if it is the will of the council and they'd like to defer, what we can do is we can schedule the meetings again. We can have a more, um, Mr. Rogers was there from security to answer questions, but if you would like to see some type of plan or something like that, I'm sure that's something that we can do. Madam, um, We have one more comment from Councilor Gibson. Madam President, if I may respond to that as it was my request. In, or, yes, go ahead. Please, thank you. Uh, I, that would be great, Mr. Padilla, except for uh, what plan? I would like to have that. And when, yes, there was the security there, but I don't know what questions to ask. I want to know a plan. I'm not the expert. I don't know about this. So I need help from the experts to teach me why I should feel secure about doing this for the public, in addition to its convenience factor. 
And in addition to the fact that it might reduce some of the altercations that do happen because some of them happen over the fares and a dispute over the fare. So I would really like a plan. How, are we, how do we keep people safe or at least try to keep people safe? Tangible like plans. And it can't be hire more people because we can't. We're trying, but it's really, really hard. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you probably only hear me say this one time, but I absolutely do agree with uh, Councilor Bassan. And um, uh, I, I would also like to see a plan. I would like to see uh, how many security officers uh, the department expects to use and maybe um, where, uh, how bus stops are going to be monitored and, and serviced by, by security personnel. Um, and I, I, I have to acknowledge also that we are, uh, even though that this has been funded for a year, I guess, uh, I don't think this portion has been funded. The security, additional security positions so maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about that. So, uh, but, but if I'm correct in making that assumption that um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's an easy thing to just automatically assume that we will be able to, um, or the department will be able to cover those additional, um, those additional costs. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we're trying to do several things. We want to make this serve everyone, um, and we want to invite people who typically don't use transit to have them start using it again. And we also want to keep everybody safe, um, not least of which are the drivers. So uh, I, I, I think I've decided now that I would prefer to defer, and and. You know, we can do it for, for as long as the department uh, needs to put together a plan. So that's all I have. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, Councilor Gibson, we do have Director Matoya that's on right now. He might be able to shed some light on the, the couple of comments that were made there. Uh, Madam President and Councillor Bassan, I think I'll address it to you. So I, I see a little bit of a disconnect with what we were tasked to do um, prior to tonight's meeting. So let me just basically say that we can assure you that we uh, within the DMD security can come up with a written plan that addresses the concerns that are being raised tonight. Um, I just, based on what Councillor Gibson said, I just want to mention that there were 10 positions funded uh, in the previous budget for transit. And then in this year's budget, there's another, another 10 positions. So there are a total of 20 positions that are earmarked specifically for transit. And then we have used some of the security officers from uh, the DMD side, the general security, to try to bring that up to about 25 to 27 or so. But we don't have a written plan, and, and I, I, but I can assure you that uh, with Deputy uh, Director Rogers working with Mr. Holcomb, that we can address the concerns that you're raising so that at least it would make you feel much more comfortable as to what the ridership uh, what buses we would be able to address because as you know the, the the buses start their routes at 5 30 in the morning and in some cases end at 11 o'clock at night 20 25 uh, security officers for seven days a week for those hours we wouldn't have an officer on every bus every minute of the day nor would we be able to have them at every bus stop throughout the uh you know the route we try to concentrate as heavily as we can on the art route as well as the lomas and the manal route but then that leaves, does leave us vulnerable, vulnerable in some of the other areas. So um, just to sum up, that, that we can provide for you um, at, you know, it, and as a matter of fact, not even at your request, we will pursue that so that we have something ready for you. Okay, so we are going to back to Councillor Benton. No, I appreciate that, that straight answer from, uh, director uh, of DMD and this, but, but this is part of the problem I was talking about. 
we used to have as security, even though they don't have police powers or anything else, that was focused on the unique challenges of transit. Instead, for whatever administrative reason, they've been moved to a different department. And no knock on Director Montoya and his department. I'm just saying that um, there are gaps, as he just stated, right? And these are unique needs of transit security. It's something that we really ought to discuss. We ought to discuss it with the transit district and then the rail runner and everybody else. But, but um, I just want to say that, that um, first of all, I ride the bus regularly uh, and I do see plenty. And I've, you know, hey, I've personally calmed down altercations that were going on in the 66 when I was riding on it. Okay. So I'm, I'm not unaware of what's going on in the bus. Um, but in this presentation, now that I remember it, yes, Nathan went because I couldn't go. And what I heard from him was nothing new. That was the problem. And that's why I didn't remember it. It was nothing new. So what we've got is a need for a larger discussion about, uh, and, and not about, oh, we, did, we weren't charging recently and the statistics look great. Well, nobody publicized that they weren't charging. Uh, they were just doing it and then, okay, then the statistics didn't change. But, but um, I am very interested in what happened in Kansas City and so forth and how that worked. And I would be happy to discuss this on a level that goes beyond uh, just, well, which department is security in? They're not in the same department as transit to begin with. Furthermore, they have no powers to remove anybody from a bus without a transit uh, without a transit supervisor coming and saying, okay, you can remove them from the bus. And meanwhile, the bus is sitting there for 15 minutes while the guy shows up. You know, that's not the way to tr run a transit system. It's not to, a way to think about transit se security. Um, if, if we wanted to have a program where we have a robust uh, system of street outreach uh, folks who deal with behavioral health and addiction uh, riding the bus, I'd be all for that. That's what I would like to have a discussion about, as opposed to let's implement this right now and see what happens. Because what happens in KC, as is, is, is often said, is what happens in KC doesn't go necessarily in Albuquerque. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Do we have the director from transit here, I guess, or Pat, maybe you can answer the question um, for me. Um, right now, currently, I mean, I'm not the, the uh, bus guru. I voted against our, but I do ride the bus regularly and I have ridden the bus during the day at night. And, um, you know, I just feel like some of the conversation here is just making, you know, just a little uncomfortable just because I feel like, you know, poverty is not a crime. So um, I just wanted to know, it was my understanding that the honor system is the way art was supposed to operate. So technically, don't people get on now and just don't pay? Or it, is that, did it not go that direction? Just refresh my memory. So um, Madam President, Councilor Pena, the way that art operates now is that we expect passengers to pay um, once they get on a bus. Since they aren't getting on to the front of the bus, they get on a back door. Um, there's no way for us to verify that they have paid, that they have actually bought a pass, unless a security officer actually goes through and, and does some checks to see if, if, they're, if they have a pass. Correct. So, so we do uh, operate on an honor system. That's my understanding because I, I do ride the bus and, and you know, so I see people get on and, you know, some people don't pay and some people, lots of people do, you know, you get on and, and um, some people have the passes, but um, so, so it is on an honor system. So technically, 
the the people who are addicted right now and you know creating havoc can just basically get on the bus now right unless on the honor system and not pay so I just think that, you know, I, I just appreciate, you know, conversations. I learned something new every meeting, but um, it was our understanding, even prior to this presentation, that we just couldn't afford to have security all the time, right? So there's a discussion about how security works and, you know, there's drivers and, and they, you know, they pull over and they have to call the police, but um, learning from that presentation that we really don't have the calls that that we perceive that we do. Um, I just think, you know, it's time to move this forward. I think it's, it's important. I think it's, you know, during this time of the, you know, the pandemic and people, people who are writing it are going to work. I mean, I see people here all the time. We have some neighbors, we hear them. They're the ones that get the dogs going in the morning and they're walking to the bus stop and, you know, and we see them in the afternoon when they're coming back. And, and you know, I, I just, I mean, I just had to say that I wasn't gonna say anything about all this, but I just think, I think it's important. It's, it's, a, it's a short-term thing. If it works out, it works out. But, you know, the conversation about, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's leaning towards and poverty is not a crime. So just that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pena. I think I'm going to call the question before I do, though, I just want to make a couple of comments in there. Um, I think, um, you know, it's it, it it makes me really uncomfortable to assume that the people that are homeless are committing the crimes. And that that concerns me greatly. Um, I. I've taken the bus in a lot of different cities across the country, including Phoenix. I took the bus from Scottsdale to downtown to Glendale and back to Scottsdale. I saw homeless on the bus. Didn't bother me one bit. Same thing in Seattle and same thing in San Francisco. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I understand the issue of security. And I think we should probably uh, maybe at some point in time, uh, and I've talked to Mr. Holcomb about this, is maybe look at um, you know how other cities handle some of these things. I think possibly two weeks is a sufficient time. Um, if not, we can just call the question, move forward on this deferral. At this point in time, I think Councillor Benton, you requested a deferral to October the 4th. Um, Councillor Senna asked if you would be willing to amend that to our next meeting. So I'm going to ask you that question. And if not, then we will vote on, take this vote. Yes, I, I will uh, agree that for just a uh, deferral for 12 days, but I want to make very clear. And uh, there's an implication there that somehow what I'm saying has to do with uh, being against poor people. Let's get this straight. Poor people deserve security as well. You know, you can do a, a balkanized transportation system where there's nothing but poor people and homeless people and persons with mental disabilities on the bus. Do they deserve security? That's all I'm talking about. And so I want to make very clear to any insinuations I'm very offended by that I would be doing this uh, in terms of making poverty a crime, au contraire, all right? I'll put my, my record up for poor people and working people against anybody. So I want to make that very clear right now. Thank you, Councilor. No one, no one, excuse me, I'm not finished, Madam President. Okay. And, and I'll go and you know, just wrap it up. But look, as I said before, we need social service people throughout the public throughout the public sphere and that includes public transit and that includes walking down the street or whatever it may be and so when i'm talking about security and public safety i do include the need for all those social services so i just want to make that really clear and then meanwhile i want to get a personal 
uh, presentation from the director and his team. And just because I couldn't make it to the one of the three days that were offered doesn't mean uh, that I don't still have questions. And, and so therefore, you know, my policy analyst attended and, and gave me a briefing and it sounded just like what I had heard before, as I stated. So I stand by the, uh, the need for further discussion and that it's nothing against anybody. Thank you, Councillor Benson. What I it, heard it, is, it, is that you're that you would defer this move to change your yeah. uh, motion to 920, which is our next meeting. Uh, the maker of the second, would you agree to that motion? It was Councillor Gibson. It was Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson. I'm sorry. Um, um, it would be a it would be a deferral to our next meeting. All right. With the understanding that there would be a presentation from Mr. Holcomb and maybe some research in other cities. Okay. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, uh, we will move to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Bassan, thank you. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Reluctantly, yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. No. Councillor Senna. No. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes. Seven to two. I'm sorry, Thank six to two. Councillor, that motion passes. Six, seven six to six two. Six two. Six two. Six two vote. So we will move on to our next item, which is item number C, Councilor Davis, Councilor Senna, Councilor Pena, Councilor Benton, R-173. And who would like to present? Uh, Madam, uh, Madam President, I believe this relates to the last, so I'm going to make a motion to defer to the same date, whatever date was we just picked. Thank you, Councilor Davis. Do I have a second? I have a second from Councilor Senna. Any questions? Does not appear so, so we will move to vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Passes on a 7-1 vote. Thank you, counselors. The next item is related to the first two items. And this is item number D for the public. This is Councilor Senna, Councilor Pena, Councilor Davis, R-178. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is also related, so I will defer till September 20th. Thank you, Councilor Senna. And I have a second from Councilor Davis. Any questions, counselors? I do not see any questions. Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Senna. Yeah. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 7-1. Thank you, counselors. That passes on a seven to one for a deferral to our next meeting. And we will move on to item E, which is Councillor Gibson, item 068. Councillor Gibson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, where am I? Okay, this is 068 amending sections 4-8-8 and 4-8-13 of the City of Albuquerque Hospitality Fee Ordinance. And I will move a due pass on this. If you'd like an exp explanation of this bill, we have uh, Ms. Morris here who will be able to do that if, if the uh, council so desires. Madam President, I will second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Jones, for that second. Um, Ms. Morris, could you give us a brief uh, description just for the public because not everyone has the bill in front of them? Madam Chair, Councillors, yes, I'd be happy to. So the description that I'll give will actually apply to the next bill, I believe, um, as the, the two bills um, 
make uh, matching changes to the hospitality fee ordinance and the lodges tax um, ordinance. And so the, the two changes that these bills make are uh, the first one clarifies that uh, the reporting requirements apply even if there is no um, uh, income. And so uh, historically, hotels and motels have reported their, their um, collections every month. However, during COVID, there wasn't anything to collect, and so it wasn't clear what, what to do. Um, and so this just clar clarifies that even if there is no income, the um, reporting still needs to occur. The second change to, to both the hospitality fee and, and the lodges tax ordinance um, has to do with some language about the marketplace Clark. providers. This language was added about a year ago when we added some language to recognize that we have um, uh, Airbnbs and some changes made at the state level for um, Airbnb and VRBO and short-term rentals to operate and for the taxes to be collected by them. Um, however, in the time since the bill was passed in 2019, um, there was a lawsuit, I believe in California, not 100% sure it was California, but I believe it was in California, where um, the reporting requirements for the marketplace providers was struck down. And so the responsibility for that reporting, instead of being done by the marketplace provider, i.e. platforms such as Airbnb and VRBO, now falls to the individual uh, property owner. And so uh, short-term rental, yes, I know, short-term rental operator. Um, and so this uh, 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 revision just strikes that reporting requirement um, from the responsibility of the marketplace provider and shifts it over to the, the operator. Due um, to that, that um, lawsuit in, I think, California. Thank um, you, Ms. Morris. I believe the administration have uh, Renee in the, in the conference room, perhaps, to speak to it as well. Renee, Ms. Martinez. Yeah. Yeah, Madam President uh, and um, counselors, so I... I think Peck were really covered the landscape in terms of these changes. Really, one was because of the inability to have uh, the Airbnb provide the details. Now we will get that from the the host, um, as as Petra said. And then we do would like the uh, reporting to come to us, just like GRT, where if you didn't didn't have any activity, you go ahead and report zero revenue. Um, and if you did have uh, revenues collected and that's reported. So uh, Petra covered it and that's it's pretty straightforward, these changes. Counselors, um, we're gonna take, since they described these bills to kind of together, uh, we're gonna take a separate mo motion on each one, but we're gonna kind of move them forward together because it seemed like com companion bills. Um, are there mm -hmm. any questions on 068? I do not see any hands up. Um, so with that, we will move to Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero. Thank you, counselors. We will move on to item number F, which is item 075. Uh, and this is regarding the lodger's tax ordinance or the host as was described. Are there any questions from counselors regarding this bill? Uh, Madam President, I'll go Councilor ahead and Gibson? make a motion for a due pass. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. We have a motion on 075 for a due pass and I have a second from Councilor Benton. With that, we will move to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Sorry Councilor for Pena. yes. Thank you. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 8-0. Thank you, Councilors. That motion passes on an 8-0 vote. We will move on to item number H, which is Councilor Benton, R-171. 
Thank you, Madam President. I'll move a due pass on our 171. That's concerning the future management of the Candelaria Nature Preserve and approval of the resource management plan. Second. Sorry, I'm muted. There is a second from Councilor Basson. Are there any questions? Uh, Madam uh, President, if we could, I'd like to ask Ms. Schultz to give us a brief, uh, just a brief update for, I know this has been out here a long time and many have heard about it, maybe more than they want, but, um, but it's a really important project that, that um, is part of our legacy really of the Bosque and this, the uh, Rio Grande State Park. Um, the Nature Preserve is a, uh, is a wonderful jewel and we've had a lot, a lot, a lot of public involvement in it. But I would ask Ms. Schultz to give us a, a, ba a quick breakdown on it. And then we've got three amendments and we're hoping to pass it tonight. Thank you. Ms. Schultz. Madam President, Councillor Benton, uh, thank you. I'd be happy to give you a, a 30,000 foot view of this plan that we've discussed a couple of times at this point. Um, the purpose of this plan is to set kind of a multi-decade work plan for the Candelaria Nature Preserve um, that will guide the city on how to operate and maintain the site. Um, I think one of the most important features of the plan is it outlines funding needed uh, to operate and maintain the site as a nature preserve. And that really equips the city to go out and ask for that money um, to help uh, maintain and preserve the site. Um, the Open Space Division worked very closely with the Open Space Advisory Board on this plan and also a um, technical advisory group referred to as the TAG, which were citizens who were concerned um, and interested in the area. And after a multi-year planning process, the plan before you uh, will be the guiding document for the site for decades to come. Um, with adoption of the plan, we have three amendments before you tonight. And if it's the pleasure of the sponsor, I can go ahead and just jump into those. I see him nodding. I will, I'll go ahead. Um, so I'm going to start with what was labeled in your iPads as floor amendment two. Um, a quick overview of this amendment is that it amends an amendment that this council passed in June related to the use of herbicides and pesticides on the site. Uh, the first thing it does is it removes some language that called for the open space division to be able to predict future herbicide use. Um, that's truly impossible to ask them to have a crystal ball looking a year into the future. And so that language is proposing to be stricken. Um, the subsection number two, the further blue text, goes on to ask the Open Space Division to work with the Open Space Advisory Board on a, on a pesticide protocol plan. Um, and the thought behind that is that there should be some notification to the adjoining neighbors to the site and to any visitors at the site as to if pesticides or herbicides has had been recently used so that those visitors and neighbors can make good healthy decisions for themselves on if they want to be near the site um, around those times. Um, that summarizes floor amendment two and I can answer any questions about it. Pardon me, uh, Shanna, but we are gonna call this floor amendment number one. Yes, yes, Madam President, thanks for that clarification. I'll move that amendment, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Do we have a second? I have a second from Councillor Davis. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions, Councillors. So with that, we will move to uh, the approval of floor amendment number one as uh, outlined by Ms. Schultz. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Bonegal. Yes. Eight zero and amendment one. Thank you, Councillors. Um, we will move on then to floor amendment number two. And Mr. Moya will pull that up on the screen. Ms. Uh, Councillor Benton. Yeah, I defer to Ms. Schultz to explain the amendment. Madam President, Councillor Benton, floor amendment two um, is labeled 
Floor Amendment 1 in your iPads. This is the biggest amendment of the three. It tackles the most content in the plan and is certainly the one that's had the most discussion amongst open space staff, council staff, and the public over the last several weeks. This relates to what you heard public commenters speaking to tonight regarding an asphalt pad and parking on the site. Uh, the purpose of this amendment is to really clarify where future parking on the site should occur um, to minimize the impact on wildlife. It is supposed to operate as a nature preserve, and um, with that intention, uh, we should be minimizing the amount of vehicles that move into and off of the site. Um, so you'll see this amendment has quite a bit of content uh, adjustments. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, I will bring your attention, though, to number four. Um, you'll see on your screen some yellow text. Um, I'm bringing this to your attention because this text is proposed to be stricken in this amendment, and that is different from what was submitted to your iPads on Friday. Um, so this is a bit of a friendly amendment to the amendment as it was submitted uh, on Friday. It simply strikes um, the phrase, until most of the asphalt pad is removed. Uh, we spoke with uh, Director Simon today about this language and removal of this language will ensure that um, relevant staff and volunteers who are engaged and work on the site can continue to park in a place that they need to park uh, to do the good work that they will do moving into the future. With that, I'll stand for any questions. Are there questions of Ms. Schultz? Um, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. So Ms. Schultz, that so the highlighted part is not going to be stricken or it is gonna be stricken with the intention that we're gonna follow through on it when it disappears. Madam President, um, Councillor Bassan, thanks for allowing me to clarify. So that language was included in the amendment as it was submitted to your iPads on Friday. Just this afternoon, shortly before this meeting began, um, we discovered that that language did need to be stricken. So in the um, purpose of transparency and trying to make sure that what you all are voting on uh, versus what you thought you read in your iPad over the weekend, I wanted to bring it to your attention that, that those eight words are being stricken and that is the intention is to strike them. Thank you. And Madam President, I move that uh, amendment as amendment number two. Thank you, Councillor Benton. It looks like you have a second from Councillor Davis. Is that a second, Councillor Davis? Yes. Um, I had a question about this, Councillor um, or Shanna, whoever wants to answer it. Um, so I know that we're, there were some residents that were concerned about parking in their street and on their in front of their homes. Does this is it still? Does this amendment cover that or does it still allow that parking in front of their homes? Madam, Madam President, uh, this doesn't really address uh, parking on public streets. It does mention public streets as an option, depending on whether it's allowed or not on that particular street. Um, but uh, the that option is really, to clarify that, to the extent it were, were exercised would be in the interim until such time as the, uh, the tree farm tract uh, 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 would be developed for the permanent parking for, for general public. Um, a lot of this discussion that, that Shanna was just talking about has to do more with um, special groups that are that, that would need to be there. They might be volunteers or they might be partners such as Tree New Mexico uh, who have a bit of a stake in the site. They, they, they've been doing their work out of the site. Um, but, you know, we, we're trying to uh, uh, clarify how parking would occur. But, but so as with any public street, um, in the short term, people could you know, may or may not park on a public street to get to this site. But um, uh, the long-term vision is for the tree nursery tract to become the public parking. And then there would be this limited parking that we're talking about for volunteers and people who are actively managing the, the nature preserve. So I guess what you're telling me, Councillor Benton, just so I understand, is that 
at some point in time, there's going to be alternative parking from that, that street parking so that uh, people are not parking necessarily on the street all the time uh, because I, you know, I was approached by some of those individuals and they were very concerned about, you know, a lot of people coming and going from as any of us would be, I guess, um, especially when you're living there. Um, and I understand the, you know, the allowance of public parking, but by the same token, if that's a, happening on a regular basis, you know, it's it's a little concerning. Yeah, and Madam President, you know, absolutely, we don't want undue impacts from anyone uh, visiting the site on on neighbors, and we we do. And I had my questions earlier tonight at DMD with regard to, uh, you know, what we're going to do with our residential park permit parking program, but. Um, but we acknowledge that you know we the residents have a very primary need, and if their need is that they need the space in front of their house and it's being consumed by someone else, then we need to have those discussions. But in the in the short term, we're not really talking about large numbers of people because the site, by definition, is not just open to the public for anyone come on come on all any time. It's a nature preserve. There could be obviously school groups who would, who would come or folks who want to participate in citizen science where they're interested in the rejuvenation of these natural areas and, and they want to come. These would be relatively small groups, and, and but we're trying to address all of these users. But in the long term for the general public and for the groups that visit, the tree nursery tract is the long-term plan. It's just not, that plan has not been developed and approved yet. So until such time as it is, this uh, bill does address that issue as well as the long-term plan. I, so, I very much appreciate uh, that you've taken the time to deal with that issue and look at it as a, you know, in the long-term uh, because I, you know, I received several phone calls regarding that. Yeah. Um, any other questions from counselors regarding uh, floor amendment number two? I don't see any other hands. So with that, we will go to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on amendment two. Thank you, counselors. We will move on to what we label as floor amendment number three. Mr. Moya will put that up for us. Uh, Councilor Benton. Thank you, I'll ask Ms. Schultz as uh, the expert on <laughs> this project. Madam President, Councilor Benton, floor amendment three, labeled floor amendment three in your iPads um, is the least exciting and most straightforward amendment of them all. Um, the plan references an exhibit B, the plan as it's before you today, um, and pages of that exhibit got left off the end of the plan. Uh, so all this amendment does is it formally reinserts the pages from that exhibit as they are referenced throughout the rest of the plan. Um, that that um, or I guess it's called an appendix in this plan. So it, it puts in the pages of those appendix and that appendix is the resolution that this council passed in 2016 that sent the open space division on this journey to create this plan. It's, it's really just reference material in the back of the plan. Madam President, I'll move that amendment. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that. Um, any questions? Don't see any questions, so we will go to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on amendment three. I said yes. Thank you. Um, so that passes on an eight zero. Councillor Benton, we'll go back to the original bill. Just quickly, thank you, Madam President. I know the night's late, but I wanted to thank um, everyone involved, uh, the Parks Department, the Open Space Division, um, 
the Open Space Advisory Board has been very involved in this and will remain so in the future to oversee the project and the technical advisory group, which it wasn't just, as, I mean, they were a citizens group, but they were, you know, very knowledgeable about the area and also uh, other members uh, were, were knowledgeable about um, the issues at hand. Um, so I want to thank all of them. A lot, a lot, a lot of volunteer time was put in. And, uh, and then including this, the cooperation of the state parks department and, and, you know, because this was all originated as a state and local project. So um, appreciative of everyone. And then Shanna for sticking with me on all these amendments and, and Director Simon and, and uh, Superintendent Roberts for doing the same. So uh, urge your support, counselors. Thank you, Councilor Benton for the close. Any other questions? If not, we are moving to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Gibson. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 80 on R71 as amended. Thank you, counselors. That motion passes as amended on an 8 0 vote. Um, Councilor Pena, R184. Thank you, Madam President. R184 is approving the application and petition of Success Land Holdings LLC, a Heritage Trails Development One LLC for the formation of the Aspire Public Improvement District pursuant to the Public Improvement District Act. I move a due pass. And I'll second that, Councilor. Are so there any with, questions, Councilors? So, so Madam President, um, I'd like to also move a floor substitute. Go ahead, Councilor. So I'd move the floor substitute to R184. And that floor substitute was in your iPads, Councilors? Yes. Any questions regarding the floor substitute? Councilor Basson. Yes, Madam President, I will second that, but I also wouldn't mind just a quick overview of what exactly is different in here being that there's, I didn't see the red line or, and so if I can just have a refresher on what changed. I will have, who do I have here to discuss this? Mr. Mayor, Pena, this is oh, there Chris, you are. Yeah, Chris Hi. Muirhead, okay. good, good evening. Uh, Councilor Payne, Madam President, Councilor Bassan. Uh, the only uh, amendments between the introduction and tonight's floor substitute is to identify the five individuals who will serve on the, the district's board. Um, it, is a require, it is a requirement that they be identified by name in the resolution and between the introduction and uh, tonight, it was meeting discussions with the various departments that had an interest in this, DMD, planning, treasury, the developers, to see who had the time and interest to serve on the board. And so it, we identified those five and they are in the, in the resolution now. That is the only change. Thank you, Mr. Great. Moorhead. Any questions? Councilor Davis? I mean, at this point, it begs the question, who are the five people? A lot of curiosity since we haven't seen that. Yes, Councillor Davis, uh, Madam President, they are uh, Julia Kuladon from Council Services, uh, Christine Berner from DFA, Department of Finance Administration, James Aranda from Planning, and then two members from the applicant, Garrett Price and Scott Steffen, and they serve four and six year terms, uh, then the board would be up for an election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayorhood. Any questions? If not, we will move to the floor substitute. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on the floor sub. Thank you, so then, Councilors. Uh, Councilor Pena? Madam President, so I also would move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of allowing the floor substitute to be adopted at the same evening it is substituted. Madam President? Go ahead. 
if I may. I believe that it's been deemed by bond council that this motion is unnecessary given that this resolution can be viewed as, an, as a financing instrument. Okay, well, I'll withdraw my motion then. Got it. Councilor Pena, do you, would you like to go back to the original bill then as substituted? Um, yeah, so I would urge your support for our 184 as substituted. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that motion. Are there any comments or questions? I do not see any. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 8-0 on R-184 substituted. Thank you, counselors. That brings us to um, I, I'm going to I'm going to move to item L. I'm sorry, item K, um, because I know that uh, people are waiting on this one, also. And the uh, next two items are sort of companion bills, so we'll act on those sort of together. So, counselor, we're going counselors. We're going to item K which is Councillor Pena, Councillor Senna, Councillor Basson, Councillor Benton, 069, enacting the automated speed enforcement ordinance. Who would like to present this? I can, I can start, but- um, Councillor Pena, Councilor Benton, and then we'll go to Councillor Benton. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. So um, 069 is enacting the Albuquerque Automated Speed Enforcement Ordinance to monitor the speed of travel and enforce the speed limit through speed enforcement cameras. And I would move a due pass. Um, Thank you, Councillor um, Councilor Benton, or Councillor Basson, I guess that's a second, right? And then we will go to Councillor Benton. I think he has some comments. Madam President, I just wanted to second it. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Benton. I thought you were waiting to comment. All right. Um, with that. So, Madam President, if you don't mind, if I can just um, um, talk a little bit about the bill. I just want to really thank, you know, this has been a long haul, even though this is something that's a priority for the entire council, the small working group that worked on this and with the administration to really move this forward. I just want to say that it's been kind of a long process, but that we did it in a quick and an efficient manner. I mean, we had a lot of public input, a lot of um, Zoom meetings, uh, community meetings, discussion amongst ourselves, discussion with the different departments throughout the city, the administration and really working hard to, to come up with some solutions that were really affecting all of our districts. You know, I know it's not the be all or do all, but this along with speeding has a name and everyone on this uh, council and this small working group's commitment has just really been important to move this forward. So just want to say that, and I would really love to ask each of the um, co-sponsors to say a few words. Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Thanks, Councilor Pena and Senna and Benton in particular, but I really feel like it, it truly is a lot of everybody. Mm -hmm. I think it's been really pretty awesome that the administration has been involved in this. And for, I mean, we've had a kind of contentious night overall with some stuff, but there's times where we can come together. And this is really one of them. And I think this is really awesome that even though this is not going to be the solution to speeding in Albuquerque, I'm excited that this is going to be one step in a direction that we can try something new to try to implement something that might reduce some of the chronic speeding and excessive speeding problems that we have here. So I look forward to, to doing this and I'm really proud that we did the community outreach and I'm proud that I think that we really have had some collective buy-in from many different parts of the city. So here's hoping that it is more successful than other things in the past uh, and that we can see some kind of minimization in speeding uh, throughout our city. Thank you, Councillor Basson. Councillor Benton. Yeah, I want to want to also thank my co-sponsors. I mean, um, we're from all across the board and all across the city, and we agree that uh, you know this is a real. It, 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 it's a public safety issue. It's also a, a quality of life issue. Um, what kind of place do we want to be? Do we want to just allow rampant? 
uh, in violation. And, and then we also, I think this council, every single one of us supports the police and has supported the police and has supported, you know, paying them competitively and so forth. Uh, we recognize the challenges and we support them in meeting those challenges, whether it be DOJ or whether it be uh, street gangs, you know, let, let's just, it's across the board. It, it's a tough job for them and we support them as well. And that's kind of the part of the reason I, I think, you know, automated enforcement gives them a little catch of the breath and then we can still rebuild our traffic unit and, and uh, rebuild uh, an intention to stop it when you see it and report it and, and, and for our general public, report it when you see it, even though it may not result in an enforcement that moment, let APD know the places it's happening in your, in your area. So um, thanks to everyone involved. And I do appreciate the administration that in APD's support of our moving forward with this. So, and, and Councilor Pena specifically, who kind of convened this ad hoc group early on, I wanna give her a shout out for that too. Thank you. Councilor Senna and then Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you to my fellow colleagues, co-sponsors. I know that uh, we all kind of got together really to address speeding and uh, exhaust um, and I know that that was also brought up during a lot of our community input sessions and trying to think of innovative ways to do this while also freeing up our officers in this whole discussion, aside from, you know, domestic violence calls, traffic enforcement is another, is the second, you know, most dangerous call an officer can go to, while also thinking about how our traffic division, they're also investigating crashes, so they oftentimes are withheld um, on calls for very long periods of time. And so by doing this, it's really freeing up a lot more officers. I know we talked a lot today um, about issues of crime, more security. And I think for us, um, we're just trying to think outside of the box, as was stated by Councilor Bassan, you know, this isn't the solution to it, but it is a solution towards it. I know that we've all kind of thought of other um, mitigation uh, ways such as traffic engineering as well. And really it's all hands on deck at this point um, of thinking of better ways to do this while also um, putting in the system that allows for um, a non-biased way of, of speed enforcement, really utilizing data and uh, technology to do so. And we also learned a lot from our, our neighbors from Rio Rancho and from Santa Fe in other areas of the state and nation of how they have done it and how they've done it successfully um, while also thinking of our communities. Um, I know that the biggest discussion was what can we do for communities that can't um, face the fine? I know that we've had a lot of conversation. I know um, we have amendments to address some of these concerns too, but I just wanna get to that community that reached out and you know we, we heard from the spectrum and of course we're capped at a hundred dollar fine, but we're also looking at other ways, whether it's community service, of course, and de deferring that to a lot of the, our public hearing officers, but um, that process will give also due process to our constituents who want to make appeals. So I think that um, overall, I'm grateful to the communities that really reached out. I know um, if we didn't hit quorum issues, fellow counselors, that our co-sponsors would love to do this too. Uh, but I think that really it's all of us coming together to think of innovative ways. Um, and something that we can agree on is really making an, an all around approach on, on an issue that we all face. So I know that um, of course we'll be getting to it, but again, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll make this brief because I my opposition to this is, is been fairly well founded, but um, I, let me say this: I, I didn't like this in the first place. I thought voters were right to vote to um, to ban the use or stop the use of red light cameras um, before, uh, and I think this is in that similar vein. 
I, I understand the frustration um, with racing and speeding. We've all talked about that. We've dealt, we've pressed APD for it. And when we've done that, I appreciate that APD and the administration, after some pushing and prodding and reprioritizing, has found ways to address some of those concerns. And I hope we do it long term. Um, but I do not believe that. Uh, I believe if we have a speeding problem, um, you need to have a police officer involved in that process um, in order to intervene. The whole point is to change someone's behavior. Um, getting a notice in the mail and paying a check uh, three, four weeks later doesn't do anything for that. Um, it just makes you mad and, uh, and doesn't change where you were driving. It doesn't stop you from, from driving 80 miles an hour um, in the next block where you could have been stopped by a cop. And yes, I know we need new cops and I know it's an election year and people want to have an answer for it. I don't think this is it. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned more so, uh, and this gets to my point, which I promise I have, and we have an amendment, as Councilor Senna mentioned, um, I do not like the idea of uh, fining people. And when we're trying to get away from policing for profit, um, saying that if someone doesn't pay our civil fine, then they don't, then, then we're going to send them to collections, which is causing all kinds of issues for people when they're having issues with housing and jobs and everything else. Um, I just think there's a better way. Um, and so, Madam President, I would like to ask the administration or whomever um, has some data on this can tell us of the $100 um, fine proposed, how much goes to a private contractor who's administering this program? Uh, Councilor President Borrego and Councilor Davis, there is written into a statute of process of how the money will be distributed. So 50% will definitely go to the state. And then the amount that goes to the third party vendor is dependent on the RFP process. So uh, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Um, so up to 50% of the fine could go to a private vendor. Is that, is that correct? Uh, Councilor President Brago and Councilor Davis, no. 50% of it goes to the state because of the way the statute is written and how these programs are run. The amount that goes to the third party vendor will be dependent on the amount that is in the RFP. And so, thank you, Madam President. I can't, I, I apologize. I want to call you by your name. I just can't see who you are. Uh, I trust that you're uh, someone who knows this very well. Uh, what, but so what is the RFP proposing? What is the administration proposing to put out in the RFP? Um, we just went through a whole process where we deferred another bill because we didn't have a plan and we didn't know our numbers. What is the plan for the RFP in order to percentage of that that would go to the private contractor? And before you answer that question, would you identify yourself, please? Yes, Councilor President Borrego and Councilor Davis. My name is Hasmini Vasaki Ruiz. I'm one of the managing city attorneys of policy in the legal department. Welcome and thank you. I'm so sorry. I just can't see you as well on my little bitty screen. So thank you. No problem. Um, uh, Madam President, Councilor Davis, right now we want to be sure that the, the bill is passed. Once the bill is passed, we'll start looking at the RFP. We started doing a little bit of research and we had legal due research on what's going on in other cities. But after the council passes the legislation, we'll look at the RFP. We'll also have legal starting to work on rulemaking processes once this is done so that we can implement it as soon as possible. So both of those starting to do a little bit of research, but we need to be sure that the legislation passes before we go too far down that path. So, Madam President, thank you, Mr. Padilla. Madam President, I just heard a concern from a from majority of this council that we didn't quite have our numbers together and didn't have a plan on our last piece of legislation. Um, what I'm hearing is they want us to pass this legislation and then trust the administration to decide how much goes to private people for policing, uh, how much profit goes to a private company. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I wonder if Mr. Padilla can tell us what their research has already told them about what other cities are doing in this vein. Uh, I know that research is public, uh, but what could you tell us? Um, Madam President, Councilor Davis, has means currently looking up that right now. I think she has an example from Santa Fe. Can you hold on That's one right. second? Uh, and I, I can take a, a sidebar, Madam President, if we can, just to move this along while we're looking for that data, if it's uh, okay. Thank I believe you, we have an amendment. Um, we will come back to you, uh, uh, Councilor Jones. Madam, Madam President, I have the floor and I have was offering an amendment that's in the Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor. I thought you were saying that you would wait until they got that information. Oh, no, ma'am. I have a long list of questions for this one. Um, oh, you have more questions. Thank you. I have a lot. Yes, ma'am. Um, but I'll offer my amendment first, uh, if it's okay. And I asked Mr. Moya if he would to share that um, so that we can all see it if he has it available. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Moya, and thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, this would address the question that Councilor Senna uh, brought up earlier, and it's one that, that I think is incredibly important. Um, I think uh, we have seen, and Bernalillo County is getting away from, New Mexico is getting away from, and our city is getting away from policing for profit and using fines um, because they disproportionately affect the people um, who are least have the least ability to pay. Um, and so this amendment, which I would call, which I would introduce as floor amendment number one, um, allows the option of completing four hours of community service in lieu of the $100 fine for any person uh, who's obligated to pay such. So Councillor Davis, uh, we have several, I think we have several seconds. Uh, Councillor Jones, you already had your hand up. Uh, Councillor Pena, is that a second? Um, well, actually, I had the same amendment, so I I have the same amendment, I, basically. So um, I was just going to ask Mr. Melendez if it pretty much is the it's pretty much the same amendment, correct? It just words it differently. Uh, Madam President, Councillor Pena, we've analyzed both yours and Councillor Davis's amendment, and they actually seem to work together because um, there's the reference to the fine in subsection G1 and Councillor Davis has adds the uh, context that it can be paid for in the form of uh, service. And then your amendment, um, I think if you choose to move it, would uh, offer the parameters of how that service would work. Okay, okay. So then could we combine it all into one amendment and make it, I mean, is it easier or does it matter? Madam President, they're written out as two separate amendments, and since Council Davis has moved his, it's probably easier at this point just to treat them as two amendments. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Councilor Pena. So we will, I, I see, I think it's a second from Councilor Benton. Is that a second, Councilor Benton? Uh, it is not. Uh, it, it was offering a friendly amendment, which would be uh, that it would be five hours of community service, you know. Somebody's out there, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, we're saying the retail value of the fine is a hundred bucks. Then, okay, we're going to say, yeah, four hours of community service. You know, I, I consider something like five as a more appropriate uh, penalty in the general population of the city. Madam President, if I could briefly explain where that number come from and, and maybe it would avoid the amendment or, or we could take it. Um, I actually considered one that was six, uh, Councilor Benton, um, but we did a little research, check with Metro Corps to check with the DA's office for their diversion programs for a misdemeanor. And we found that the community organizations that are certified for taking on community service, if the administration chooses to use those, have four hour blocks of time that you can sign up for. So we kind of figured it was better to shoehorn them into existing programs than to ask the administration to create a whole community service program just for this program. So I, I was 100% with you. I was in the, the 10 to $12 uh, an hour range, but uh, got talked out of it because it was easier to administer if the administration so chooses to partner with our criminal justice partners. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that response. Thanks, Councilor David. So, Councillor Davis, I'm going to second your motion. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jones has been waiting to speak on. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to remind you all, I don't think you were all here, that we had a red light camera uh, policy in place in the law several years ago. And uh, it kind of worked. It worked for the people who wanted it to work, which was like me. Well, I got a I got a ticket for speeding, and I got to tell you, I paid my fine, and I didn't speed again. But we also find that it doesn't work in that the people who are not going to pay a fine are not going to stop speeding. They are not going to go to jail. We will not be able to chase them down and make them do public service. It's not saying I'm against this. I am absolutely 100% against it. I want to look for it. I want to know. How are we actually going to enforce this? We had pictures of people running red lights. What good does it do to have pictures of people running red lights if we have no means to enforce a penalty? And that's our biggest issue. Sorry, guys, I'm going to kind of uh, 
preach a little bit about this. That's our major problem in the city today. We have no enforcement of any of our laws. We have no enforcement of speeding. We have no enforcement of reckless driving. We have no enforcement of drug, drug abuse. <laughs> what are we going to do with this? We're going to be putting in something. It sounds good. I'd love to do it. I wish it would work. I will vote for it. But let's step back and say, will it really work? And the answer is no. It'll only work for the people who want to obey the law and have made a mistake and just didn't pay attention. And we will pay. But counselors, thank you for bringing it forward. Let's vote for it, but don't expect miracles. Thank you, Counselor, Counselor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, totally well said, Councilor Jones. Uh, but I also, so as a co-sponsor of this, this is a deterrent in my opinion. It's just something, something in Albuquerque. We have to do something and it might not work. It probably won't work for most people, uh, but something. And from everything that I was told about and with the research, we aren't going to be making a profit. If anything, we're hoping that with what's left over after the fees that are collected are collected and then dispersed through state statute, we might be able to cover the cost of this program. So this is also something that we need to try to see if it will at least help deter some people. Um, I, I do wanna also acknowledge, <laughs> Councillor Davis, you're right. This is something that we, you know, approve now, figure out the rest of the details later. And it is very uncomfortable. Uh, but at the same time, again, this is something that we, it was explained to me too, like they cost money for the RFP, blah, 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 blah. I could keep going into that, but I'm not going to. However, uh, I think that it's, I'm open to other solutions. Constituents, city of Albuquerque, counselors, administration, all of us, if you have the silver bullet solution to reduce speeding, aside from getting more police officers, because same as with transit and every other business in Albuquerque, or nationwide, or perhaps even worldwide, there's an employee shortage. So we have to figure out something. And this to me is the next best step. And I think that it is close to at least another option that hopefully will make even a tiny difference. If I may, Madam President. Councilor Jones, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Councilor Bassan, for your patience with this. So are we not going to have to hire police officers to go track down the multiple uh, tickets that are given to one or two or three or 2,300 uh, speeders, red light camera runners. How are we going to collect it if we don't send police officers out to arrest them, whatever it is we're going to do to collect it? I mean, I'm sorry. I love the idea. It should work, but that's not who we are as a city today. We're not going to, the majority of us, first, the majority of us will do it and not have second thoughts about getting a ticket. Those of us who do have second thoughts will pay our fines, but it's a it's a hugely different number of those who will pay and those who won't. And then what do we do? So thank you. Madam, I'm voting excuse for me. Um, we have three councilors waiting to speak: Councilor Pena, yes. Councilor Senna, and yes. then the mayor's conference room. Madam President, Councilor Jones asked me a question. Oh, may I respond? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Madam President. I didn't know that that was in form of a question. I thought it was a comment. I, I took it as a question of what, what are we going to do and are we going to have to hire more officers to go and arrest people to that, that have been caught speeding? Well, first of all, this is for a civil fine, which to Councilor Jones's point could be case in point also in a roundabout way, but there won't be any needing to arrest people. Uh, because there's no criminal penalty for this. No one will get arrested if they're found speeding. Uh, things could go to collections, these fines, if people do not pay, or if we pass, you know, with the, with the motion and if we pass the amendment for community service. Uh, I, I was told at one time, if people, if we do an amendment like this and people either have the choice of a hundred dollar fine or the uh, community service. If they don't, if they choose community service and don't do it, they have to pay the hundred dollar fine. If they don't do the hundred dollar fine, then they get sent to collections. So collections is the one that's going to be responsible, which again, I realize it, it could be really beneficial. It could be wishful thinking, but it's at least something. So just to clarify, there's no criminal penalty, no new officers to hunt people down and arrest them based off of this. Although I would love to hire new officers for many other reasons. Thank you.
Councillor Pena, Councillor Senna, Mayor's Conference Room, I'm going to call the question on amendment number one. Councillor Pena. Um, I think uh, Councillor Senna was um, before me, so I, I'll just defer to her and then I'll speak after. Councillor Senna. Um, thank you, Madam President. You know, I, I do want to be sure to address that we are not tracking red light runners. This is only for speeding. I know it was brought up that, you know, this is similar and this is different. We're only tracking speed. I think that overall, as we are discussing our officers, of course, you know, there's no doubt that we, of course, need more officers on the street. But at the same time, we also have these officers in our traffic division that are still enforcing the law when it comes to speeding. So uh, they still will be tracking those. They will still be doing tax plans for racing. Um, and it frees them up to do those specific tax plans for speeding. Um, we can do both at the same time. Uh, we can do the civil enforcement to prevent people from um, doing excessive speeds over 10 miles per hour. Um, if you drive throughout Rio Rancho, you will certainly see other drivers adhering to those mobile speed vans that they have. Um, I pass one every time I go to my uh, mother-in-law's house. And, you know, again, this is just one of the tools in our toolbox as we're even thinking about traffic engineering. You know, we're proposing more traffic circles, um, other ways to address this. This is just one option. I think that overall, there was another comment to um, policing for profit. And I want to ensure that, you know, uh, I know Councilor Bassan alluded to this as well, that these the police department correct this is going towards the funding of this program as well as uh, the process of which people can go to a public hearing officer say they can contend their uh, civil citation um, and also have that process play out so i think it's um, important just to note that um, and i know I'm, I'm sure we'll get more clarification from the mayor's conference room um, but you know we, we have to do both we can do both, uh, where our officers are also patrolling our streets and enforcing, you know, I, I notice, I, I know, I bring this up often, we know that they're enforcing speed traffic citations as um, someone near and dear to us had a, a citation uh, for speeding. So um, citations are being issued for speeding. So um, I'm sure if the mayor's conference room can clarify too as to the funds whether it's going to the police department or not. I'm going to go back to Council Pena and then I'm going to the mayor's conference room and then I'm going to call for the question on this vote. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And I have a couple of other amendments too that I, for whatever reason, I didn't draft. So I want to try to do those on the fly. So I know we still have some other uh, discussion to have. And I know we're kind of uh, kind of closing when we're still in the middle of amendments. But I did want to just respond to, um, you know, just um, um, the whole purpose of this is that our constituents, people throughout the city of Albuquerque are asking us to do something. So we're trying to do something. Doing nothing, I don't think is the solution to, to um, addressing this issue. So the something is, is that in basically part of my whole argument earlier on was about not criminalizing our youth in particular. And that is why it's we're doing the civil penalties because we do not want to criminalize our youth. We do not want to hunt them down and give them tickets and send them to jail. Definitely do not want to do that. But it's a deterrent. We have we lead the nation in pedestrian fatalities. We we need to we 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 have these calls on on um, on um, on speeding and the lives that have been lost. I think we're talking about some of the lives lost to, to criminal activity. We've had like 50 some lives lost this year in Albuquerque as a result of speeding. So if this is something that's gonna make a small dent, just like the speeding has a name um, campaign where it's so nice to see them all over the city of Albuquerque. I, I drive around and I see them in neighborhoods that people are really care about this issue and are really trying to do what they can do. And I think by us trying to do what we can do is, is um, implement this, do not criminalize people, put it as a civil penalty and, and, um, and, and, and actually one of the amendments that I wanted to 
put together that I didn't put together was about the excessive speed because we were talking, we don't want to just give tickets like in Real Rancho, if you're a few miles over the speed limit, you get a ticket. And one of the things that we heard loud and clear from folks is that we should have um, it be a certain um, threshold and that was like the 10 miles over the speed limit. So I'd like to put that in there so that we're not just giving random tickets and we're not just, um, 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 you know, getting money in the coffers of the city of Albuquerque by any means. This is really a deterrent for people who are um, speeding excessively. And it's my understanding, and I don't know that we have anyone from APD here, but um, somebody, one of the commanders had talked about that this is also a tool for data collection. There's so much technology as a result of the speeding um, cameras that we could actually collect data and maybe get habit habitual um, uh, speeders that are speeding excessively and then go see if we can address that issue, right? So um, I'll defer to the mayor's conference room. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Pena, Mayor's conference room. Madam Somebody President, we, to speak. Um, we have Commander Beers here. Um, we'll go ahead and let him talk to some of the questions or some of the stuff that was brought up. Uh, thank you, Madam President, members of the council. Um, just to clarify some of the questions that were brought up on uh, reference to traffic enforcement. Um, first, I'd like to start by saying, just to give you some stats um, strictly from just the traffic division, this doesn't include all the APD officers, but over the past week, uh, the APD traffic division has issued 466 traffic citations, and about 300 of those were speeding citations alone. So over 400 total, but about 300 of those were going to be speeding citations. So to answer the question, yes, the traffic division is out doing traffic enforcement, uh, especially when it comes to speeding. That's kind of the major project right now, along with the racing and the exhaust sites. We're uh, hitting those a lot, too. Um, as far as the data collection, that is absolutely correct. Um, one thing that this can be used for is the data collection can be reviewed. So the way the project is supposed to work um, is once the speeding citation comes in from the machine, it's gonna be reviewed by an officer. So a sworn officer is gonna review every citation that comes through because they have to verify one that the machine collected correct data that that person was in fact speeding. Um, they identify that the plate is correct. It runs through MBD that can be verified. So those are certain accesses that have to be done by a sworn officer. Uh, once that's verified, then that can be sent out um, for that civil citation to be issued. Uh, again, it's not criminal, but it is being verified by a sworn officer for legitimacy purposes. Um, as far as the data collection, if you have somebody who's constantly speeding through an area where there's a device in that area and they continue to be um, captured on this camera that they're speeding and they're not paying those citations, um, that data is reviewed by an officer. It can be collected and then officers can actually go to those areas where you have repeat offenders and conduct TAC plans and try to look for those people or conduct traffic stops and then do that speed enforcement at that time. So there is a way to monitor the program as well as just let it do its thing um, by everybody who's gonna follow the rules and not speed and then pay their fines when they do get those. Um, so those are just um, some of the points to answer the questions. Madam Chair, um, Councilor. Thank you, officer. Um, with that, I, I'm going to go back to our floor amendment uh, number one, and we are going to go to a vote on this. Ms. Ortega? Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? No. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Yeah. Councilor Borrego? Yes, seven one on amendment one. Thank you, councilors. Uh, Councilor Pena, you have uh, floor amendment number two and apparently you have floor amendment number three now also, is that correct? Uh, you're muted, councilor. I'm sorry, yes, that's correct. And if Go ahead would, and present your amendment. Can we get it on the screen or would you yes. just? Okay, so this one I can just mm, disappeared. I don't have the amendment in front of me. So if you want to read it, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. 
Julian, is it, can you pull it up again? Yes. Sorry, Julian, it changed. Um, um, Madam President, um, Mr. Melendez, so this is the one that's the companion to Councillor Davis's? Madam President, yes. And I made one update to it per your direction, and that's the one that Julian is pulling up now. Okay, so without reading that, this is amendment number two to O2169. And if you can scroll down, it's about the fine and just the explanation as the amendment provides the option to request service to the city in lieu of payment of speeding citation, which would be rendered in in full hour increments and credited against the fine rate of $25 per hour. The amendment also states the process to do so is by requesting a hearing with the hearing officer. Additionally, the amendment expresses um, expressly states that a person who elects um, this option is not entitled to any of the benefits of city employees and city would not be held responsible for damages incurred. Lastly, the amendment would provide notice that a person must pass a background check to qualify as a volunteer under this option. Um, so, um, Counselor, so from the one that we had in our iPad, you amended the 25, the 15 to 25. Is that correct? So that was a minor change. That's correct, Madam President. And then I would like to also ask Mr. Melendez, um, just one of my concerns with um, what I just read, is there any way that we can we can um, go to a nonprofit? Because you know I don't want to then have people who cannot pass a background check not be able to do community service. Uh, Madam President, so your question is whether or not uh, this would preclude somebody from doing community service if they cannot pass a background check. And so whether or not we could contract with a nonprofit provider for them to do the community service through them. There, yeah. Or that we create something that allows us to let anyone do community yeah. service. Or, or, or you could just strike that limitation okay. out of this okay. amendment, probably okay. easier. Then I would strike that. Okay. Madam President and Councilor Pena, so there is a sentence that would be removed. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine lines down, if I'm counting correctly, that say, states no person who cannot, got a double negative there, pass the background check to qualify as a volunteer may obtain relief under this subsection. And so that sentence would be stricken from this amendment. Yes. Are there any questions regarding those changes, counselors? This is for amendment number two. I see several hands of counselors, uh, Councilor Senna and Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. With that change, I will second that amendment. <laughs> that is a second. Thank you, Councilor Senna, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is my way of making sure that we go back to the mayor's conference room to find out. Uh, I know Ms. Padilla was trying to say something at the end of when they were discussing something earlier. So I wanna know what he had to say. And I also have the question, what does APD think about this program? Do they think that this will help the officers do their job or minimize some of the problems that they have or whatever? I don't mean to lead in that, but what does APD think about this uh, this program. So we are going back to the mayor's conference room and we have some officers there. Would you like to address? And uh, could you identify yourself, please? Uh, Madam President, this is Isaac. Uh, Madam President, Councilor Bassan, I'll go ahead and let the commander first address that question and then we'll go ahead and talk uh, a, a little bit of something else with legal after that. Uh, yes, Madam President, members of the council, um, to answer the question, APD is definitely for this program. Um, the way uh, staffing is, the way the traffic division is, obviously we've beefed that up quite a bit in the past six months, um, which has helped tremendously with our traffic enforcement efforts. Um, however, we can't be everywhere all the time, day and night, um, which is one useful tool um, that this would provide to us um, is we can place these things, you know, throughout the city at different locations based on citizen complaints, based on statistical data, 
um, however that may be, um, but it can be around 24 hours a day. So it doesn't matter what time of day or night it is, if somebody drives by and is speeding, it's gonna capture that incident. Um, so I think it's gonna reach out to a lot more people to help reduce those speeders um, for those that it does impact. Um, obviously it's not gonna be 100%, but it is an additional tool that we can use for that traffic enforcement and kind of help slow people down. So uh, we're definitely for it, we support it, and we're actually looking forward to hoping it gets passed and implemented here in the near future. Thank you, officer. Any other questions? Madam if President. not, we yeah, are- No, we... Madam President, I also asked if Mr. Padilla could please finish what he was trying to ask the previous- Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I... Thank you. Yes. Madam President, Council, Bas Council Basana had a yes, he's gonna talk about the rules that have to be um, put into place. So I'll let her speak to that. Uh, Madam President and Councilors, this is Hasmini Dasokiris, just so you know who's speaking. I definitely wanted to address that there will be a rulemaking process that we will be undergoing under ROA 2-15-1. So we are looking into public comments and what the community service program will look like, what will be the procedures. From the onset, this has been an equitable approach to how we achieve our common goal, which is traffic safety. I also wanted to address uh, a question that was raised earlier by Councillor Davis and Councillor Bassan related to the how the funds are administered. As we've previously mentioned, we continue to work with the, our partners and other municipalities in the state, including Rio Rancho and Santa Fe. And in consulting with Santa Fe, who is looking to roll out their program soon, they have a fine of $50. And the way that that funding is divided is as follows. $20 goes to the vendor, $5 goes to the administration of the program at the city of Santa Fe, and 25 of that goes to the state. Okay, so um, Councilor Bassan, are you? Yes, are Madam you? President, I just okay. wanted to make sure that we were able to hear from them and, and hear everything. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, with that, I think we're gonna call for the question on uh, floor amendment number two as amended several times actually. Councilor Benton, did I miss you? Because I saw your hand Madam, go up Madam Chair, just really quickly, <laughs> uh, you know, following the discussion, I would say that uh, if there's a policing for profit going on, it, it, that's uh, <laughs> going to the state. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that comment, Councilor. I thought that myself. Um, and that was the same kind of issue that I had with the littering bill when I proposed that. So we are going to move on to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Pasan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 8-0 on amendment number two. Thank you, Councilors. Councilor Pena, did you have another? And then I have uh, another amendment. And this one, if they can pull and it up. And this well. amendment was not in our iPads. Um, we're going to put this up on the screen. Um, do you want to read it, Councilor Pena? Um, yes. So this would be, I think, for amendment number three. And this is on page four, line 22, at the following after the, after the period. Only those instances of speeding that are in excess of 10 miles um, per hour above the lawful speed limit constitute violations under this ordinance. This amendment provides that only speeding violations in excess of 10 uh, miles per hour would be punishable under this ordinance. So this is um, a lot of the feedback we got from the community is they said that they really wanted to, um, you know, not target um, people who just kind of speed of a couple miles over the speed limit, but to really target um, people that are um, speeding excessively. Thank you, Councillor. Looks like you have several seconds, Councillor Senna and Councillor Basson. Um, Councillor Benton, did you have a second, a second or a question? I, I did, Madam President, and I'm sorry. Okay, I've before my... I go to, to uh, okay, so Councillor Benton, then I'll go to Councillor Senna, and then I saw Councillor Davis do this, so I'm thinking he's got a question. Thank you. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, um, in terms of pedestrian fatalities, if, if, if you've got a 25 mile an hour speed limit and you basically 
put out publicly that you're not going to enforce it up to 34 miles speed limit, the implications for pedestrian being hit by a car are much, much greater in terms of fatality between 25 and 34 miles an hour. That could be proven by data. I don't think we want to be sending the message that, oh yeah, if it mean if it says 25, it means 34. And that's what this does. So I do not support it. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. And um, so I just had a question. You know, I am in support of this because I know that this was also comments that came from um, our listening tour, but I also wanted to know and maybe ask the mayor's conference room. Would there be an exceptionality for special zones such as schools? Um, I don't know, you know, whether we would put the the mobile speed trailers or whatever it may be um, into school zones, but um, you know, just wondering how other cities like Rio Rancho and Santa Fe have done theirs. I know from my understanding, Rio Rancho sits theirs at 10 miles per hour or so 11 over. Um, so, you know, in special areas like Councilor Benson was saying, is there exceptions or how do they do theirs? Uh, Madam President and Councilor Senna, uh, that is something that we can look at during the rulemaking process. I will remind the council that we cannot set the citation above 100 an hour per statute, or $100 for the overall citation for the state statute. And I can actually, um, if, with the help of Mr. Melendrez, I can actually look at um, adding special circumstances in the language. Councilor Pena, there's two other councilors before you. So, um, Mr. Melendrez, did you hear that comment? He's going to look at that, Councilor Pena. Uh, Councilor Davis, Councilor Passon, and then Councilor Pena. <laughs> I just wanted to agree. I think the, <clears throat> I appreciate the, the sponsor's intent here, but I, I'm not sure that's appropriate. Like we do kind of, the speed limits are set according to what uh, traffic engineers tell us is safe for that neighborhood. So one mile an hour or, or 10 over, um, those contribute to, to crashes. They, they exponentially contribute to fatalities and larger or at least increased injuries. Um, I, I might say that maybe we could come back and revisit this at another point when we look at some escalation or some way, but um, you know, the way that, that the state's traffic fines go, it's not a, a per mile an hour standard, it's a percent above. So, you know, 10% above a 20 mile an hour is two miles an hour, 10% above 50 is, is five. So, you know, the state uses a different standard for determining those based on a percentage. Um, but either way, I think the, the violation is the violation if we're, we're really trying to get at that. So for that reason, I would oppose this, but I know what, what she's trying to get at. And I think there's probably a way to get closer to where we are in a, in a better way. Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. I think that, uh, I think that it would be great to be able to say, you know, the 10 miles an hour with the exception of school zones. Um, but at the same time, I wanna make sure that it's clear that we're not saying we're not going to enforce obeying the speed limit. We're saying that you may get a ticket by a police officer from the traffic unit or by a different police or the state police or the sheriff's or whoever. An officer could give you a ticket. We're still enforcing, well, or hopefully, and trying to get more support to APD to do that. But we're also saying that these devices could be around. So be wary and learn to obey the speed limits. So I do think that, you know, honestly, per personally, I'm fine no matter which way it goes. <laughs> I think that people should obey the laws, um, but at the same time, um, you know, I think that it, it has been in our community discussions, it was very clear that people were concerned about school zones. So I absolutely think like, let's, let's really enforce the 25 mile an hour in school zones without exception. Uh, and I concur that 10 miles an hour over in a 25 is, is very dangerous. So is three miles an hour. I, I get all of that, but something is better than nothing at this point. And I also think that we have to start somewhere. So again, we can always revisit it, but that doesn't mean that we can revisit it and extend the speed limits that we're enforcing. We can reduce them later once we start taking that inch and growing it into a mile. Thank you, Councilor Basson. Um, Councilor Pena, are you gonna close? 
Councilor Pena, you are muted. Yeah. I, yes, I will close, but I need to Before talk you to close, I, I'd like to just weigh in on this just really quickly. I, I live, Councilor. Can I, can I just talk to Mr. Melendez and have him add that additional information and then you can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Please, thank you, Madam President. That. I appreciate that. Ma Madam President, Councilor Pena, so we're in a process here, multiple amendments on the fly for multiple counselors. And so I'm gonna need a little bit more explanation from you as to what it is that you wanna change at this point. So it would be that would be the 10 miles, um, what you have currently, but then to add that we can have special exceptions for maybe sensitive zones, we can call it sensitive zones like um, school zones or just specifically call out school zones. Uh, Madam President, Councilor Pena, it sounds to me like um, that is uh, somewhat of a complicated, I mean, this is an ordinance that needs to be clearly written so that it's enforceable without much ambiguity. And so um, to the extent that I, school zones, well, I was going to suggest um, I heard from the mayor's conference room that there would be a rulemaking process um, and maybe just to suggest that uh, exceptions to the 10 limit requirement may be established through rulemaking. So you give that authorization and then the rule makers can kind of determine when it's appropriate. Okay. So I'd, I'd, um, I don't know if we have to uh, move that friendly amendment to the amendments. If it's clear enough to the folks that are voting on it, um, we can do that if you wanna pass for a minute, we could try to write that up so that people can see it on paper. Okay, we can do that. Councillor Pena, um, I really appreciate what it is you're doing in trying to make the amendments, but I, I, I'm the person that lives the closest to Rio Rancho and <laughs> I drive through there all the time and I've gotten, I've gotten hit once or twice in a, in a, in a zone that, uh, you know, was probably 20 miles an hour and then it went to 30 and then it came back down to 20 and it's right around the post office on Southern Boulevard. And, um, you know, I paid my fine and I just, that was my expectation. So I, I think that I probably would stick to black and white, uh, a more black and white ordinance, actually. And that's just my thought. Mr. Melendres, do you have that change? <laughs> I was giving you some time. So I am pleased that council staff usually makes it all look so easy and quickly done. Um, but that one that you're requesting actually adds a little bit of complexity because where this the amendment that has been moved is crafted is within the definition of a violation. And so we would need to create another section under the ordinance um, that gives sort of guidance to put that exception in place. And so we would need, I would need just a few more minutes to write that up if that's what you want to happen. So then can we just vote on the, um, Madam President, can we just vote on the amendment that we have currently and then we can find out if um, we even need the rulemaking one or if it's just part of the process and they can make those changes at that time? I don't see why we can't. Can we? Madam President, you can certainly vote on the amendment that's before you, before you and uh, I'll do my best to get another amendment put together uh, before you. The other option, Councilor Pena, is that we could um, postpone action on this and, and go to the other two uh, bills that we have and then come back and that would give staff maybe a little bit more time to, to craft what it is you're trying to yeah, Madam President, I think we'll just vote on the, the amendment that I have without the All right. special. So we have a floor amendment. Uh, Councilor Davis, did you have a comment? I'll wait till after this vote. That's okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So we have a floor amendment number three as amended once, right? Um, no, not amended yet. You're waiting on that amendment then. No. Okay. No, no, so no. floor amendment number three as was um, presented to begin with. Yes. 
And we have a motion. Do we have a second? Yes, we did. Yes, we had a second. Councilor Senna. Can we read that motion, please? Yes. We've through several reiterations and other. Someone read that? Motions. The original amendment. Put it back up. It hasn't changed. We will put it back on the screen, Councilor. So, so Madam President, um, Councilor Jones, it's just the amendment that provides that only speeding violations in excess of 10 miles per hour would be punishable under this ordinance. That, that's the amendment. So we're going to go to Ms. Ortega on this vote, and then I guess it, we can come back and amend it after Mr. Melendrez works on it a little more. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton? No. Councillor Davis? No. Councillor Gibson? No. Councillor Jones? No. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? No. Motion fails. On a 3 5 vote. Councillor Davis, now you had a comment, right? I do, Madam President. I, I heard I, I hear that Mr. Melendrez and staff are working feverishly to prepare amendments for a number of us. I have a few more coming. It sounds like there are some mothers from other counselors coming. We're butting up on our time. And it honestly seems like there are some ideas that want to be fleshed out that need a little more time, like some of these special pro, uh, places or some of the questions about rulemaking and contracting. Um, it seems to me that we ought to defer this till our next meeting so that we can get our ducks in a row and get all of our amendments together, including my own. So I'll make a motion to defer until our next city council meeting for this bill. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second for deferral on the original bill of 069, allowing us time to work on some additional amendments. Um, Ms. Ortega. Answer Bassan. We have some counselors. With oh, Councillor Senna, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Councillor Senna and then Councillor Passon. Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Um, yeah, I just want to be sure um, and ask the um, Rosalqui Ruiz to make some clarifications to at least in um, the rulemaking process because I think uh, that's where the biggest questions are. And like we were stating, even with the amendment um, having failed through the rulemaking process, this can all be kind of hashed out. Um, I know we all don't like that. We want all of this all given in, in a nice package and I'm sure things will change along the way, whether this gets deferred or not. Um, but just for clarification, um, I think that it's important that we all understand what that would look like. Um, Cause also, you know, from my understanding too, it can be to the deference of the public hearing officer as well, if they are found to be in uh, an excessive speed in a certain zone, um, like a school zone, um, then the public hearing officer, if they contend that the civil citation um, can give deference as to the rulemaking process that we're all working on. Um, but can you put, give some more clarification? Madam President, Councilor Senna, yes, during the rulemaking process, there will be uh, opportunity for the public to comment and to also provide input on addressing all of these different issues that you're bringing up, like, will there be a difference if there's a five miles per hour in excess in a construction zone or a school zone, as well as 10 miles per hour in any other zone? Um, it won't be something that operates in a vacuum, and there will be opportunity for others to provide input. Um, someone else had their hand up. I think it was Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. I, I guess since you called, so thank you. Uh, so I, for the sake of not wanting to be a total hypocrite on anything, I really want this to pass. I really think we should do it. But I also recognize that there's a lot of questions. And I also, for many other things I want to talk about, but I'm not going to now, I think that it's ridiculous that we're here seven hours later trying to do conducting 
professional, real business that affects the entire city of Albuquerque when we're all tired and grumpy. And uh, so for that reason, even though I really want to pass it, I will vote to defer it. Thank you, Councillor Basson. I don't see any other hands up. I'm, I'm really not comfortable with this uh, process of doing things sort of on the fly for stuff that's, you know, I mean, this is a really, really important issue. So I'm, I'm leaning toward deferring as well, because I think that these are issues that, you know, everyone is concerned about in our city. And um, there, you know, the other counselors have more amendments that they're interested in. So um, I, I probably will support a deferral on this. So with that, I think we're gonna go back to the original bill for deferral. And we have a motion and a second. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. <laughs> Councilor Senna. No. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Councilors. Six. That motion passed on a five Six. to two. Six two. Six two. Okay, we have two more bills. Um, item J, which is M10 which is some, somewhat of a companion bill to item L, M11. Um, item M10 is reaffirming the city of Albuquerque's commitment to decrease crime and recidivism and advocating for criminal justice reform in Metro Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. And actually that uh, probably would affect the entire state. Um, so I would move a motion for approval. And I have a second from Councilor Basson. Thank you, Councilor Basson. Are there any questions? And I just would add that um, I did work with our uh, police department on both of these bills. And we do have um, Deputy Chief, um, oh gosh, I forgot her name. Help me out here. here. Oh, we have some of the Deputy Chiefs. Thank you, I'm Barker, I'm sorry. Um, sitting in the mayor's conference room in case we have questions. Are there any questions, counselors? Thank you. So with that, we'll go to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Sure, why not? Councilor Jones? No. We should Councilor spend Pena. our time on important issues. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes seven to one. Thank you, counselors. We will move to item number L, which is M11. The city of Albuquerque reaffirms its strong commitment to end the drivers of crime, including criminal firearm use and recidivism. I move a due pass. Thank you for the second, Councilor Basson. Are there any questions? And again, we have um, Commander Deputy Chief um, Barker. She used to be my commander. So I still refer to her as uh, commander. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thanks, Madam President. I know it's late um, and everybody's tired. I just, it seems to me that these two sort of pieces either kind of do the same thing or they, they kind of conflict even. One says we, we want to do some things and this is asking our legislature and other agencies to do different things, but it makes some assumptions that I don't necessarily uh, agree with. I, I saw the reports that APD claimed that the the, the GPS tracker, of the, the homicide suspect that was cut off their ankle, they weren't notified of. But then I read in the newspaper that the court notified both an APD analyst and the district attorney who then notified APD a second time, um, but that that was after hours. And so the APD person didn't get the message. So I, I'm I think this implies that there are some things happening in the criminal justice system that those of us and Councilor Basson sits with us there at the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council um, have been addressing and working on and, and 
don't necessarily agree with. So I, I just have concerns that that perhaps there's some things that this is, implies that that are not necessarily um, shared by all the criminal justice partners. I, I do believe and have supported um, enhanced penalties for firearms, for example, um, and uh, and you know we tried to fund additional ankle monitors from this city council to the metropolitan court before. Like I support all those things, but I, I think there's some of the assumptions in here that I'm. I'm have concerns about. I wonder if somebody could tell us where that comes from or, or. I would go back to the mayor's conference room because I did work with APD on these issues. And um, could somebody address that question? Um, um, Madam President, on, on this particular issue, we, we worked with you on the previous resolution. We looked at some drafts, but I don't know if we had seen this particular one. Until... Actually, this did come from Commander Barker, Deputy Chief oh, Barker. But maybe, Madam President, maybe that's what I could ask Mr. Padilla. I understood the administration officially drafted Memorial 10, and then a different part of the administration officially drafted Memorial 11. It was my understanding that different parts of the administration were not aware of the two different memorials and the two different approaches that they took. I wonder if someone could tell us. Both of these yeah. bills went before APD. And yes, Mr. Melendres helped me draft uh, 10. Um, the second bill was drafted by APD. Thank you, Madam President. I, I, I understand and I, I'm not trying to, I'm not criticizing or trying to embarrass anybody. I'm just trying to understand. I understood from the mayor's administration that they were not aware that there were two different ones and that they asked for two different things from the same people. And that's why I'm sort of confused as to what our real one, ask. One is advocating, the first one that we just voted on, Councillor, is advocating a commitment for a decrease in crime and recidivism. And that's that's the primary focus of the first one. The second one is actually advocating um, criminal firearm use and recidivism. So they are companion bills, but one goes a little further because it discusses the firearms. And I thought that uh, Deputy Chief Barker could answer some of these questions, but I is she not there? Yeah, she, she's here. We're, 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 we did use um, Sarita. I mean, a, a couple of people in the department did help draft 11. That's what we're, we're hearing. Um, but the, the, the majority of the drafting was done by council staff, but we, we were part of it. Okay. I, no, I appreciate it. I was just trying to clarify some information and, and to see what we could get. Yeah. So I, I understand where we're coming from. Um, so I, uh, no, I, thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that. I'm sorry, uh, Counselor. I meant uh, Chris Sullivan, draft a 10. Okay. Counselor Basson and then Counselor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. I guess what I'm hearing from Councilor Davis, and I hope that I'm right, but if I'm wrong, please tell me, but how I we I really definitely was more on board with 10. And now this one, I understand that it's about creating support and memorializing that, but we do that, I think. Um, and we just did that kind of in the last one. So I'm wondering how is this different and more effective in another memorial than, than making that happen? Um, Councilor, this is recommended to the state legislature that they look at their laws to um, make them stronger in order to prevent the kinds of situations that we had when our officers were, were shot. But, but Madam President, it, my, I think my point earlier, and I, I realize other folks are getting in here, but my point earlier was that I, I think this is sort of and no offense to APD, it's kind of one-sided, right? It's saying the court has to impose, we want the court to impose stricter penalties. And I agree with that, but the judiciary has a code of ethics and they have obligations under the law that have a sentencing structure that they're obligated to hold to. In many cases, they're giving the penalty they're available to. Like it's, it's. I think it's not fair for this council to endorse something that says, we want judges to do something that they're not allowed by law. And so this is pretty broad and striking. Um, but I think it's also incumbent on us when we have just had a hearing a month ago 
um, from our police department that admitted that their investigative unit was not up to par and they needed to retrain many, de many investigators so that when there is a shooting or a violent crime, we're able to respond quickly, present those cases, and that's part of the challenge. Um, so I, I do understand, I appreciate this, and I think we all have a role to play. Um, but I think if we're going to do a comprehensive memorial on criminal justice reform, we should also ensure that we're including additional obligations for our police department to move prioritized firearm cases and to move those forward and to make those complete and to move uh, forensic in investigations forward. The things that our own department has said they're not able to do as well as they'd like. So um, I, I don't think it's a bad, I think it's a fine amendment, uh, a, a fine memorial. I agree with the gun violence piece, as you know, um, but I do think it is one-sided um, and it shows. And so I think that's not fair to us as participants in the system to say that uh, we want everybody else to do something and we're not asking ourselves to do more as well. That's my, that's my point, I think. But I also know it's a memorial and it's important to say what we believe, but that this doesn't have a force of law per se. And so I'm okay with it at 10 o'clock on Wednesday night. Um, Councilor Pena and then Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, believe it or not, Councilor Davis, I agree with you. So, <laughs> so I just want to say that, you know, I mean, I voted for the other one. I'm going to vote for this one, but it, it, it does give me, um, you know, just to be honest, it just gives me heartburn, right? Because I feel like we are asking people to do, and people are looking at us as, as to what we're going to do, right? We're just talked about, you know, just trying to come up with something that we can do to help curtail speeding in the community. And, and, and for me, you know, when we're memorializing something, I just want to be clear that I support the stuff that we're talking about in here, but it's, it's a, it's, um, it's like, how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. So it's just, there's so much complexity to all this in terms of, you know, the social services, addressing the underlying issues, the substance abuse and mental health. Um, system that's um, failed people. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really difficult. And I feel like this kind of puts us in a place that um, we're supportive, but it, it, it's not really, it doesn't, it's not all encompassing, right? And so I'll just say that. And at 10 o'clock at night, again, Councillor Davis, we're on a roll here. Thank I'll you, Councillor. Um, we will go to Councillor Gibson and Councillor Senna, and then back to, let's see, Councillor Gibson, Councillor Senna. And yes, it is getting late and we have about 20 minutes before we have to extend our meeting, Councillors. So let's not do that, okay? Uh, Madam President, <laughs> I do, I'll be really brief. I might've voted for this right after you, you introduced it and uh, that your second, but um, I've decided not to support it, and it's not because I don't appreciate what I think your general intent is, um, but, uh, and, and I'm going to have to leave now. I'm sorry, I just can't, I can't stay any longer. I have to leave, but if I, if you vote right now, I'll vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Senna. Well, with that, I will definitely keep my response uh, very short. Um, you know, I, I think it's already been stated. I share the same heartburn as Councillor Pena has. I think there is much more to a lot of these issues and it's very nuanced. I know that we've all tried to address a lot of these same issues um, in our Metro Crime Initiative and in just getting some of the key actors together and discussing it, but also needing to do follow-up sessions where we have the people who are actually involved in these systems be part of those discussions as well. So, you know, I, I think I appreciate Councilor Borrego's um, sentiments on this memorial. Um, and it is difficult to, to, you know, say yes to all the things um, as a stance that we all um, as a governing body support. But at the same time, you know, I think it's important that we dig into some of these issues um, a little bit more in depth because we know it's all nuanced. So, um, but of course I appreciate uh, Councilor Borrego's sentiments on that. So thank you. Um, Councilor Bassan, you have your hand up as well. I'm so sorry, Madam President, I will be short, but I can't, I just can't keep voting for things because it's late and we're running out of time and we're tired. So I can't support this even though I agree with a lot of what's in there 
but I don't agree with all of it. And so I, I, that that's it, but I can't so, continue. This is my response. <laughs> like we thank can't. You. I, what I'm going to do, because I, I appreciate all of your comments. Um, I did work with, you know, what we were trying to achieve was um, the revolving door issue and, and somehow uh, recommending to the legislature that we're, you know, we want to stop that behavior and stop that situation. And also uh, with regard to firearms, and I know that gets a little um, touchy, I guess you could say, when, when we start talking about firearms. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, pull my, my motion and ask for a deferral. And maybe what we can do is work on this a little bit more and get a little bit more buy-in. Um, because I think it's really important that we do make a statement as a city, um, especially knowing the kind of situations that we've all been dealing with in our respective districts. So I would uh, pull my motion for approval and ask for, a, I think maybe two, two weeks, so September 20th deferral. And I hope that I could get a second on that. Councilor Pena, is that a second then? Um, yeah, a, a second. And I would also ask that maybe we reconsider M10 and, and take another stab at that as well. Um, we could do that if you'd like. Um, I think we could uh, actually, we could maybe even combine the two. Um, but let's vote on this one first. And then we will go back because we still have another one to go back to. And I want to get you guys out of here before 1030. So, Madam President, I want to just make a clarification on, on M10, if the intent, if, if being motivated to revisit M10 is motivating you to vote, vote to defer, I want you to be informed that M10 has already passed. And so the only way that you can reconsider M10 is to vote to reconsider it and put it back on the table for that whole process. Um, absent that, you would only be deferring M11. Correct. So maybe we just leave M10 and let it go through. And then if this one doesn't go through at our next one, we, we still have, uh, because I think the question in my mind on this one is with regard to the firearms and that, and I see Councillor Davis kind of, you know, I don't know <laughs> if you're shaking your head or not, but um, I, would, I would propose uh, then that we defer this. We have a motion and a second, let's vote on this. And then if we want to reconsider M10, then we'll go back to that. So Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. No. Councillor Jones. No. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Six to two passes on the deferral to September 20th. Thank you, counselors. Um, before we go to M10, I want to go back. To, did we have to go back to M to 069 on the amendment? Madam President, 069 was postponed to September 20th. Okay, so is there a motion to reconsider M10? I'm not going to make that motion. Councilor Pena, Councilor Davis, are you, is that a second? Okay, then uh, we have a motion and a second. Are there questions? We have a motion and a second to reconsider M10. Councillor Pena and Councillor Davis. So um, if there are no questions, we will take a vote on that. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson, I believe she's on. on. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Uh, yes. That's seven zero on the motion to reconsider and now we'll entertain a motion on the bill. So we have a motion to reconsider. 
And it passed on a 7-0. And we are going to make a motion to defer. I will make a motion to defer. Councilor Pena, is that a second? To September 20th. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Gibson? Gone. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Yeah. Councilor Barrego? Yes. 7 0 on the deferral of M10. Thank you, Councilors. There being no further business to come before the city council this evening. This meeting is adjourned.